Swift is a popular programming language often used for creating iOS apps. This is the perfect course for learning Swift. Vandad teaches this course. He currently works as a lead iOS developer and he's created many popular courses. Hi everyone and welcome to this course. My name is Vandad and I'm a senior full stack developer from Sweden. In this course, we're going to talk about Swift as a programming language without blending in Mac OS or iOS or backend development. We're going to talk about variables, uh, constants, uh, structures, enums, classes, you name it, even modern features of Swift as a programming language, such as async and await. I've been doing iOS development myself since late 2007, and I've been using Swift since 2014 when it came out first publicly. This course is built for people who are already familiar with another program language from before. You don't have to be very proficient in that language that you're using, but as long as you know the basics, it could be Python, TypeScript, JavaScript, Rust, whatever it is. But as long as you're familiar with the basics, then you should be good to go. This video itself is part of a bigger playlist, which is available on my YouTube channel and uh, which you can find just by searching for my name. And uh, this playlist, which I'm referring to, is called Full Stack with Swift. And the goal of the playlist is just to get us familiar with doing Swift development for both front end and back end. So if throughout this course, I sometimes make references to this playlist, then at least you know what that is for. Uh, before we get started, I'd really also appreciate it if you could give me a follow on YouTube just by searching for my name, the link to which you can find in the description at the bottom of this video. And I'm also very active on Twitter and LinkedIn daily by publishing tips and tricks about programming languages and just generally uh, informing the public about uh, languages such as Python, TypeScript, JavaScript, Rust, Swift, you name it. So without further ado, let's just get started with the course. Hi everyone, and welcome to this chapter of Full Stack with Swift. In this chapter, we're going to look at all the modern concepts that are available in Swift as a programming language. If you've already watched the introduction, you probably know that, uh, that this course generally, not just this chapter, but this course generally is not for absolute beginners. So uh, I expect you to already know another programming language. It doesn't, it doesn't really matter what it is. It can be Python, Rust, it can be TypeScript, JavaScript, whatever. As long as you know the basics of programming languages, such as what functions and variables are, then you're good to go. If you don't have that experience from before, this course generally might be a little bit difficult for you to follow through it. Uh, I will do my best to explain everything, but since I, I don't really want to explain all the basics, um, I think it is best that you perhaps have a look at some guides on getting started with another program language such as Python and then get started with this course. However, if you haven't worked with any other programming language from before and you're uh, also very talented as well, um, which I assume every everybody is, you might be able to follow along with this course without problem. Uh, so what we're going to do now is to go ahead and set up a, a playground, basically a workspace with many playgrounds in it. Uh, and playgrounds are Swift's concept of being immediate, being able to immediately see what your changes are doing. And it, it will allow you to basically run your code automatically as soon as you make any changes to your code. So it is a very powerful way of uh, testing code uh, or even creating some projects in it. You can, you can create a whole project with a playground and see the results graphically even on the screen. So it's very, very um, powerful. For those of you who are familiar, for instance, with Flutter and Dart, you already know that you can see your changes uh, displayed on the screen immediately. And playgrounds are no different. They're very similar, actually, to how Dart and Flutter work, but it's a little bit actually simpler, I would say, because we're writing pure code and just seeing pure text displayed on the screen as a result of, for instance, calling a function. So in order to continue with this chapter, you probably need a, a, a Macintosh. Um, however, what we're going to do, we're just going to use Swift Foundation um, SDK in here or a library. So you can actually follow through as well uh, on Linux, um, such as if you have, for instance, Visual Studio Code already set up and you've, in, and you've installed Swift, uh, you should be able to follow through 
The only difference will be that those of you who have a Macintosh and Xcode installed, you will be able to create a simple playground and see your changes immediately. For those of you who are following this on Linux and Visual Studio Code, for instance, you need to run the code manually. So you will need to just type your code and then call Swift compiler from, uh, from your terminal uh, or your console in order to run those codes. So it shouldn't be that different. So you should be able to follow along even on a Linux machine. So without further ado, let's just go ahead and create our workspace. Now, uh, I'll explain what a workspace really is. A workspace is a collection of pro projects. You could say a collection of files and projects. It's, it's really just one file that explains the structure of a project to Xcode. Uh, if you're if you're um, running things on Linux, you don't have to create a workspace. You probably can't because Xcode does that. And unfortunately, this Xcode um, basically Xcode application creates like a proprietary uh, format for all of its files, kind of. So uh, not the text files, but like the workspace and project files. They are proprietary XML format. Um, which is uh, puzzling why in this day and age it has to use XML really. But um, that's a different subject. So uh, if you're following through uh, with the course at home with Linux, then you don't have to create this uh, workspace. But if you're at home with a Macintosh, you need to go ahead and create this workspace together with me. So I'm going to bring up my Xcode just enough in here so that we can see what we're doing. I'm going to go to new and let's just say workspace. Then in here, let's just say Swift uh, crash course YouTube. Okay, in here. And let's just say, save this workspace. As you can see, it's just an empty workspace at the moment. So it doesn't have any contents. What we're going to do then, let's just increase the size of this. So it takes the entire screen. And then we're going to go ahead in file new. And then we're going to go into uh, file. And in here type playground in the search field and add a new blank playground. Okay. So the first concept that we're going to talk about in here uh, is going to be called variables. So let's just say variables. And I can see that our workspace was actually just created in here without any folder. So we might be able to remedy that before we create our playground. Let me just go ahead and open a finder window in here. So let's just go ahead in here. You don't see actually what I'm doing, but right here is the uh, folder. Then I'm going to take a, a I'm going to create a folder in here. Let's say Swift crash course YouTube and place this. And, and then we can close our Xcode, place the workspace in there. And let's just double click on the workspace to open our Xcode. So now all the playgrounds that we're going to create are going to be created inside that folder. OK. So let's go ahead and create our variables for um, a playground from scratch. So file new file. OK. And, and then in here, we're going to say playground. And you can actually find playground a little bit lower in here, I think, uh, somewhere in here. You can see in the playground section. So let's say bl blank playground and let's call the variables. OK, because we're going to talk about variables now. So this is the default thing that you can see in here. And basically, this is your view. You might see a whiter screen in here simply because, well, maybe you haven't changed your themes in Xcode. And that's something that you can figure out on your own how to change themes in Xcode. We're not going to talk about that. OK, let's clear this. And instead of importing UI kit, we're going to just import foundation. And if you're watching this course at home or wherever you're watching this on Linux, for instance, um, then and if you don't have a Mac OS, you need to also do the same thing. Just import foundation. Just create a simple Swift file. You don't have to create a playground. Just click, create a, a plain text dot Swift file and then import foundation library in here. OK. Very good. So now we've imported foundation and foundation uh, includes all the basic as its name indicates. It includes all the basics of what Swift uh, contains, really like how strings work, how integers work, all the default operations between these uh, different variables uh, and even optionals, etc. So importing foundations is one of the most important uh, things you can do basically in your Swift file as you're as you're getting to learn Swift. OK, so let's go ahead and talk about variables in Swift. There are two different uh, syntaxes or keywords for creating variables. One is using a let 
and the other is creating a variable using var. So let and var. The difference between these is very confusing for some people in that they think that let creates immutability and var creates a mutability. However, the only thing different between these two is that a let variable cannot be assigned to again, whereas a var can be assigned to again. And there are some other small differences between them such i mean we will actually look at those things and when we're working with classes for instance or structures how they differ from each other uh, but for now just know that let cannot be assigned to again and var can be assigned to again but also keep in mind that there are some other small differences between them which we'll explain okay so let's go ahead in here and say let my name uh, and then we say equal to lambda for instance and then we say let your name is foo okay after you've done these and created these two variables uh, you cannot assign to them again simply because they're let variables so let's say my name is your name and if we go down here at the bottom of the screen you can see my mouse and i'm going to hold on this button so i'm just going to press my trackpad and then say automatically run and this will just ensure that this playground will be automatically executed anytime we change anything in it. Okay. You can see the error. It says that cannot assign the value. My name is a let constant. So that's how you know that you cannot assign to it again. After creating a let constant, uh, you just need to leave it. You don't have to, you, you can't basically assign a new value to it. Okay. So that's how let works. Now let's go ahead and create a variable. So for now, we're just going to create a simple array and I already assume that you know what arrays are, but we're going to talk about collections a little bit later. Just know that in Swift, you create an array with this syntax with square brackets. Okay. So let's say var names is, we're going to say my name and your name. Okay. So we just created an array in here. And you can then see the results to the right hand side. You can see this array contains van dot and foo. Okay. Now you can go ahead then and say, since this is a variable, then it can be mutated even internally if it contains, for instance, a structure. So we say names and then we can call an append function on it and we say bar. And then we can also add baz to it, as you can see in here. So by the end of this, then our array called names contains found dot foo bar and baz. However, if you change this to a let, you will see that we'll get some errors in here saying that this is a let constant cannot use mutating member on immutable value names now this goes to um, this goes a little bit deeper in how um, let and var are different from each other but in order to understand that we need to understand what structures are because arrays in swift by default are structures if you're not using old objective c arrays for instance so just know that by creating a variable array, you can append to it and you can remove stuff from it, for instance, as we'll see later. However, if this is let, you cannot mutate even the internal values inside it. So you can see there are two mutability concepts in, in Swift. One is that you can actually mutate this array. For instance, you can say names is completely equal to another variable like blah. Okay. So you can see all of a sudden it became blah, blah bar bass you see so this is mutating the variable itself you it is actually assigned a complete new array to names as a variable and these two statements are mutating what is inside this variable so doing a let in here prevents both assigning a new value to names and also mutating names however having a var you can assign a new variable to names and you can also mutate names internally okay so this is another difference between let and var so it is also very very important to understand these uh, two differences uh, mu mutation of the variable internally and assigning a new ver value to the variable to mutate it so a lot of developers struggle with that especially in the beginning so i completely understand if it is a little bit difficult to start with but the earlier you learn this concept, uh, the better, because otherwise I think uh, Swift can become quite difficult for, for you to understand going forward. So spend some time and uh, experiment with uh, let and var.
but we will have quite a lot of examples in this chapter so you don't have to do it on your own okay so now if you change a variable like if you've created a variable and you assign a new value to it and uh, it won't it won't change the object that it originally was assigned to now I'll, I'll explain what that actually means so let's say let foo let's create another space in here let's say foo is foo and then we say var foo2 is equal to foo like this okay you can see now this variable of foo2 contains the value inside foo all right and you can see both of them contain the string foo now if you go ahead and set the value of foo2 to for instance foo2 like this you can see that foo and foo2 still contain the values that you'd expect foo it, it contains foo and foo2 contains the new value so by assigning a new value to foo2 which was previously equal to foo you're not overriding the value that was inside foo simply because this is referring to this and the reasoning behind this is that we're working with something called value types now i will explain more value types later but all you need to know for now is that by assigning the value of foo to foo2 we're simply copying this value over to foo2 so this value is being completely copied and you're creating a new instance of it inside foo2 so now we have two foos inside memory by this point so we're not getting a reference so it's not a reference type that we're talking about swift has value types and reference reference types for those of you who are not familiar with this concept from before don't worry about it i'll explain it more in details but for those of you who are familiar with this concept just know that uh, structures which are uh, basically a swift string is a type of structure it in structures are basically value types and then we also have classes and uh, which are reference types and we will explain all of these later in the future but just know that by assigning a value that was assigned to uh, a variable with let assigning it to a variable like this with var uh, and then changing the value of that variable uh, and assigning a new val value to that variable you're not changing the uh, value that was assigned to that variable initially i know that i mean this this sentence is a little bit complicated but i think i think uh, you get my point in here what i'm trying to say okay now we can ha have a look at another example of this and how that looks so let's go ahead and say let's more names and let's create a, an array in here and then we say foo and then a bar okay then let's uh, let's say we create a copy of it we say a copy is more names and simply because this is a let variable and also that we're working with a swift array which is a structure then we should know that structures are value types and assigning the value of a structure to another let variable in here creates a copy of this entire array for us okay so now that we have uh, sorry let's make this a copy variable basically let's now go and add some value to this cop a copied variable and say append and we say baz all right and then we say let's get the value of more names and then the copy you can see more names in here still contains foo and bar which were the original values however the copied variable now contains bass as you can see in here so adding bass to this copy did not change the values that were inside more names and this again goes back to how swift is working with value types in here it is copying over the contents of more names into this copy variable and changing this variable's internal data does not affect the original data which it was assigned to in the beginning okay so hopefully that makes sense by now now one thing that can be a little bit confusing for developers is when we when they're working with let and var but with old objective c classes all right and this this can be a little bit strange to start with like a lot of developers who are not so familiar with swift would say that let creates immutable variables so you cannot change them internally however if you're working with a let variable uh, with a let constant for instance in swift however that is that its internal value is an instance of a class that class can mutate internally 
without this letter variable getting in the way. Let's have a look at an example. For those of you who are familiar with Objective-C, you know that there is a class inside Swift which is called NS Mutable Array. Now, if you just want to learn Swift, you don't at all need to know about this. It is simply for those of you who are a little bit curious about let and var, okay? I'm just gonna demonstrate this to you, but please, if you're not completely understanding this example, it is completely fine. Chances are, if you're working with Swift and you're learning Swift, Swift UI, and even if you're working with UI Kit, for instance, to create your UI applications for iOS, Mac OS, whatever, chances are you may not really be using the uh, this uh, thing that I'm going to show you uh, at all. Or maybe you'll use it once or twice in your entire career. And uh, more and more Swift gets modern, less and less we're going to use these classes. So, But for those of you who are Mac developers, for instance, you probably actually work with NS Mutual Array perhaps often. Okay, if you especially if you have an old code base. So let's create a constant in here where we say let old array and we create an NS mutable array in here, okay? And then in here, we say that the value is an array, okay? And then we say the array contains the values of foo and bar, like this, okay? Then you can see in here that Swift Playground says old array is foo and bar, right? And you see, oh, this is let, so we cannot change its internal values because if you, for instance, have a look at this one, an array again, okay, which is created with let, if you say more names, and you say append, and you say hello, you will see that you will get an error in here. It will tell you that you cannot append to this variable because it's created with a let statement or a let syntax, okay. However, in here, since we're creating a let old array that is equal to a class instance, which is not a structure, and again, I completely understand that we haven't talked about classes and structures yet, but just know that this is not and uh, this is basically, as its name indicates, it is mutable internally. It can be changed whether it is assigned to a let or a var. It doesn't make any difference. It is a class, whereas this is a structure. Okay. And structures are value types and classes are reference types. Okay. So just know that for now that this is indeed mutable, even if it is assigned to a let variable. Okay. So now all of a sudden you can say old array and then you can say add and let's say baz. All right, and now you can see Swift Playgrounds runs this code and tells you that indeed your let constant, what you thought was constant, has changed internally. All right, now you can go ahead and create a new variable and we say new array is old array. And if you say new array, add QUX in here, Cux, okay? And then we say old array and we say new array. Now you can see the results in here. Since new array got the value of old array, uh, you add a new value to this new array and you'd expect probably for new array only to change, not for old array to be affected. However, you can see the result that both old array and new array are actually referring to the exact same array. So this can cause a lot of confusion for developers who are, for instance, new to Swift thinking that, oh, I just created a let immutable variable. No one can change this. However, you can see that it got changed. and. Even worse, you can if if you pass this value, for instance, to a function, and uh, that function itself can also change this variable. So it is quite dangerous. Just by using let, it's not that we're completely getting rid of uh, mutability in Swift. So a lot of things can go wrong, especially if you're using reference. Uh, reference types such as NS mutable array. But don't worry about it. I mean, if, if this is a little bit alien at the moment, I will explain this a lot more in details later. Okay. And as I mentioned, be very careful when you're working with mutable types in uh, Swift and when you're passing them, for instance, to functions, uh, because those functions can actually change your mutable types, even if they say they don't. Okay, so let's have a look at this. Let's say we create another array in here. Let's uh, let's copy this, and I'm gonna say let uh, some names, and then we say foo and bar. Okay, so that's fine. Let's create a function, and I completely understand we haven't talked about functions yet, but this is the syntax of what functions look like in Swift. So we say func change the array, and then we have an argument called array, and in here we say ns array. Okay, now I'll explain to you what ns array is. ns array is the um, 
And this mutable array is the mutable uh, variant of NS array. And if you actually go to the source code for NS mutable array, let's say NS mutable array, you can see that it subclasses NS array. So anywhere you have an NS mutable array, uh, sorry, anywhere your function or call expects an NS array, you can actually pass an instance of NS mutable array to it because it will just work. It will be downgraded to NS array. Okay. So let's say that we look at this function and this function just looks like it is working with an immutable array in here. However, internally it can say, let's, let's just say copy is array as in a mutable array. So this is a syntax in Swift that you shouldn't really use that often, but uh, code can actually do that without, without getting bugged by uh, Swift really. Okay. So you can see in here, we're saying we're creating a copy and uh, oh, a rage uh, array like this, where uh, we're basically creating a variable that is called copy. However, it's not really copying the instance. It's just named copy. Uh, so maybe we could just call it array two or something or just copy, but uh, just know that it is really not copying the uh, value inside this array. It is just assigning it to this variable, uh, but it is setting its data type. It's promoting its data type to a mutable data type. It's assuming that it is mutable. Okay. It's, this is really bad code. You should never write stuff like this. Okay. But I'm just demonstrating that it is possible to write code like this and you should kind of guard yourself against code like this. And then in here we say copy dot add vas. Okay. Now, if you pass, if you call this function, change the array with your mutable array, everything will just work as expected. Some names. And then you can say some names and have a look at the data. Now, when this code is run, you can see in this scope, some names after uh, being passed to change the array has actually been internally mutated. You can see foo, bar, and pass. So this bas that this function added to this array is actually present outside that function as well, simply because we're working again with reference types, meaning that there's one copy of this in the memory and this function is actually changing the original copy. Okay. So that was really uh, it. That's what I wanted to explain in this particular section of the video with variables and uh, constants. So just know that you have let and you have var and um, let it, uh, if working with uh, value types, such as structures of Swift arrays or strings or integers, it prevents immutability uh, of that value internally, meaning that you can't change this value to, for instance, say, uh, my name, uh, my name, uh, and then you can say uh, uh, is equal to actually my name make uppercase. You can't do stuff like this. So you cannot and like change the value that is assigned to this. And you can't reassign a value to my name after it has been created. Okay. So the reassigning that you cannot reassign a value to a let constant applies to both reference types and, uh, and value types. So it doesn't matter if, if the value inside this let constant is a string or it's an instance of a class, as long as it's let, you can't assign a new value to it. For instance, let's say here is, you can see it is a sum names. It is an instance of a class, which is a reference type. Uh, however, the fact that you cannot reassign a value to this still holds true, whether it is holding an, an instance of a class or an instance of a structure. So let's say sum names is uh, blah in here. Now we should get an error in here saying that you cannot reassign another value to this after you have created it. So this reassigning to a let constant applies both to reference types and value types. However, the internal mutability of a let constant only applies uh, the prevention of internal mutability of um, a let constant only applies to value types such as structures. If you've assigned a class to a let constant, the class might internally change without Swift actually complaining at all. Okay. So I completely understand it's a little bit complicated. And I personally believe that some other programming languages have implemented this a little bit more beautifully and a little more uh, like fluid, such as Rust. And I have some courses actually about Rust as well. So you can watch my Rust crash course, for instance, on YouTube and learn about mutability in Rust as well. But uh, I, I believe that Rust has implemented 
uh, mutably a little bit nicer than Swift uh, because Swift can cause some confusion in how it handles uh, mutable values. But for now, just know these simple roles and then we can move on to the next uh, section of this video. All right. Now that we've talked enough about variables, let's move on to another concept, which is very, very important to learn in any programming language that you're learning at the moment. And those are, or that is uh, operators. So operators are small functions that are a little bit special in how they're declared and Swift uh, treats them as such, it treats them a little bit more special than other functions. So um, let's have a look at what operators are. But before doing that, let's create a simple playground for operators. So let's say go, let's say file new, and we say file if we can find it. Oh, we can't because we can't create a file inside this. So let's be in here inside our editor, and I'm going to say command N. And then I'm going to go ahead and create a playground in here. Let's say blank playground. And then we're going to say uh, operators, but be very careful because by default, Swift playgrounds uh, or Xcode actually tries to create this playground inside another playground. And that is horrible. It is really awful. And uh, just please just use the uh, main folder to create your playground and also add it to the main uh, uh, Xcode workspace uh, structure as well in here. So let's say create. Now we have operators and let's do the same thing in here. And let's say import foundation. Okay. After doing this, let's start talking about uh, operators. So let's create two uh, constants in here. Let's say my age and we say 22 and we say let your age is 20. Okay. Now let's work with our first two operators and those are the greater than and less than operators. If you have two integers like this, uh, and I kind of expect you to already know what an integer is from other program language, per perhaps that you already know. Then we say if my age, uh, then uh, once you have two integers, you can use this particular operator that you can see it says greater than. So the left side should be greater than the right side, your age, your age. Uh, and this is an if statement, okay, which uh, I kind of already, I actually, I kind of expect you to already know what if statements are. So you can see now we're using an if statement and then and putting our left hand side and right hand side variables in here and using an operator, which is uh, having this kind of uh, syntax. So what this operator is doing is comparing the value to the left with the value to the right, and it returns the value of true if the value to the left is indeed greater than the value to the right. Okay. And here, then we can say, I'm older than you. Okay. And then we say else if my age is less than your age. So this is another operator that works between integers, for instance, that says it will, I will return true if the value to the left is less than the value to the right. Then in here we say, I'm younger than you and else, oh, hey, we are the same age. Okay. So if I'm not older than you and I'm not younger than you, then we should be the same age logically. All right. You can see nothing is happening in this playground because we don't have automatic running. So I'm just going to hold my trackpad on this button and then I'm going to say automatically run. And then you can see that our code is going to run in here and the value, basically we got into this branch of our if statement, I'm older than you simply because this operator indicated to Swift that the value to the left is indeed uh, larger than the value to the right, return the value of true, and then Swift fell into this if statement. So that's these two are uh, the first operators that we're seeing in Swift, basically. However, I mean, there are some other very special operators, such as the equal operator that we're seeing in here, but we shouldn't really go ahead in explaining that we're simply assigning a value to a variable in here with that operator. Okay. Now, uh, there are other operators such as plus, for instance, let's say let my mother's age is my age plus 30. So this is a an operator that is operating between two integers again from the left hand side and the right hand side. So it simply takes the value to the left and adds the value to the right to it and then returns that result to us. OK, so that's another operator that we're seeing in here, uh, the plus operator. You can also, of course, use, for instance, uh, the multiplication operator. And we can say let double, uh, double my age is my age. And you say times two. And as you can see, this is an operator that is sitting between two integers. Again, it takes the integer to the left and uh, multiplies it by the integer to the right and returns the value 
and which then gets assigned to this variable. You can see it's 44. If you remember, the age was set to 22 times two is 44. So you've probably now seen a few operators in here and you're wondering, okay, how many different types of operators are there? And there are three different types of operators in Swift. Uh, I mean, not, I'm not counting uh, these operators. I'm just talk, talking about three different types of operators, okay? The first one is called a unary prefix. The second one is called a unary postfix. And the third one is called a binary infix. Okay. So when we're talking about unary, as, as you remember, let's actually write them down. Let's just say uh, one is unary, unary prefix. The second one is unary postfix. And then the third one is binary infix. Okay. Wherever you're seeing unary, just know that this thing is working with only one value. Again, working with one value and binary is working with two values. Okay, so you can now imagine that this operator, the multiplication operator that is working with two values is indeed a binary infix. It is binary because it's working with two values, the left and the right hand side. And it is an infix operator because it's sitting in between. So infix in between. Okay, it's sitting in between two other uh, values. So all the operators that we've seen so far, the greater than or less than, uh, basically addition and multiply multiplication are binary infix operators. We haven't seen a unary and uh, sorry, unary prefix and unary postfix. So let's have a look at unary prefix. As you'd expect, unary works only with one value. So let's say let foo is true. So this is just assigning the value of true to foo. However, if you want to change the value of this true to false and you want to flip it, basically, you use this operator in here, which is the apostrophe operator, which is a unary prefix val uh, operator that takes the value to its right hand side and basically um, negates it. OK, so you can see in here true became false simply like that. So this is a unary prefix. It's prefix because it's before the value that comes right after it. OK. <laughs> Then we have a unary postfix. So a unary postfix operator is a little bit special. I mean, in all my years of working with Swift, I've been working with Swift since summer of 2014. It is very, very seldom that you create your own postfix operator, a unary postfix. There are some unary postfix operators already in, built into Swift, but and you use them perhaps quite a lot. However, creating your own postfix, a uh, unary postfix operator is something that you do very, very seldom. Okay, let's have a look at a unary postfix operator. Let's say name, and I'm just going to create an optional value. Now, I know we haven't talked about optionals, but just for the purpose of demonstrating what a unary postfix operator is, let's go ahead and write this syntax. Let's say optional, and then we say van dot. Okay, now, if you want to grab the value that is inside this uh, variable and unwrap it, we say let unary post fix is equal to name. And then we put this apostrophe after this name. Now, just know for now that what the what we did in here is that we put an optional value into a variable called name and optional simply means that this name can either contain no values or it can contain a value. That's what optionality in Swift means. But I've prepared a completely separate playground for optionals, which we're going to talk about a little bit later. Uh, however, this you can see now uh, it goes ahead into this optional uh, value and grabs the internal value and assigns it to this. OK, so let's say uh, if we in here say type of name and then we can type of unary postfix. Now they have two different types. You can see the type of this variable is an optional string and the type of this variable is indeed a string. So this unary postfix operator went inside this optional and grabbed its value out and forced it out and assigned it to the variable to the left hand side, basically using the assign assignment operator. So this is a unary postfix operator. It comes after a variable and it works only with one variable. So it doesn't have a variable here and a variable there. It is only working with the, va uh, the variable to its left hand side. OK, prefix uh, unary prefix works with the value after it. Postfix, wor uh, postfix works with the value before it. Okay, 
So that's the second example, basically, for unary postfix. Now, for the last type of uh, operator, which is the most common type, and we call them binary infix, simply because they work with two values, hence the name binary, and also inf infix, simply because they sit in between the values that they work on, okay? So let's say result is one plus two, and this is a simple example of a binary infix operator. You can see it's working with two values and sits in between them, okay? And another, another example is, let's say, let names is equal to foo, and then we say plus, empty space plus bar. And this is another um, infix binary operator that is sitting between two strings. You can see, uh, you may be a little bit confusing. You can say, oh, but if this is sitting between these two strings, what is this sitting in between? Is it a prefix operator? Well, it is not. What is happening here is that Swift is executing this code from the left-hand side because there is no parenthesis. Then it says, okay, foo plus, empty space becomes foo plus, like empty space like this, and then takes this plus and uses it in between the result of the previous statement and bar. Okay, so that's what is happening inside this code, basically. Okay, so that was an example of a binary infix operator. And as I mentioned, most operators that you use in Swift are going to be binary infix. There are quite a lot of actually other operators as well, but we don't use them so often. Okay, Depends, again, also on your code base. Now, there is another category of operators, and uh, which is called a ternary operator. Okay, and ternary is something that is a kind of a hot topic in any programming language that supports ternary, simply because it can be misused and it can cause your code to look very, very difficult to read, actually. So um, what I suggest, oops, uh, what I think is a good idea is always a check with your uh, with your teammates uh, who are working with your colleagues basically uh, in your team and ask them if uh, if they're comfortable with ternary and if they're if they are what are the um, what are the boundaries that they that they feel comfortable using ternary operators within uh, ternary can become very complicated especially if you're nesting them if you're using a ternary inside a ternary uh, and uh, it's just good to check with people what they're comfortable with Okay, but let's just have a look at a ternary operator. Let's say let's age uh, is 30. Now, let's say that you want to display a message uh, to the user saying that uh, let's message. And then you want to say, if the age is over or equal to 18, then this message should say you are an adult. However, if the age is less than 18, uh, then you should say you are not yet an adult. How do you do this? Well, what you could do is to say let, let's message is a string, okay? Uh, and then you could say uh, if age is more than or equal to 18, then message is you are an adult. Otherwise, message is you are not yet an adult. So this works actually very well. And you can type the message out. You can see now it says you are an adult simply because the age is 30. Or if you were 16, it would say you are not an adult yet, or you're not yet an adult. However, there's another way of writing the same exact code. So let's just comment this out. Okay. And that is using the ternary operator. So in here, you can see we've defined our variable first, and then we're going using an if statement and an else statement, and then assigning values to that variable. Okay. However, you can also say let's message is, then you would put your um, condition in here. You say condition. Okay. And then the format is, then you put a question mark. Then you say value if condition is met. And then, so let's put this to the next line and then a uh, colon in here and value, value if the condition is not met. So this is the format of a ternary operator. First, you put your condition in here. So what is the condition? So if the age is more than or equal to 18, so just let's just write it. Age should be more than or equal to 18. Then we say that the value should be you are an adult. Then the value if the condition is not met is you are not yet an adult. And that is exactly how you write a ternary operator. So you say 
you take your variable that you want to actually calculate the value of, then you say it's equal to, then you put the condition of your ternary operator, and then a question mark, after a question mark follows the value that you want to assign to your variable, uh, should the condition be met, and then a colon, and the value that you want to assign to your variable should the condition not have been met. Okay, and you can see now the message is you are an adult. And if you change this value again to 17, you can see the value will be changed to you are not yet an adult. Okay, so I hope that you now got an idea of uh, some operators in Swift. You, we've had a look at different types of operators, unary prefix, unary postfix, we have binary infix, and we've also looked at a, a fourth category of operators, which are ternary operators. And again, just be a little bit careful with ternary operators because not a lot of developers are actually very comfortable using these. I met, I personally like ternary, especially like in these cases where is less code, is understandable, is uh, compact, is not so much logic. However, some developers just write them all in one line like this, and that can be a little bit difficult to read. I ex I actually agree. My uh, habits in Swift is to manually break my code down into smaller bits and pieces like this into different lines as well. Uh, and unfortunately, unlike some other programming languages like Rust and Dart, and there is no internal analyzer as such, uh, sorry, there are no formatter. So Swift code, you need to format it by hand, unfortunately, and it has been uh, eight years since Swift's come out, and there's still no internal formatter for Swift. Of course, you can select your code and then indent your code with control I in Xcode, but you cannot have Xcode format your code for you as you type. So that is a little bit of an unfortunate uh, problem that we have to de deal with, but it is what it is and we can just get used to it. So if you want to make your code a little bit more readable, I suggest that you format it a little bit by hand. So kind of handcrafted as well. Okay. That was really it for the operators. So in the next section, we're gonna look at if and else statements. So see you there. Now that we're done with operators, let's go ahead and create a new playground for if and else. So right here, I'm gonna press Command and N on Macintosh. And let's say playground in here. Oops, if I can spell it. And a blank playground. And let's just call it if else. And please just ensure that you're not creating it inside an existing playground. You can see in here it's called operators and we should change that to be inside our main folder basically. Okay. And then we say it shouldn't be inside the operators group either. It should be inside the group of our workspace. So create. Now we can collapse the other ones. And in here, just like normal, we say foundation, not like normal, actually like usual, I meant to say. So let's talk about if and else statements. We've already seen a few examples of if and else. And if you've uh, already done programming in another programming language, you should already be familiar with what if and else statements are. So it's just a conditional basically. Okay. Let's add a few values in here. So I'm just going to copy and paste some values and place them in here. So some seed values that we can work with. Okay. Let's create a simple if statement and an if, sorry, an if and else statement. So we say if my name is equal equal valid. So in here, so like this, and so this is using a lowercase v as you can see in here. Okay, then we say uh, your name is, and then we're gonna add our variable within a string, and this is how you do it in Swift. You say back uh, backslash, and then parenthesis, and then you say my name in here. Okay, then in here we can say else uh, with no conditions in front of it, and then we say oops, I guessed, I guessed it wrong like this. And then let's do an uh, automatic run for our playground. And we should now come to the oops part because we guessed the name incorrectly with a lowercase v as you can see in here. So this is a simple if statement. So you compare something with uh, with something else. And then you can have an else block or not, you can actually just have an if statement as well. So you don't have to have an else block in Swift. Okay. Now, you're not limited in, uh, you're not limited only to one else statement, you can have uh, else if as well. Okay, so let's just say if uh, my name, 
my name is equal equal land up with the proper spelling as well with a capital V. Then we say now I guessed it correctly. Okay. And then we say else if my name is foo. Now you can see that we have another branch. So we have an if and then if that case is not met, then the program will fall into this statement. So it's very important to understand that it's not that Swift is executing both of these concurrently. It's executing the first one first. If that condition is met, then Swift goes in here and ignores everything, all the other statements inside the if statements. So all the other else ifs and the last else statement if it is uh, available. So it's just branching basically, okay? So if my name is foo, as we say, are you foo? And this doesn't really matter what you type in here. I'm just trying to demonstrate how if and else if basically statements work in Swift. And then we can have a final else statement in here and says, okay, I give up. Okay. And you can see that Swift has gone into this branch because name was correctly set to Vandat and we're comparing it with Vandat. Uh, sorry, it wasn't set to Vandat. I mean, it was set in here, but we're actually comparing it correctly with the correct value in here. Okay. And some people write their if statements a little bit more in like what I call a flipped way. In, in here, you can see we're saying if my name is equal to Vandat. And so if you're reading it like you would read an English sentence, I would say if my name is equal to Vandat. However, some people actually do it in the opposite way like this. They would say if Vandat is equal to my name. So this is another way of writing it, an uncommon way of doing this. And a lot of old and like um, a little bit old school developers would do stuff like this. Uh, it is not so common in uh, all my years of working as a software engineer. I've seen one or two people preferring this. However, uh, me and my colleagues have been able to uh, convince them otherwise that this is <laughs> this, we shouldn't do this. And most modern source codes don't do this. However, you may be an exception in maybe you're working at a company where this is the prevalent way of doing if statements in that you actually put the value that you um, are testing um, last and then you compare it with the value uh, that you're expecting first. Uh, as I said, this is a little bit uncommon in my experience, but maybe at the company that you are, you and your teammates have decided that this is the way to do it. Uh, it is completely equal to this. It is the same thing as this code. Uh, I mean, what it achieves is the same. However, the syntax is a little bit different. Okay, so it is up to you and your teammates to decide what which way to do. However, if you're new to Swift, I beg you to please don't do this. Uh, it is this way that you should learn how to write your if statements. So please don't flip these values. Uh, however, if you're a seasoned developer and you know exactly what you're doing, and you and your teammates have decided that in your code base, all your if statements should be written like this, uh, or in just a few exception cases, you write your code like this, as long as you've checked with your teammates and everything is fine, then you go ahead and do it. But if you're learning Swift just now, this is the way to write an if statement. Okay. And this is the way that almost everyone writes their if statements, seasoned or not seasoned. Good. So that was uh, simple. These, these are some simple uh, if statements, basically comparing a value with another value. But what if you are having a little bit more complicated logic in here? So let's say that you want to make sure that your name is Vandat and that your age is also 30. So you can see the age is defined in here as 20. Let's just go ahead and compare it with 30 instead. Let's say if my name is Vandat. And in here, if you want to compare also the age, you can say and my age is 30, for instance. Okay, then we say name is Vandat and age is 30. Then we say else if a my age is 20, then we say I only guess the age, right? And then an else statement in here, we can say, I don't know what I'm doing. Okay, so as you'd expect, now we're going to go into this line of code. So what happened in here is that Swift started executing this code from left to right. And I said, okay, from left, the name is truly Vandat. And it started comparing the age. And this says age is indeed 20 is not 30. So I'm not going to go into this if statement. So it ignores this if then it looks at the code that follows this if statement and says, oh, it's an else. Otherwise, if the age is 20, is the age 20? Yes, it is. 
then it falls into this statement and then ignores the rest of the else. So you need to think of if statements as in branches, it, they get executed separately, not concurrently, and they're basically in a serial order uh, from the first statement. If it fails, goes to the next statement, then goes to the next statement. If any of these statements succeed in trapping uh, the logic, so this one trapped and said, okay, if the age is 20 and it, and in, it is indeed, then the code goes in here. If any of these else statements or if statements do that, the entire rest of this code is then ignored. So this didn't fall into, so this, we didn't fall into this. We did fall into this and then the rest is completely ignored regardless of how many else's you have in here. You can say else if blah, blah, and then another else after that, but all of those will be ignored. Okay. Now, just like we have the and operator in here, the logical and operator, we also have the or operator. Okay. But you need to be careful with it because you can actually uh, make the code uh, do things that you didn't want it to do. So let me just explain something in here. So uh, let's write an example. Let's say if my age is 20, not 200, or my name is Fu, then we say either age is 20, name is Fu, or both. So what happened in here is that you can see we say you, you may be reading this saying either the age is 20 or the name is Fu. But what Swift does really in here says either the name, uh, the age is 20 or the name is Fu or both of these. So even if both of these are true, then this code is executed. And the reason behind that is that if your age is 20, then the code actually comes here just by default. It doesn't even execute the rest. Okay. So that is the reason that if age is 20, your name might indeed be Fu. And that is what you've written in here, but the code has already fallen into this simply because the first part of the condition was met. So Swift doesn't even execute this part. It says, oh, age is 20. Of course, let's go in here. Okay. Simply because Swift looks at the statement after it says, oh, it's an or. So I don't have to execute it simply because I already know that my age is 20. So it falls here. Okay. So it can be either this part, this one, or both. And a mistake some developers make is they think that they can add another else block in here uh, and that else block will be executed as well. And that is not the case because as I've explained it before, if statements are serial and they get executed one at a time, if any of them traps the, um, the execution of the program, meaning that it actually results to the compiler understanding that, oh, this branch of code should be executed, then the rest will be ignored. So if in here you type else, if my name is Vandad, even if your condition is met, which in this case is because my name is truly Vandad, or my age is 30, sorry, 20, which it was set up here. If you remember my name and my age were Vandod and 20 respectively, this code will not be executed. So let's say it's too late to get in this clause. You can see that it won't be executed. It won't be displayed in here. Only this branch is executed simply because my age was 20. Okay. And I can change it actually to foo. And you can see it still gets here first because my age is 20. And the operator after that is a logical or meaning that, oh, if this or this or both, and it's since this one is true, it doesn't even have to execute this. Okay. So as I mentioned, yeah, or can actually, or and, and logical operators, they can get quite complicated in that if you're, if you're working with these operators and also parentheses, then you could create kind of confusing code. Uh, as well. And uh, if you actually don't use parentheses, sometimes your logic could be completely incorrect. Let me just show you an example. Let's write a code in here and we say, if my name is Vandod, <clears throat> and then we go to the next line and we say, and my age is 22. Okay. Then we go to the next line and your name is Fu. And remember my name is Vandod and my age is 20. Your name is Fu and your age is 19. Okay. Then in here, we're saying your name is Fu and we know that that is true in fact, or your age 
is 19. Okay, so we say, and what is this code actually doing? So we say my name is Vanlat, and I'm 22, and your name is Fu. Fu. Or you are 19. Do you see what happened in here? So what happened was that, uh, and you can see that this message actually is printed here in our playground, meaning that the code did fall into this as uh, into this execution branch so what happened you can say that my name is van Dutt and my age is 22 but you can say well your age is not 22 how did this code come here and the reason is because we're mixing ands and ors and you can see what what swift reads in here it says okay if your name is van Dutt and your age is 22 and your name is foo is this true then looks at all these ands. It says, yeah, your name is found out, but your age is not 22. Then it looks at the rest of the code and says, do I have any other logic to follow? And it says, yes, actually, you've written in here either these or that your age should be 19. And it looks at your age said, uh, yes, actually, your age is 19. So you can see how this could be confusing for you reading this you may think oh your name should be Vandot and your age should be 22 and your name should be foo or your age should be 90 so you may think that this part is executed separately and this part is separate but since there's no parenthesis between these swift reads it from left to right and then there's no uh, precedence uh, between the ands and ors so they have the same precedence so it says okay this entire thing is the same precedence and i just execute it from left to right and this or at the end basically traps the execution branch and um, ensures that the code falls into the if statement okay so writing code like this could be a little bit confusing what you might have wanted to write is this instead you probably wanted to say if and then parentheses okay and then this is your own logic so you want to basically check your name and age so let's put it inside parentheses so we say my name is Vandat, and let's go to the next line and my age should be 22 so you basically saying and so you say my name is Vandat, and my age should be 22 then you go to the next line and you say and and another parenthesis, your name is Fu, or your age is 19, like this, okay? So what is happening in here is, uh, and I can see our playground has some problem. So what this really equates to, I mean, if you wanna read it in English, you could say, my name is Van Dutt, and I'm 22. And your name is Fu, or you are 19. So do you see how this is different? So it says your name and my name is Van Dutt and I am 22. So this condition should be met. And so should this because we are using an and meaning that not only this condition should be met, but also this condition, then it says, okay, well, this condition is met because your name is Van Dutt and your age is 20. Actually, oops, we have 20 in here. So that, that's, that's interesting. So, uh, so we wrote 22 that's fine i mean let's let it actually be like this so it says my name is vanda and my age is 22 so it says oh this is not met okay so as soon as this is not met and this is an and statement it says oh i don't have to execute any of this now because i know that the left hand side of the and operator and the logical operator is not execute is not true so i'm not even going to execute this okay then if we put an else block in here then we can say hmm and uh, let's say, hmm, that didn't work so well. Okay, so if you put parentheses between these, uh, you can see that uh, the logic becomes a little bit clean, uh, clearer. So uh, we can change this actually, and we say, uh, let's say, or. Okay, and now all of a sudden you can see that this block of code is executed simply because either this should be true, or this, or both of them. And since this part is not true, it comes here and says, your name is Fu indeed, and your age is 19. Do you remember age was 19 and name was Fu? Then it executes this code simply because one of these branches is true. Either this or this or both. And we know that, that this is true, so it executes this code. So usually 
you don't write code actually like this. Thankfully, in Swift, uh, usually your code should make more sense inside your if statements, and you shouldn't have too many branches like this with ands and ors and parentheses. But sometimes, if you have very complicated code, if you're working with low level logic, for instance, at your service layer, you might write code like this. So, you should be ready to kind of uh, be able to handle and read this type of code. But I completely understand that it is a little bit complicated to look at it if you're just looking at it like this. And usually code like this is prefixed with some common explaining why we're doing things the way we're doing them. Okay. So that was it for our if and else playground. In the next section, we're going to talk about functions so we can create a separate playground basically for functions. After working with if and else statements, we can go ahead now and work with functions. We've seen a few examples of functions in Swift before, and hopefully you already know what functions are, so we don't have to go too much into details with functions. But let's go ahead and explore some possibilities that we have with functions in Swift. So command N in Xcode, or if you're in Visual Studio Code, I think also command N or control N on Linux. And uh, we are going to just search for playground in here playground and let's say blank playground in here and let's call it functions and then let's create it inside the main group and inside the main folder okay and I think it would be perhaps a little bit better if we change the size in here so I'm gonna go to themes in midnight which I'm using I'm gonna select all of these and then let's just change the font size perhaps to let's just say 36 perhaps or even yeah 30 36, I think is good enough. So we see the code a little bit better. Okay. So with functions in Swift, you have the same possibilities as you have in many other programming languages, such as Python and Dart and TypeScript, JavaScript, pretty much all the modern programming languages have some kind of same syntax and functionality for functions. So let's have a look at a few examples. So let's say we import foundation. I'm going to get rid of that part to the left, our explorer. So uh, we can create functions in uh, Swift with the func syntax or a keyword, and then the name of the function. And it should be camel case, meaning that the first word of the function name should all be lowercase and all the uh, subsequent words inside the function name should have uh, or their first letter as uppercase and all the other letters as lowercase. So here is an example of a function that takes no arguments and it has no return value. So let's say no arguments and no return value. You can see all the if the first word has all its uh, letters as lowercase and all the other words have their first letters as uppercase uh, that, that follow the first word. OK, then we put uh, parentheses in here and we can put our arguments in between the parentheses. But this function doesn't have any arguments. Then we do curly brackets. And then inside the curly brackets is the body of your function. And here we're just going to say, I don't have, I don't know what I'm doing. OK. And the way that we write these things in Playground is a little bit special because in Swift Playgrounds, whatever you type as a string will actually be printed inside the Playgrounds uh, preview. However, this is not how you would actually write Swift code. So you would probably just issue a print statement. OK, but in Playgrounds, this does make sense. So let's just do automatically run in here. So our code gets executed automatically without us having to do anything. And you can see nothing is being printed here simply because we're not calling or invoking our function. Now, uh, the process of invoking a function is just to tell to uh, tell Swift that you want the code inside this function to be executed. And the way to do that is just you use the function name, <clears throat> no arguments, and then with the parentheses and any uh, arguments that the function expects within the parentheses. Now, thankfully, this function doesn't have any arguments, so we don't have to pass any arguments within the parentheses either. And you can see the value is then printed to our playground console in here. OK, now uh, we can also have uh, functions that have arguments. So let's create a function that takes any integer value and adds the value of two to it. But this particular function is not going to have any return value again. So we're just going to have a look at how to pass arguments to a function. So let's say func plus two. So like this, and then we take a value and you can see this is how you specify an argument to a function in Swift. You just type the name of the argument and then you type the data type. And also there's another way of doing this. And I'll explain it later. 
Um, you can have two labels for a variable, one an external label and an internal label, which is something quite unique to Swift. You can have it in some other languages, but not in all. So here's an example of a function that internally creates a new a variable. Let's call it new value and then takes that value and adds a two to it with a unary uh, with a binary infix operator, as we've seen before. But you can see that it doesn't return anything. OK, and we can say plus two and then we can pass the value of 30 in here and you can see new value will be equal to 32 within this function. All right. So that's how you can basically pass a variable uh, to a function using an argument. Now you can have functions that return values as well. So they do some calculation and then they return a value. And the way to do that is to use this particular syntax, as I'll show you now. Let's say new plus two, and then we take a value of type integer and we return a value in here. And then we can just say we return a value of value basically plus two and the return statements in these simple functions that just have one uh, line of code is optional this is something that swift has taken from rust however rust takes it to an entirely new level in that rust allows even for you to type some more code in here and then the last statement inside the function that doesn't have a semicolon uh, will be returned however swift doesn't have that ability so because semicolons are optional in Swift. So uh, if you don't want to have a return value in here, if you don't want to type the return uh, syntax in here or a keyword, you're more than welcome to do that. Most modern code actually omits return. So if you see a statement like this, this function is set to return this statement implicitly. All right. And the way to call it is that you can say new plus two, and then you pass the value of 30 and you can see the value of 32 will be returned from this function. Okay. Now you can also have uh, functions with multiple arguments. So let's say func custom add. So we have a new add function in here. Okay. And we take two variables. So let's say value one int and value two int. All right. And then we return also an int. So what we return is value one plus value two. All right. So we take two arguments, value one, namely, and value two. We add them and we just return them as part of our function declaration. All right. Then we can assign the return value of this custom add to a variable. So let's say let custom added is equal to execute the function of custom add. And for value one, we pass the va value of 10. And for the second value, we pass the value of 20. And you can see the result is value of 30. So this function is being executed and its return value is being assigned to this variable to the left hand side of the assignment operator. OK, now you can also have functions that do not have this outside label as uh, as it is called. So uh, at the moment, this function has two arguments and they only have one label. This label is used externally, as you can see, at the call site and also internally inside the function. However, functions can also d determine how these labels are created. Every argument can have two label, sorry, two labels, external and internal. OK, so you can see that then internally inside this function, this label is not available. So if you type external, there is nothing available. But if you type internal, then it is available to you. OK, so and let's go back in here and have a look at an example of a function that doesn't have any external labels. All right. So for its arguments. So let's say func custom minus. All right. And it has two arguments and let's just call them left hand side and then right hand side. And we return an integer as well. OK. Oops. And then we say left hand side minus right hand side. Now, if you call this function just the way it is, then you can uh, you can write like this custom subtracted. And then we say is equal to custom minus. And then let's let's uh, let's say the value of 20 and the value of 10 in here. OK. And you can see then easily that at the call site, uh, we have to pass these argument names, LHS and RHS. However, if you don't want to do that, if you don't want to pass a, an argument name, you can just say custom minus, and then you want to say 20 and 10 like that. Then you have to make sure that Swift gets the external name as underscore like this. So underscore simply means that the call site where you're calling this function from shouldn't have argument names. So you can see now you have to remove LHS and RHS, and then your code will work as expected. 
Okay, so that's uh, how you can basically ignore external uh, argument names and just keep in mind that the first uh, uh, the first uh, part of the argument's name can be its external name and then if you put a space and then another uh, basically word or sentence hopefully not a sentence but a few words it will be the internal name of that uh, argument okay and if you don't have that the only name you have in here will be available externally and internally all right good so um if you are now, if you're in pure Swift, you can see in here, we're at the moment calling this uh, function like custom minus. But if you're in pure Swift, meaning that you're not inside a uh, playground, if you call a function that has a return value, so let's say custom add, and then you say value one is 20, value two is 30. In a playground, you just get the return value and the return value of this function will be displayed here. However, if you're in pure Swift, meaning that you're not inside a playground, then doing this will actually give you a warning telling you that you're calling a function without consuming its result. The reason we're not seeing that warning in a playground is that playgrounds consume the result of all functions implicitly and, and type them out here in the preview. But inside pure Swift code, when you're writing like iOS code or Mac OS code or watch OS, whatever, uh, you're uh, basically you don't have a playground in those codes. It's pure Swift code. So you need to consume these values, meaning that you have to assign them to something. OK, like that. And then you need to also consume this somehow. So even if you type code like this, Swift will complain saying that, hey, you're assigning this to add it but you're not using added anywhere. So what's the point of doing this function call? All right. So if you want to write a function in Swift that does produce a value, however, the person or the call site where you're calling that function doesn't necessarily have to consume that value, you can mark that function as discardable result. And I'll show you how to do that. So let's go ahead and create a my custom add function in here. So we say my custom add. OK, and then we have two arguments in here that are externally not named, but internally they're called LHS as in left hand side. And then we have RHS in here. OK, and we return integer as well. And we say LHS plus RHS. So if you want this function to be able to produce integer, but the call site, the caller of this function doesn't have to consume that integer, you need to mark this function as discardable result. Doing this in a playground doesn't make any difference at all, because as I mentioned, playgrounds consume the result of all functions implicitly. However, if you're in pure Swift, this will make a lot of sense. And uh, to be honest with you, we can actually have a look at this. I mean, now I'm improvising a little bit. I'm just going off the script, but let, let me just create a simple iOS project in here. And let's say my app. And then we're just going to save it on desktop. It's fine. I don't really care where it is saved at the moment. So let's just save it. And let me just show you how this looks inside a, for instance, Swift UI application. So if you go into our app in here and say, um, what should we do in here? Let's say uh, perhaps we have a window group in here. Let's go to content view. Uh, and now we have a Swift UI application, though. So it would have been better if we actually created a um, let, let's just create a file in here, a Swift file, let's say my service. Okay. And in here, let's just say that we have a, what should we do? Let's say uh, struct person. Okay. And then we create a function in here, just like we're learning now, we say get age. And this is not really how we write normal code anyways, but this is for the pur purpose of demonstration. And then we have another function that's called do something. And then we say let age is get age. So we call that function. Now, if we leave this code like this, let me just actually change this to, yeah, that's fine. If you try to compile this code, you can see that now we're getting initialization of immutable value age was not used or something, was never used, okay? And you, even if you write your code like this, you will get a warning saying result of call to get ages on you. So this is the warning that I was just talking about. Inside a playground, you don't get these warnings, but inside a pure Swift code, you get these warnings. So the way to fix that is to prefix this with discardable result and then compile your code. You can see then it's working as expected. However, if you assign this uh, to a variable, you will get the warning anyways because you're assigning it to a variable that you're not using later. So this discardable result doesn't fix this issue. However, it fixes the issue of you calling this function without assigning its variable to any values. Uh, sorry, without assigning its value to any variables. Okay. 
good you didn't have to create this project i mean this was just a test okay so that i can demonstrate what i meant in this case now that we have that we can just type my custom at and then we can just say, say the value of 20 and 30 in here without having to worry about consuming the result of this function now you may you may be thinking but why would you write a function like that well some functions for instance in service layers inside an application may do some complicated work and they may produce a boolean value indicating whether it was successful or not however it's not always that you actually care about that boolean value and you can call that function without caring about its result in that case you can prefix the function declaration with a discardable result as I showed you right here okay now functions can also contain their own functions so this is something that not many programming languages support darts for instance supports it and you can also have something like that in rust as well so let's have a look at that so we say func do something complicated with a value and you can see width is the external uh, argument label and value is the internal argument label in here okay and this function we can see returns an integer let's break this parameter down like this and then in here we say we have another function inside this that actually does the logic okay so we say main logic with a value and returns an int and in here we just say value plus two okay so we're not really doing anything complicated we're just plusing the value with two however this function do something complicated contains another function that does the actual logic and this function then can call this function internally but no one else in the entire application can call this function this function is only available to this function because it is written inside it okay then what we can do is say return the main logic we call that function we say value plus three then in here we can go ahead and say do something complicated with the value of 30. so what happens is that the value of 30 goes in here then 30 will be plus 3 33 and then we'll go into main logic so 33 plus 2 will be 35 as you can see printed out here okay now arguments in uh, swift for functions can also have default values so you can have for instance a function that says func get full name as you can see in here okay we say first name is the name of the argument internally and externally and it has the default value of foo and then we can say last name is a string and it has the oops the default value of bar okay and this function returns a string which is like this we put the first name in here and a space and last name all right so we're basically calculating a full name using this syntax now you can call this function now in so many different ways actually you can call it in three different ways i would say one is without arguments so because both the arguments that are uh, that are required for this function have default values so you don't have to pass any ar arguments to it and you can also mix and match you can for instance pass actually I, can, I think you can call it in four different ways yes so you can also call it only with a first name if you want to so you can say baz you can say you can see now the result will be baz bar so the last name is picked from the default value and the first name is overwritten by the value at call site and you can also say get full name and then we say only pass the last name let's say foo so now the value will be foo foo right and then you can also call it with both parameters so you can say first name and we say baz and last name we can say cox like this all right so you can see now the result will be baz and cox in here all right so these were just some examples of how you can create functions in swift now uh, we will actually look more at functions and how to create more complex functions perhaps but this is like the basic structure of how to create functions in swift and there are some functions of course that are a lot more complicated than what we have in here but the complication is usually inside the function itself the function um header or the function signature is usually one form of these things that we've written in here with some parameter with some arguments uh, that perhaps have internal or external names or some arguments that have no external names but internal names discardable result and pretty much pretty much that's it really so that's about functions for now in the next section of uh, this video we're going to have a look at closures which are kind of special functions so see you there now that we've finished talking about functions let's go ahead and talk about a special kind of function which is with local variables and it is called closure so before we do that let's create its own playground so i'm going to go here and say command n 
and type playground in here if I can spell it. And in blank, blank playground, I'm going to create closures in here and ensure again that it is created in your workspace and not inside another playground. Then I'm going to press the create button and let's say in here that import foundation. OK, now closures are available in many other programming languages such as Python. They're also available, available in Dart, for instance, and in, um, I would say, uh, Rust as well and of course, JavaScript and TypeScript. So most modern programming languages have closures. And what closures really are, they're special types of functions that are created in line so that you can actually pass them to another function, for instance, and they can hold a function. So you could, you could pretty much say that they're function references kind of, but not really. Uh, but I think the easiest way to explain closures is to demonstrate how they look like, how the, how the syntax looks like. And uh, I think after that, it will be a lot more, uh, it, it, it will be a lot easier to understand what uh, basically they do. So let's go ahead and create a closure in here, which is supposed to add two integers together and return a result. So if you were to do that using a function, you would probably do add, and then you would say like left hand side integer, right hand side integer. Uh, and you could perhaps also remove the external label of these arguments so that you don't have to actually write LHS RHS when you're calling this function. Then you would say that this function returns an integer. Then you could say left hand side plus right hand side is that function. However, if you want to assign this to a variable, for instance, call add, then you could say, let, let's actually comment this out. Then you could say let add. Then as you would do with uh, any other variable, you as you could do actually with any other variable, you, you don't have to do that. But you need to tell Swift what type of data type this function is accepting. So you could say, let's add and then you would say column and instead of for instance saying this is an integer equal to one or this is a string equal to foo you could say in here that this is actually a function right and then you say okay it accepts an integer and actually it accepts two integers and it returns an integer okay so this is you defining the data type of this variable or a closure okay and then you could say it's equal to so now you've defined a data type. Now you actually create the function. Then inside the creation of the function, you just create curly brackets as you would do any other function. And in here, then you get your data. You say left hand side is an integer, right hand side is an integer. Okay. And you return an integer. And then you say in like this. So let's actually break this down, bring it to the next line like this. Okay, so this is where you're defining the data type for at, and this is where you're actually assigning it to a valid function. All right, and let's change our playground to automatically run in here, and then you can see Swift is telling you that you're not returning anything in here. So let's just say LHS plus RHS, okay? And these values that we have in here, they're just internal uh, argument names. So they're not actually being used externally, okay? Now that we have add, you can see, it tells you that add is actually a variable that points to a function which requires two arguments and returns also an integer. So you could call add just like you would call the add function. So if you say add 20 and 30, you can see that you're pretty much just calling that function that is uh, beneath this add variable, you could say. Okay, so you get the result of 30. So now that you know how to create uh, one of these functions closures you can see you can create it in line like that you can actually pass any one of these functions uh, like these and uh, which you create in line to another function uh, and that's where the power of closures really come to play so let's create a quite a useless function and that be called custom add but it's just there for for the purpose of demonstration of closures so this custom function what it does it it takes two integer variables and then it uses another function that you give it. So you pass a function to this function and that function that is passed to this function will do the actual addition. And our function that we will create now will just call that function. All right. So it will just demonstrate how you can pass a function to another function and how you can create a function on the go or on the fly. So let's create this custom add function in here. We call it custom add like this. Okay. 
And this custom adds, it takes two, uh, two values. We call them LHS, left-hand side, all right? And then we say RHS, another integer. And as the second parameter, we want actually a function that does the addition for us. So this custom add itself doesn't really do the addition. It will delegate the addition task to the given function. So just like you would define any other variable, like here, you basically type the external argument name, internal argument name, or just one, one argument name that is used externally and internally. And then you would define its data type. This is very similar. You see defining a data type with a column. We did the same thing in here. So we want basically a function that takes an integer or two integers and returns an integer. So let's go ahead and define it here. We say the external label for this uh, argument is using. So we can say custom add, kind of like this custom add 10, 20 using like this. Okay. So the external name of this argument is using and internally it's called function. All right. And then we say this function requires two integers and it returns an integer. All right, so this is just like defining any other variable inside or argument inside your function signature. You just say external uh, data, sorry, external argument name, internal argument name, its data type, and its data type is pretty much just a function with two integers as arguments and returns an integer. Okay. After doing that, we close the arguments list with the closing parentheses, and now we have to define the return value of our function. So this custom add function at the moment, you can see it's not returning anything because the parenthesis ends here, but we don't have any of these pointers in here. So let's say that our function also returns an integer. Okay, then inside the function itself, inside this custom add function, we need to return an integer. But it is this function that does the calculation. So let's just call it just like you would call any other function. So we just say function, LHS and RHS. And again, this is just a label. It doesn't have to be called function. You can just call it F if you want to, or you can just call it L, H, whatever you want to. But I really, really suggest that you don't name your variables with F or H or L. It's just better just to call them something uh, that means something as well. Okay. And in this case, function, I think is a quite a good name uh, for it, but you might disagree. So we have function now, and you can see it is being called by custom add, and its, and its result is being returned from custom add. And you can call the custom add function, as I'll show you now. So let's say custom add. You can see we have three parameters. Okay, I'll break them down here. Now, the left-hand side, you can see it doesn't have any external labels. So let's just say 20, and then we say 30. Now, this using is going to be very interesting because usually when you come here, Swift is going to be able to substitute this for you using an, a trailing closure syntax. OK, so if I go here and press enter, you can see all of a sudden the using label was just completely removed. Now, if if you go ahead in here and you just want to see, OK, but what is happening in here? What you could do is instead go ahead and create a function in here because this should be a function. You see, it's telling you it needs to have two arguments and a return value of integer. You could create a function yourself and then say left hand side int, right hand side int, and it should return an int. And then in here, you and also please don't forget the in syntax because it needs to know. Swift needs to know where this function actually starts its body. Okay. Then in here, you say left hand side plus right hand side. So after doing this, you can see now the value of 50 being printed to the playground console. All right. So that's what you could do manually. However, what Synta the, what Swift does is that if it sees an argument at the end of a function, you can see, uh, sorry, an argument at the end of the list of arguments of a function. So here we have left hand side and right hand side, and then we have a closure that has to be passed to this function, but this closure is not like the first argument. It is the last argument. And Swift does something called a trailing closure syntax. What it does is that and we can actually do it by hand. We can go in here. You can see it removes this argument name, first of all. Then it puts an ending parenthesis here and then removes this uh, column. Then you can see this should pretty much do the same thing in here. So, and then it of course removes this uh, parenthesis in here as well. So now you can see the parenthesis ends here, and then there's no using uh, using argument name, and then there is a trailing closure right after the function is finished. So we can actually put this hmm, maybe here. Actually, it's good. Yeah. 
and we can clean this up as well a little bit like this. So this is the trailing closure syntax in Swift, meaning that if there is a closure at the end of a function, uh, then it shouldn't, it doesn't necessarily have to have all the bells and whistles around uh, argument names and etc. Okay, it can just uh, omit writing the argument name, close the parenthesis right after uh, the argument before it, and then creates the closure right after this function call, and it will be passed into this argument. Okay. So now you saw that we created a closure, which is this one, and we passed it to another function, which is then being used to calculate the value of 20 plus 30. Okay. Now, Swift also has a very handy functionality where it can infer uh, data types uh, based on the function signature. Now, I'll explain this a little bit now. Um, you can see in here, this function custom add already has defined that the closure being passed to the function argument has to have the data type of integer, integer, and it, sorry, it has to have the data type of integer for both of its arguments and also integer for its return value. Now, in here, then you could say, okay, but if this function already knows that it should be integer and integer, maybe I could just remove these. Well, you kind of would be right. You can just go in here and say, left hand side right hand side and then in and if it runs your code again you should basically see 50 again you can see in here so we could maybe change this to 30 just to see that everything's working as expected uh, there we go we got the value of 60 so you can remove these data types right so if let's actually copy this code and bring it a little bit down here and remove the data types like this and we can remove the return value as well. So that's the first step of cleaning up the code that you can do. All right. Now, a lot of developers would call this actually clean up. They would say, oh, yeah, you should remove these data types. They're not so good, etc. However, I've worked on a lot of big projects that have been written in purely in Swift. And once your code base gets very, very large that you have maybe thousands of source files and then every of those source files has hundreds of lines of code on average perhaps written in them i've noticed that i mean after doing a lot of uh, benchmarking on the compilation and asking xcode to tell me exactly where things are taking a time uh, or the most time during the compilation it's been where it has where the compiler has been trying to figure out data types so the less information you give to the compiler, the more time it takes for the compiler to compile your code. So here you can see we have a lot of information for the compiler. We're telling it that this closure has two arguments, integers, and uh, it's returning an integer. So the compiler doesn't have to figure it out on its own. So it says, okay, then I just calculate this and return the data. However, here the compiler has to ensure that, yeah, Okay, so the function, it has to go back to the custom add function and say, okay, this shouldn't have two integer arguments and it should return an int. Then it comes here and checks that because we haven't even told it what return value we have. Then it says, okay, there's some data here, some data in here, and they have to be plus together. Can two integers be plus together? Okay, so it's it has to figure figure out all of this on its own. So it has to basically look up the plus uh, function or uh, infix binary operator to ensure that that actually exists between two integers. So you can imagine all of this basically puts strain on the compiler. And of course, if you have thousands and thousands of these functions that where the compiler has to figure out things on its own, then of course your compilation is going to be drastically slower. Now. Now that we're talking about stripping information from the compiler, there's also one more step that you can take in order to make your code more compact and more difficult for the compiler to guess. But on small, smaller code bases, this is this doesn't really make any difference, to be honest. So let's actually copy and paste this code right here. What you can do in this case is that you can completely remove these this information from here. And in Swift, you can tell it that you have two arguments in here by specifying by prefixing every argument with its index and dollar. So you can say dollar zero plus dollar one. So dollar in here will mean basically a, an argument at an index of zero, which is this guy, and an argument at the index of one, which is this guy. And then you're just plussing them together and returning the value. So some developers will then be like custom add 20, 30, 
and then we'll do like this. So it is completely up to you and your teammates how you like to format your Swift code, because unfortunately there is no real uh, official linter and official code formatter for Swift, as I mentioned before. So there are some community guidelines how to format code, but you, you can't actually see code written like this sometimes. And to be honest with you, for me, at least this is readable. I have nothing against it. But if it was me writing this code, I would probably write it a lot more like this, uh, just because of uh, the experience I've had with ensuring that the compiler can compile my code uh, faster on larger code bases. But writing code like this is also completely fine, dependent on uh, the context. All right, good. Now, now that we've done that, let's have a look at passing um, some sort of special closures to functions. Uh, before I before we do that, let me just write some code in here as a pr like a preparation. So let's just define an array in here and say, and I'm also aware that we haven't worked with arrays yet, but if you've worked with another programming language, you already probably know what arrays are. So it's just uh, like a homogenous, uh, actually they can be heterogeneous as well, uh, but it's just like a series of data, okay? <laughs> let's just leave it at that. Let's just say ages are 30, 20, 19, and 40. So now we have four integers placed inside this array, okay? now. You can see in here, we can start sorting this array. Let's say that we want to sort things ascending and descending. So we say sort it, okay? And you can see it has a, an argument in here. There's a, a function called sorted using. Actually, let's just say sorted by. Let's say sorted by, this is a little, a little bit better. And you can see it expects a function. So it says, give me a function that takes two integers and then it can throw, and we haven't talked about throws yet, and it should return a Boolean, okay? So let's go ahead and see how we can implement this function. So we say LHS integer, RHS integer, and it should return a Boolean, okay? And then actually it throws as well, but we don't have to write that. And then we say in, all right? So uh, in here, let's just return true for now. And let's see what happens. Okay, so if you return true in here, let's see the data that is being returned in here. Uh, it says 14, 19, 20, 30. So it really didn't do anything. So, but if we say in here, uh, LHS should be more than RHS. Okay. And this is, of course, it's going to return a Boolean value. All right. Now you can see what happened is that the result is that the return from ages.sorted is an array that is sorted descending. So as long as left hand side is more than right hand side, if you're basically doing this comparison with greater than, then you're sorting the array descending. And you can read the documentation for sorted by as well to understand how it actually works, okay? It says when you want to sort a sequence of elements that don't conform to the blah, blah, well, let's see. And uh, that returns true when the first element should be ordered before the second. So it says return true when the first element should be ordered before the second. And and what we're saying is that if left hand side is more than the right hand side, then it should be sorted before. And that's why we're getting descending. And if you change this to less than, then you should expect your array to be sorted ascending. Okay. So what, what I'm trying to do in here is that we have a lot of code in here. You can see uh, that takes left hand side and right hand side returns a Boolean. However, there, uh, as you may guess, this uh, particular, um, operator, which is a binary infix operator, already takes a left-hand side and a right-hand side and returns a Boolean. So if we were to def uh, to implement this uh, operator ourselves, we would probably write it like this, right? Function less than, and we say left-hand side, integer, right-hand side, integer, and it returns a Boolean. And we say left-hand side less than right-hand side. However, please don't do this because this actually goes into a something called an infinite loop, it will go into an infinite recursion of itself because this function will just call itself. All right. So uh, what, what I'm trying to say in here is that if you look at this function signature, you can see it is exactly the same as this function signature. So and since this is a function name in itself, why don't we just pass it to this? So instead of writing all of this, why don't we just do this? right? Because it is the same thing. It is the exact substitute of this. So let's remove that. 
and remove this code as well. And you can see actually you can do that. So by passing a function or an operator, a binary infix operator to this, uh, to this argument, you're substituting pretty much all this code that we wrote in here. So a lot of newcomers to Swift will write code like this, but a lot of seasoned developers know that, that the, uh, this binary infix operator already is a substitute for that closure. So you can do the same thing for more than. So this is going to sort descending and this is going to sort ascending. So you can see here, descending sort and ascending sort. Okay. So that was uh, one, one example or rather two examples of passing operators to closures. Okay. Now let's move on to the next example. And for that, I'm going to go here to our custom add function and I'm going to copy it right, right here and let's paste it down here and let's call it custom add too. And if you remember, I mentioned that we have this syntax called uh, basically trailing closures in Swift, meaning that if there is a closure at the end of the function signature as its list of arguments, then Swift helps you out uh, by removing, by allowing you to remove the, the argument label and allowing you to trail basically the closure at the end of the function call as we saw in here. So you don't have to type uh, using in here, okay? Which is something that we otherwise would have to do. All right, like this using this and then parentheses. So since that uh, function, uh, since this argument is at the end, then we don't have to do all of that work. However, if you make a mistake of putting this argument, for instance, at the first place or in the middle, not at the end, then let's see actually what happened in here with a comma, then calling this function, you will have to do something uh, like you have to do mental gymnastics like this custom add to, and now you have to pass your closure like this, all right? And then you say LHS and RHS. And then you say LHS plus RHS. And then you have to go in here and say 20 and 30, for instance. Okay. So uh, I don't know about you, but this code looks a lot dirtier to me than it should be because it has a lot of labels and it is like it is a function or a closure before these values being sent here. Um, so to me, this doesn't look very clean, to be honest with you. And you can, of course, make this a, a little bit shorter as well. You can remove that code that you've written in here and you can say dollar zero, dollar zero plus dollar one, and then do it like this and then go 20, 30. So it, it becomes a little bit more readable if you do this. However, it's still not as clean as it can be. So uh, you can also put perhaps the value of 10 in here just to demonstrate that this is actually working as expected. So now this should be 60, okay? So uh, that's why I really suggest that you take advantage of uh, trailing closure syntax in Swift and add your closures if you have a closure argument at the absolute end of your argument list okay now we've seen how we can pass uh, operators like this to a closure uh, parameter of a function uh, but as you as you'd expect since arguments uh, sorry since operators are normal functions uh, you can also pass normal functions to closures so let's have a look at an example let's create a function in here it's called add 10 to, and then we get a value of integer and we return an integer and we just add 10 to this value. All right. And then we can have another function in here called add 22. And then we just add 22, whatever integer parameter that is uh, passed to our function. Now we can then have an, a, a function in here called do addition. All right. And then it takes uh, a value and we externally call it on and we say do addition on value, all right, int. And then we want to have a function that basically takes this value and does some addition with it and returns an integer, okay? So we say using a function, using function, and this function should take an integer as its only argument and it should return an integer, okay? So that's, uh, so it shouldn't take two integers basically, simply because we want to pass one of these functions, which has only one integer as its input to this uh, closure in here. Okay. And our function should return an integer. Then what it's going to internally do is going to invoke that function with this value and return its result as the result of our function. We could have written return in here, but it is not necessary in modern Swift. Okay. 
Now let's go ahead and invoke this. Let's say do addition and then we say uh, on the value of 20. And in here, using you could you could imagine that well you could create a trailing closure in here. You can see, and we say value, and we could say value plus thirty. Okay, so what is going to happen in here is this value of twenty is going to be passed here to this closure, and it's going to be twenty plus thirty. So let's see if Swift Playground is going to be able to recover, and you can see twenty plus thirty is fifty. Now instead of doing this, instead of passing this. Uh, uh, inter basically uh, inline closure to this using argument, you can, as you'd guessed, uh, pass a reference to any of these functions that has the same, uh, they, both these functions have the same um, header uh, or definition as this closure. They take an integer as their argument and they return an integer. So let's say that we say add 10 to like this. And you can see now it's this function internally going to be passed to this. So this function is going to be at 10 to and it's going to be invoked with the value of 20. 20 plus 10 is going to be 30, which is which is then printed right to our playground console. Then let's copy this and go here. And then we say add uh, do addition again on 20, but add 22, which is our other function up here. OK. And then we have the value of 40 printed to the screen. Now, uh, this function uh, is a little bit strange, as you can see. I mean, not strange, actually. They don't have external uh, uh, argument names. So if you change that and so that the value is actually the external argument name, then you have to change the signature past here as well. So then we should say add 10 to with value and add 22 with value. So just make sure that your function signatures are uh, basically uh, the right signature according to how you've defined those functions in here. Okay. Very good. I think this suffices for uh, closures, really. Closures are, as I've mentioned, uh, kind of inline arguments, uh, usually that you pass to another function. Uh, you can define closures uh, by assigning a function to a variable, and then you can pass that variable around to other functions as well. So Really, when a Swift developer is talking about closures, they're just talking about functions that are in line. So they don't have the func keyword before them. So any function that doesn't have the func keyword behind it is, in fact, a closure in Swift. You could pretty much just say that. OK, good. We're done now with closures and we can now move on to talking about a little bit more fun stuff in Swift, uh, namely structures. See you there. So we're now done with closures, or at least for now, let's go ahead and start talking about structures. I think from this point on in the course, we're going to actually have a little bit more fun since we've talked about the absolute basics of Swift up to this point. And you can imagine that the basics are not so fun. Uh, I think for me, at least personally, personally, the fun part comes in when we have enumeration structures, uh, classes, protocols, extensions, generics, all that. So let's get started with that. I'm going to go in here and let's do command N in Xcode and let's create a blank playground and we're going to call it structures. OK, structures again, a warning, please create, create this uh, not inside another playground, just change both the group and the folder to the root of your or to your workspace, basically. OK, and then we say create. So we have structures and let's import foundation as usual. I'm going to get rid of the uh, Explorer to the left hand side. So structures uh, in Swift are a way of grouping data together and giving some sort of a name. Structures in Swift are value types, and meaning that when you assign a, an instance of a structure to another variable, then the data inside that structure gets copied over. So you don't actually get, um, a, a, a get you don't get the same reference using two variables. I know, it, it, I mean, this could be a little bit difficult to understand for especially those who are not familiar with value types from another programming language, but don't worry about it. I'll explain it all soon. So let's just first of all, go ahead and create our first structure, which we're going to call person. OK, struct person. And in here, when you create a structure, you can then go and instantiate it. So you can create an instance of this person, such as let foo is person. OK, 
and you can see then you do this syntax in here with parentheses. And inside this parenthesis, you would eventually pass any arguments that the constructor of this structure requires. At the moment, the structure doesn't have any uh, values inside it, so it doesn't contain any properties. So that's important to understand the term property. It doesn't have any property. Uh, and we could go ahead and create properties. And the way to do that is using the let or var or, um, seen, uh, keywords in here. So you could say we have a constant in here called name, and its data type should be string. And all of a sudden you see your playground is going to give you an error in here. If you have automatic running as well, especially it tells you that you are missing an argument called name. Let's just ask it to fix it for us. And we say name. Okay. It's a string and we say foo in here. Okay. Just like having the name, uh, property in here, you can create another property for instance called age, and we could say this an integer. Now you see playground will give you another error in here saying that you're missing the age argument and we can ask it to fix it. And it says age. Okay. Then we say 20 in here. Okay. Now you can see we've created an instance of person uh, with two properties, name and age. All right. Now you can access these properties uh, using something called a dot notation. So if you go in here and say foo dot name and foo dot age, just like that, uh, Swift Playground is going to be able to print and consume the results of these and print them to the console, as you can see in here. However, if you're writing pure Swift code, this will make no sense. You're basically saying foo's name, but you're not doing anything with it. But since Swift Playground implicitly consumes the result of all variables and all return data, it is being printed in here. But in Swift, it is more likely that you would say let name and, and age is foo's name and then plus foo.h inside like a string or something. Okay. So I'm not going to write all of that, but you, you get my point. So you have to consume it in another way if you're not using Swift playgrounds, but just know that you can drill down inside a structure using this notation, which is called a dot notation. You just put the name of the variable that points to structure and you say dot, and then you get the properties out. Okay. Now you can also have custom constructors for your uh, structures. Uh, as you can see in here, we didn't actually have a constructor and the constructor for structures is always created by the compiler itself. And this is one of the reasons a lot of people prefer to use structures in Swift rather than classes, simply because you don't have to create uh, constructors for them. Constructors are implicitly created by the compiler. So uh, if you add another property in here, there will be a new constructor. So which will replace the old one that had only name and age with the new arguments in it as well, or the new property in it as well. Okay. So that's one of the properties of Swift structures that they have implicit constructors you don't have to create yourself. Now, if you do want to create a custom initializer or a constructor for your structures, you can also do that. I'm going to show you how. So let's create a structure in here and we say Commodore computer. Okay. For those of you who are old schoolers and have worked with Commodore, this is one of my favorite computers. It was actually my first personal personal computer, a Commodore 64. Okay. And uh, so we create a Commodore computer and we say, let's name. Okay. And your name is the name is supposed to be something that you designate. It could be like my lovely Commodore or whatever. And then we have another property in here called manufacturer. I always have difficulty writing it and spelling it. And we say this is a string. Now, in this case, if someone wanted to go ahead and create a, an instance of Commodore computer, they would pr probably go, let's uh, say Commodore 64 is equal to Commodore computer. And they would say name. And then they would say uh, my Commodore, Commodore, and the manufacturer is always, always going to be a Commodore. Okay. So a Commodore 64 has a manufacturer of Commodore and also Commodore 128 is going to have, um, my Commodore 128. Okay. So both of these instances have the manufacturer as Commodore. Then you could ask yourself, okay, if you have a Commodore computer who always has its manufacturer equal to Commodore, why should the call site meaning this part pass this value over and over again. So you could create a constructor that always sets this value for you to Commodore. Let's go ahead and have a look at how you could do that. So let's go ahead and say we have an initializer you can see in here. Okay. So you just type in it, not funk in it, 
except you just type in it and it implicitly becomes a function then since it is a function then you have your argument list and then your function body then as you as you can expect in here you just want the call site to pass the name to you so you just say name string but you omits the manufacturer from the init initialization so you say self name is name all right and you need to prefix this name with self simply because if you say name is equal to name it just thinks you see it highlights the name it says name is name it's the same thing <laughs> you're not actually referring to the name inside the structure so you have to say self that name so swift understands you're referring to this name being assigned the value of this argument okay and then you say self dot manufacturer is commodore so you yourself take, take take it upon yourself to assign a value to this property okay then you can go ahead and say let's six c64 is commodore computer and you can see the only argument that the call site has to pass to you is the name so you say c64 then you can say c64 name and c64 dot manufacturer and the values will be exactly as you'd expect them so it'll be c64 and the manufacturer will be commodore as you've set it inside the initializer or the constructor of this structure okay now there are other ways of actually doing that so what you could have done in here instead of having a custom initializer in here or a constructor you could have commented this out and you said a manufacturer equal to commodore like this okay so this would have achieved the exact same result so you don't you don't have to have a custom initializer if you want to assign values to your properties that don't change pretty much okay so just keep that in mind please so there's another way of doing that okay now we've looked at that let's have a look at another type of properties that you can create inside your structure and those are called computed properties and i'm going to show you the syntax for them now for that let's go ahead and create a new structure so we say struct and we call it person two unfortunately we've already consumed person in here so we can't have another structure called person unless we go ahead and comment this out but we're not going to do that let's just create a person two but please if you're working with production level applications please don't do this please don't call your structures or classes two or three or four unless your business logic requires you to do that okay which in all my years of software development, I've never had the requirement of calling something two or three. So um, just keep that in mind, please. This is just for the purpose of demonstration in this uh, playground. Okay, so let's go ahead and create a um, person in person structure in here with a first name and last name. So I'm just going to say first name is a string, and then I'm going to copy this and go ahead and change uh, first to last. So we have first name and last name now let's say that your requirement in here to create a property for your person to structure called full name so this full name should always be equal to the first name and the last name with a space in between it so what you could do is to go ahead and create an initializer for your person to and you could say full name and you can see in here you can't just say full name is equal to first name uh, and last name because you will get actually an error in here uh, you, this this syntax is invalid so it, let's actually have a look at here cannot use instance member last name within property initializer because at the point of you assigning this value to full name first name and last name are not known so it, even though this might make sense just looking at it but swift compiler doesn't work that way so you could be tempted to go ahead and say okay i will create an initializer in here and i say first name is a string last name is a string but i don't want you to pass me the full name i can figure it out on my own so you say self first name is first name self last name is last name and self full name is a string consisting of uh, a, another string which is the first name which is passed in here as a parameter and then we will have a space and then last name so this actually is completely valid swift code there's nothing wrong with it i would say however there is a better way of doing that and that is used and that is called uh, computer properties so what you could do is to completely remove this initializer in here and then change this let's to a var and then make it a function so this is a computer property when there you have a variable in inside uh, and then you, for the variable value actually have a function in here okay and in here you could just say first name and space last name so now you actually did 
what we wanted to do from the beginning when we said equal to you see we, we tried to do this but that didn't work all you have to do really all you have to so this is what we tried to do at first but in order to get this to work you have to say first var define the data type remove the equal sign make it a function and then put the logic in here and that will be valid swift code okay so you can now go ahead and create an instance of this structure let's say uh, let foo bar is person two we say person uh, first name is foo and last name is bar like that then we say foo bar first name and foo bar last name and then we can have access to a property called full name just like you have access to first name and last name you can see first name is foo last name is bar and full name property or computer property is set to foo space bar okay and this is how computer properties work all right now uh, structures the way they're created uh, is that they don't in inherently allow mutation right so let's let's have a look at an example every i mean everything we've created so far has been immutable meaning that we haven't been able to change the structure internally we've just instantiated those structures and assigned some values to them and after assigning values to them we couldn't actually change those values so we can't go in here and say c64 name is blah so this is going to give you an error because this is not assignable all right you can see we got an error in here okay so how do we make sure that we can create structures that are mutable so you can actually change them after you create an instance of them so let me show you an example of creating a function that can mutate a structure okay so let's create a car in here car structure and then we say current speed is in an integer let's just say current speed then we can pass 10 or 20 meaning 10 kilometers an hour for instance now, what if you want to have a function in here, a func drive with a specific speed, okay? And then in here we could say driving, but what we want to do is to change the current speed of this car with the speed that is given inside the drive function. So if you say current speed, current speed is speed, you can see now you immediately get an error in here saying that you cannot do that. So it says cannot assign to property current speed because it is a let constant. So you might say, okay, let's fix that. Let's change it to var. Then this will not work either because you can see now you get another error saying cannot assign to property self is immutable. So the suggestion that uh, that uh, Xcode Playgrounds is giving you, it says mark the method as mutating. So let's fix that. And you can see the suggestion actually works. So this function is prefixed with the keyword of mutating, allowing the car instance to be changed. And the reason behind all of this mental gymnastics is that structures inherently are immutable, meaning that, and, and they're also date and uh, they're also value types meaning that once you create an instance of it it's sitting in the stack and it shouldn't be changed but if you create a mutating instance and then a mutating function you're basically bending the rules of how structures are actually working and it's completely valid swift syntax as well so it's nothing illegal but uh, i think actually in i mean all my years of working with swift it is not so often you want to do something like this um, but there are a lot of classes inside swift itself that uh, have mutating functions but usually when it comes to structures you don't want to mutate them but sometimes you have valid reason to do that okay so let's go ahead and create an immutable car you may be thinking okay but what does that mean but uh, this is a mutating function. I'm going to show you what I mean. Let's create a, an instance a, or a variable car called immutable car. And we're going to say it's an instance of car and this current speed is 10. Then you can go ahead and say immutable car. And then you could say drive and with the speed of 20. All right. You can see now you're going to get an error in here saying that, oops, you're calling a mutating member on an immutable va value or variable. And it says immutable car is a let constant. So what happened here is that since immutable car is let, you can't you can't actually call a function that changes the internal value of that let constant. And this is one of the very subtle differences between let and var 
in Swift. If you remember when we talked about variables at the absolute beginning of this course, I mentioned that there are some small differences between let and var, which we can't explain right now. And this is one of those differences. What Swift is doing in here is saying that, okay, you create a let constant in here, and you're saying that it is equal to an instance of a structure, but then you're going ahead and trying to change it by calling a mutating function on it. If this function wasn't mutating and we didn't have this code in here, you would be able to easily call it. You can see no problem. But if this function is marked as mutating, you're telling Swift that this function is internally going to change the data inside the structure. And since this is a let constant, it is not allowed to change either. Uh, so by changing, I mean, you're not either allowed to do this. So you, you can't do this and you can't change it internally either. So both of these are invalid. Okay, so that's what let stands for in this case. So how do we do that? Let's just comment this out and go ahead and create now a mutable instance of car. How do we do that? Well, of course, there's a syntax for it and the svar. It's a variable, it can change. So we say mutable car is a car with a current speed of 10. Then you can go ahead and say that uh, car, mutable car, like this and drive with the speed of 30. And then you say mutable car, current speed, then you can see the current speed is gonna change to 30 in here, okay? So um, what we're gonna do then is to have a look at a little bit of copying values and seeing how that also affects our mut mutability. So let's just remove this code for now. And if we go ahead and create a let copy of this, so we say, let's just say copy is a mutable car. So what, what we're doing in here is we're taking the value inside mutable car, which is an instance of car, and we're assigning it to a new let constant called copy. Since structures, just remember that structures in Swift are value types, meaning that if you assign an instance of any structure to another uh, variable, the internal data of that structure will be copied over to this variable, meaning that now you have duplicate cars. One is in the mutable car and another one is in copy and they have absolutely no connection to each other. Let's demonstrate that. And we say mutable car in here and we say drive it at the speed of 30. And then we say mutable car uh, current speed. And then we say copy current speed. Now you probably think, oh, they should both be 30, but you can see that the mutable car, which was actually mutated using the drive function, it has the current speed of 30. However, the copy has the current speed of 10 at the point it was uh, it was taken, or basically it, it took over a copy of mutable car. At this point, mutable car had the current speed of 10, as you can expect from the constructor or initializer. Okay, so remember, structures are value types. When you assign a value of a, a, a let constant, for instance, or a variable, uh, where uh, it is equal to an instance of a structure to another variable, then you're basically getting a copy of that structure. And you might be thinking, okay, is that, is that because of let? Okay, let's test that. Let's change this to var and see what happens in here. You can see it didn't really change anything by assigning, simply assigning an instance of a structure to another variable, whether it's var or let, you're making a copy of this and placing it in here, okay? So that's a very, very important thing to understand about structures. So um, structures in Swift cannot subclass other structures, okay? And subclassing is something that comes into play when we talk about classes but I'm naming it in here. We haven't talked about it yet, but I'm naming it in here because as I mentioned at the introduction to this course, I expect you to already know another program language and chances are you probably know JavaScript or Python or Dart for instance, or Rust. And you are probably comfortable with subclassing though Rust doesn't really have subclasses. It, it has the concept kind of like protocols, okay? Uh, but I just wanted to mention that Swift structures cannot have uh, the functionality of subclassing. And I'm going to, and I'm going to explain that, uh, how subclassing pretty much works, but we're going to go more into details about subclassing when we get to the definition of classes in Swift. And that is going to come up soon. Okay. For now, let's create a, oops, <laughs> a struct and we're going to call it living thing. And in the init function, we're just going to say, I'm a living thing. All right. 
Now, you may be thinking, okay, a living thing could be an animal, for instance. So we create a, a structure and we say animal, and you would expect it to be able to subclass living thing like this. You would say an animal is indeed a living thing, but you can't do this. This is not a valid uh, Swift syntax. You can see this is inheritance from non-protocol type living thing. So just keep it in mind, structures cannot inherit from each other in Swift, okay? So let's comment this code out and we just leave it there. Living thing is still a valid Swift syntax, so we could just leave it there, okay? Now, in Swift, you can also have custom copying uh, of structures. And as we saw, when you assign a value uh, inside a variable to uh, like here, we had mutable car and you assign it to a copy, let constant, the entire contents of this mutable car was copied over to this variable. But what if you want to have some sort of a custom logic while copying over something to a variable? Well, you have to create uh, that logic yourself. Let me show you how. Let's say struct bike, we say manufacturer, okay? And we say string, and we say let current speed is integer, all right? Now, if you say in here, uh, let bike one is a bike, and we have a manufacturer of Harley Davidson in here. And we say, let's say the current speed is 20. So not nothing illegal. <laughs> and then we're going to create a, a bike two in here. So we say let bike two. And then you say uh, bike one. Now, what you want to do in here, you say, well, I want to get bike one, but I want to change its, uh, so, sorry, but I want to change its speed when it is being assigned to this variable. You can't do that at the moment, right? Because even if you change this to var, and if you say bike two current speed is 30, you can't do that simply because current speed inside the bike is specified as let. You can't change it. You then go say, okay, I have to change it to var then. Well, you'd be right. You can't change it to var and everything will just work fine. But remember, you had to do all of this work simply because you had this requirement in here to assign a bike to another bike and change its current speed. There is another way of doing this, and it's actually more preferred, I would say, to do it this way that I'm going to show you, is to create a function that allows you to do that. So you could go ahead in here and, and say, well, I have a function, and I'm just going to call it copy. It doesn't have to be called copy. You can say copied with or whatever you want. Okay. Then you can say copy, and then you say current speed. So you want to change the current speed, so take it in as an argument. And then your function could actually return an instance of bike itself. Then you say, okay, I create a bike. Its manufacturer is the self's manufacturer because remember, this is an instance method, meaning that it is actually operating on an instance of bike itself. So it has access to self and the manufacturer. And its current speed is going to be the current speed that is coming from the argument itself in here. Okay. So now that you have that, you can go ahead at call site in here and say bike one copy with the current speed of, let's say, 30. And then if you change this back to let's, you can see it works as well. And bike two current speed is now uh, 30. And we could also say bike one current speed, and you can see that should be 20. So this is one way of creating copies or custom copies of your structures. And to be honest with you, there's not much more to structures. I mean, it, you have to just get the concept of mutability in structures and also having the ability to have arguments, uh, sorry, uh, having uh, the ability to have properties in here. We talked about var properties as well that can mutate. And we also talked about computed properties, which can return a, a value by assigning a function pretty much to a, that's uh, sorry, to that property of the structure. So there's not so much more into structures. And I think we've talked enough about them. In the next section, we're going to go ahead and talk about enumerations. So let's create the enumerations uh, playground now. So command N playground and blank playground. And let's call it enumerations. And in here, I'm going to say it is created inside the main uh, workspace. Let's change the group as well to the main workspace in here and press the create button. Okay going to get rid of the uh, Explorer and let's say import foundation. All right. Now let's talk then about enumerations. Uh, enumerations are one of my favorite features of Swift and any other uh, program language that supports it. And I think actually almost all uh, languages that I've worked with 
uh, except for assembly of course support enumerations or a form of enumerations i mean objective c does it c does it uh, c plus plus does it typescript does it javascript does it python does it dart rust all these languages i've worked with have the concept of enumerations and that's uh, that's very good i mean uh, they do have enumerations but to a certain degree they differ from each other so some have more advanced enumerations such, such as swift i would say swift enumerations are the most advanced i've seen uh, after that rust enumerations are the most advanced and then we have also javascript and typescript uh, which are at the same level kind of like dart enumerations but also dart is less advanced in supporting different features of enumerations what are enumerations i mean i've talked quite a bit now about enumerations but what are they well enumerations are categorization of similar values that are named such as animals cats dogs and rabbits you could put them inside an enumeration now if i for instance ask you and i said let's create a structure in here struct animal and i said define the type of animal in here you would probably say okay type is a string and i would say okay so can i create an animal and its type is a bike then you would say okay so what should we do should we go ahead and create an initializer in here that takes the type and it says if type is a rabbit or type is dog or type is cat then self type is type otherwise you create a preconditioned failure of oops it didn't work something like that so this is valid syntax and uh, it is going to work but it is not so obvious i mean a lot of cases yeah, probably people don't even see your source code so they have to kind of guess what type they have to pass in here and that is the reason we have enumerations enumerations is a categorization of similar data together by a name so let's have a look at how that actually works let's say an enum animals okay and we can remove the structure from here and this enumeration let's also have our playground as automatically running and this animals in here then you can define your different types of animals give them then names and you, the way to do that is by using a case uh, syntax in here or a case keyword then you say a cat i have a cat i have a dog and i have a rabbit now <clears throat> when i say i have i don't actually mean that these are properties i mean these are cases this animals enumeration has these various cases and you can also uh, omit case for every one of these cases and remove it and just do it like this as well this is also completely valid swift syntax so you don't have to prefix every case with the case uh, keyword but a lot of people do that and it allows you to also go to the next line i mean you can also do this but it looks a little bit strange to be honest with you if you do something like this i haven't seen uh, enumerations in swift in all my years like written like this it's either written like this or it is written like this usually okay but uh, it kind of depends on you and your team how you want to define your enumerations i think what would be really good is if you and your team decided on a convention of how you want your enumerations to be created either all of them have case before them or you just have one case for all the cases basically okay so you may be thinking then okay now that we have this how do we create an instance of this animals so we could say let cat is animals dot cat as you can see in here you have all these properties in here cat dog rabbit etc let's say cat and then we can print it out here to the playground console and you can see it just says cat you can change this to dog and you can see it says dog in here uh, though we have to change the variable name probably as well okay so that's the simplest way of creating an instance of enumeration now you can compare enumerations with if statements so if we go in here and we say if cat is equal to animals cat then this uh, is a cat and we can say else if cat is animals animals dot dog uh, this is a dog otherwise this is something else okay and of course you can continue here you can say else if cat is animals dot uh, rabbit however in here you can't say else if cat is equal to three and this just won't work because three is an integer and cat is an instance of animals so you cannot compare you can see it says there's no comparison operator 
between animals and integer and you would be thinking then oh maybe i should go and create one and <laughs> you could do that you could say func equality and so this is an in binary infix operator on the left hand side you have an animal animals and on the right hand side you have an integer and you return a boolean and you could say if uh, you could say you return left hand side cat uh, left hand side is equal to cat uh, and right hand side equal to three okay so then this returns a boolean and now you can see your error will go away so <laughs> you could do something crazy like that in swift but please don't do it i mean i'm just showing you different ways of doing things uh, but this i just want to tell you that this is not okay to compare an instance of a uh, an enum with an integer for instance okay However, there's another way of doing this using its raw value, but we haven't talked about that yet. So let's just remove this and remove this entire if statement from here like that. OK, so we just have an else. And you can see, as you expect, this statement is being executed simply because cat is, in fact, an instance of animals dot cat. All right. Or an instance of animals rather equal to cat. OK, now. If statements are a little bit strange in that you would have to write quite a lot of code if and then else if and then you have to compare them with animals etc etc there's another way of doing this and that is using a switch statement and I'm going to show you how to do that if you say switch on an instance of an enumeration then in here you can get help actually from Xcode to complete it for you you can see and you just press the fix button and it will tell you that okay I know that cat is an instance of animals and I know animals has cat and dog and rabbit. I will type it out all for you. So you can see that syntax is case and then the enum value. And then you can type some code in here and you can say break, meaning that as soon as it hits that point, you just break out of this switch statement like this. OK, so let's go ahead in here and say this is a cat and this is a dog and this is a rabbit. All right. So we've written our code and we expect this line to be executed. And if you go ahead in here and change the value of cat to a dog, then this case is going to be executed. You'll see soon. This is a dog, right? So let's change it back to cat again. So this is how you would do a switch statement. And then there's a syntax for switch statements where you don't have to specify all the cases. So if you don't want to specify the case of rabbit, you can also do that. Just remove it. But you're going to get an error now, as you'll see soon. It'll say that you haven't covered all the valid cases. It says it must be exhaustive, meaning that you have to cover all the cases. But if you don't want to cover all the cases, there is a special syntax called default in here and say this is something else, which is similar to our else statement. Right. So it, these two are pretty much the same. However, one is using a switch. The other one is using a um, an if and else statement. Now, I, I probably uh, should tell you that uh, this is usually not a good idea, specifying a default clause simply because in the future, I mean, uh, let's, let me actually demonstrate to you. Let's go ahead and in here say that you have a func and you want to say describe animal. And then you say animal is of type animals. OK, then you go in here and you say uh, describe animal. And let's change the switch to uh, from a cat to an animal in here, which is passed to us. Then we say describe animal and we pass our cat to it. OK, um, in the case of cat, we are saying this is a cat. In the case of dog, we're saying that this is a dog. And in here, actually, we, we don't have to pass cat to it. We can say animals dot rabbit okay if we do that you can see it says this is something else now what if we go ahead and add another case in here and we say case hedgehog i think it's spelled like this now you can see our function is still saying this is something else so for every case of our um, animals uh, where it is not handled it's neither cat or dog it's saying this is something else well this might work in this example, but usually in larger applications, when you add a, an enum case to your enumerations, you want everywhere where you have a switch statement to actually take care of that case. OK, so let me show you how if we remove this case from here. So we have cat, dog and rabbit again. We go in here and we bring the case of a rabbit. OK, and we say this uh, this is a rabbit and we break 
okay and we can actually take this out we don't have to have it inside a function anymore we take it out all right and in say in here we say switch cat so we have all the cases covered now cat dog and rabbit now if another programmer inside our team goes ahead and adds a case of hedgehog you can see our if statement still works and you might be thinking well the if statement still works it must be good but the switch doesn't work so it's not good however in my opinion where, where you go ahead and add a new case to an enumeration, you need to also always ensure that everywhere you're handling an instance of that enumeration, you're taking care of the new case as well. The if statement doesn't do that. It doesn't fail because it's simply doing comparison. However, switch is doing more than that. It's ensuring that if you're switching on an enumeration, that the enumeration cases must be exhaustive, meaning that you have to cover all the cases. So in in my opinion, with my experience, it is always, almost always best to compare enumerations using switch, okay? Because it will tell you that, oh, you can't compile your code now because someone has gone and added a new case to the switch. You have to handle that. So let's handle hedgehog in here. And we say this is a hedgehog, okay? And we break. So now you can see it is handled and though this is still a cat, so this statement is being called, but at least we've handled the case of adding a hedgehog in here, okay? Now, now that we've taken care of that, let's talk about enumerations, a little bit more advanced enumeration concepts, and that is enumerations with associated values, okay? Enumerations in Swift have the ability to have associated values. Dart, for instance, for those of you who are Flutter developers, you probably think that Dart also has that, but unfortunately it doesn't. Um, in Dart enumerations, you create an enum and you kind of make it a class almost by adding properties to it. And then you create enum cases that hard code the values of those properties. And that's not really the same thing uh, as having enumerations with associated values like Swift and Rust have. Because as you'll see soon, enumerations in Swift can have associated values that are dynamically added at the time of creating the, an instance of that enumeration. Okay, let's for instance have a look at an enumeration called shortcuts or shortcut. Let's say in here you want to create three shortcuts. Uh, one is called, uh, for instance, a case file or folder. Okay, another one is a www URL and then a shortcut to a song. So let's say that you're creating an enumeration that can allow the user to do a shortcut to any one of these cases either a song, for instance, on Spotify, or a website address, or a file or folder. Now, how do you go ahead and do that? How do you then say, okay, this, let's say, let www apple is shortcut to www url. But how do we specify that this is actually going to go to Apple? All right, then you, you would probably think that, okay, I'm going to add case www apple com or something like that. Well, if you had to do that, then you would have to create a case for every website in the world, and that won't work. And that is the reason we have uh, associated values for enumerations in Swift and Rust. So let's go ahead in here and you say, I want to add some values to these guys. Whoever is creating an instance of any of these cases has to pass some values to them. Then we say, for instance, here, the path is a URL you see in here, okay? So then at the call site, when you're creating an instance of this WW URL, you have to pass it a URL. Okay, so we say, let's go to the path and we create a URL. And in here we say it's a string of HTTPS, uh, apple.com, and we force on rapid. We haven't talked about this operator yet. Actually, I think we talked about it once. Is um, This is a unary suffix uh, operator, which we've actually seen an example of before. Okay, when we're talking about optionals. But you see, we haven't gone into depth uh, with optionals yet so just accept that this is a url for now okay but we don't have to know exactly what this one does i'm going to explain it soon when we go and talk about optionals all right so you can see now we actually passed a value to an instance of this uh, uh, enum case and you can do the same thing for others like file or folder we could say it has a path to a url and it has a name of string okay and we could say a song has an artist a, of type string and a song name of type string. All right, so this is up to you. I mean, it's really up to your imagination what values you want to have associated with your enum cases, okay? Now, you would be thinking, okay, now that we have this guy, how do we compare it? 
with like if if there is a case in your application where you get an a copy of an enumeration or an instance of this enumeration if you want to see whether this is a song or a url or a file or folder how do you do it so you would probably say oh, if if ww apple is equal to shortcut dot dot uh, url and then let's say you pass this url to it boom then do this okay so you may be thinking okay i could do that but no you can't really do that you can't do comparison between uh, an enum instance with associated value and another enum instance with the same associated value because as soon as you add associated values to enumerations in swift you basically you need to define equality for this enumeration yourself there is no equality by default anymore in this case when we had animals and there was no associated values we could do this because swift adds implicit equality operator which is a binary infix operator to enumerations with no associated values by default. But as soon as your enumerations have associated values, Swift doesn't know how to compare them anymore because it's not the comparison of their cases anymore, but you actually have to define a comparison yourself. Maybe you want to only compare the names in the case of file or folder. Maybe you don't care about the path. Maybe in the case of a song, you don't care about the artist. You just want to to basically compare the song names so swift can't deduce that equality operator for you so you can't do that unless you go ahead you, you go ahead and and basically define equality operator which is a little bit more advanced than what we're going to go into right now so as you'd guess you can rely on your friend switch statement so we say switch dot 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 apple in here and we can actually ask swift to complete this for us you'll see now there'll be a little hint in here and says fix and you can see it will come up with all the cases for us okay now i usually don't like the default uh, format that is created in here uh, but we can use it for now i'm just going to break them down into smaller parts in here into smaller bits of pieces of code now in here we could say print the path print the name and then break okay in here as well we're going to say print the path and then break and then in here we're going to say take the artist to its own line song name to its own line and then print the artist uh, and then print the song name and then break break like that all right so now we can see uh, that we're going to hit this point and it says the your the path of this url is actually apple.com all right and actually i think in here yeah it was called path as well but here it doesn't have to be called the same just so you know this path it doesn't have to be so you could say let p okay the important part is this one now there is another way uh you can also remove the argument names so you can see in here it says there's an argument name path and then it's a let path let's copy this and make it cleaner let's copy this entire thing so this is what swift suggests that you do but usually in codes in code bases or at least the ones i've worked with no one does this okay no one says here's the artist and then let the artist no one does that what usually people do is go ahead and change and remove this external argument name in here and just leave the let's in here okay so remove the path and remove the previous thing in here as well and this and you will see that this works exactly the same as the other one all right so uh, that's another way of writing it and what is also very very common in swift uh, uh code bases is that people don't like this syntax of writing let's before every argument name either so you could copy this code now let's clean it up even more gonna paste it here and remove all these let's okay uh, so that let this let as well and also these let's from here and what we're gonna do is to go ahead right after the case type let right after the case type let right after the case type let so this let is going to be applied to all of these arguments in here and you can see it works exactly the same way as it did in the other two examples every example is going to become shorter and more compact than the one before it basically okay really good now there's another very compact way of unpacking values inside en enumerations that have associated uh, values now there was two values in my sentence but i think you get the point and that is using an if statement in very rare cases if you want to only handle a specific enum case uh, for instance in this case you want to see if 
this dot 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 apple is an actual URL, you could use a, a if case let statement. You could say if case let. And to be honest with you, in all my years of doing Swift, I still get this wrong almost every time. I sometimes type if let case and sometimes if case something something and then let. But the actual syntax is if case let. All right. And then you say the case is dot 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 uh, URL, which is your actual enum case. And then you say path is equal to your variable. Then you can print out the path. So you can see it's printed in here. So you can in here then say it could be anything else. It could be file or folder. And then you could say path and then name. All right. Equal to your enum case like this. And you can see it is not executed simply because dot 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 apple is not an instance of file or folder enum case in here. Let's change it back then to dot 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 URL. And then we can get, grab the path out of this variable. Uh, instance or uh, uh, shortcut instance in here. Okay. Now, while you're working with uh, enums, you can also ignore values uh, inside the enum cases. Let me show you how. Let's say we create a, a an instance of shortcut. We say without you is an instance of shortcut to a song by one of my favorite artists, Symphony X, and the song name is called Without You. So one of the really good songs of Symphony X. I highly recommend that you watch it. Uh, sorry, uh, listen to it if you want to. I don't actually think there is a music video to it, unfortunately. Uh, but there may be one of these lyrics uh, music videos to it on YouTube. So now we have Without You, and we want to compare if it's a song by, um, for instance, only looking at its uh, song name. So we say if uh, case let, and it, is it a song? And we don't want, actually, we don't care about its artist. So we can ignore the artist using an underscore in here, but we only care about the song name. And we say, if that is equal to without you in here, then we can grab the song name. Okay. So you can see it's, it says without you, without actually using the artist in here. You could also say artist and then type the artist in here as well and grab that artist. You can say it's a symphony X, but if you want to ignore the artist, you can just pass underscore in here. Okay. Really good. Uh, now you can also have a uh, case uh, statements and switching case for enums with associated values that have similar data types. Okay. Let me, let me actually show you an example of it. Let's go ahead and create an enum of a vehicle. All right. And we say one is a car and every car has a manufacturer of type string and a model of type string. And then we have bikes as well uh, with manufacturer as well, uh, like this. But for bikes, we don't want a model. We want a year made integer. Okay. So this is an enumeration. Now you may be thinking, okay, let's say that you have this business case of uh, every time you access an instance of vehicle, you may want to grab its manufacturer. So how do you do that? Let's, let's go ahead and say, let car is vehicle. And how do we do that? Let's say vehicle dot car for its manufacturer. We say it's a Tesla and for model, we say it's model X. Then we say, let bike is a vehicle bike. Okay. And it's manufacturer is Harley Davidson and it's year made, let's say 1987 or something like that. Okay just making things up in here. Okay. Now, how do you grab the manufacturer out of these two? Like you have a car and you have a bike and you want to grab their manufacturers. You know, both of them have a manufacturer, but how do you grab that? Well, you could go ahead and say, okay, I switched a car. I let Swift uh, extract this information for me for all the cases, then add this in here. Then you say, okay, I have the manufacturer. We learned that we can have a let statement in here and remove all of this in here. So we have the manufacturer. We don't care about the model. So underscore in here, then you say manufacturer, manufacturer, and then you break and you do the same thing for bike. Okay. You say case let manufacturer is right there and the year made we ignore. And then in here you say manufacturer and break. Okay. So this is a switch on the car. All right. And you can see we grab the Tesla manufacturer out of that car. But what do we do with the bike? Oh yeah, we have to go ahead and do the same thing for bike. We go ahead in here and we say switch on the bike. And we say, in this case, since it's a bike, you see Harley Davidson is extracted. Then you may be smart and say, okay, 
<laughs> sorry, and not you may be smart, you are smart, but you might try to be smart to say, okay, then I can create a function out of this. Then I will say func um, get manufacturer uh, from vehicle, okay? Uh, vehicle, uh, of type vehicle, and it returns a string. And in here, you could just say return manufacturer and return manufacturer you could do that as well okay so this is actually one step closer to making this a little bit more usable and then you could call get manufacturer uh, from car and then get manufacturer from bike as well okay so you could do that as well so you get tesla and then oops what happened to our bike the manufacturer should be harley davidson so car manufacturer, bike manufacturer. Oh, because we're switching on car. This is very, very bad. We should switch on the vehicle in here, okay? Which is a local variable to the function. Then we get our Tesla and we should now soon get Harley Davidson. So this is, this is another step towards having a more reusable extraction of manufacturer from our vehicles. What you could do is to move this actually out and place it inside the enum itself. And instead of switching on a vehicle, that is passed as a function, we can remove this and say we switch on self, all right? And then we go in here and then we can say car get manufacturer, okay? And then we could say bike get manufacturer, right? So that's one, one more step actually towards having it a little bit more compact and having it make more sense. So it's a car get manufacturer and bike get manufacturer. Now both of them have the same function. However, what you could do is to have this as a computed property. Enums, just like structures, can have computer properties. So let's say var, and we change it to manufacturer, and we say it returns a string. And now all of a sudden, you don't have to call this as a function. You can actually say manufacturer, just like a property, right? Like this. Good. Now it's one step closer to having it very clean. There's one more thing that we can do to have it even better. And that you can see that these both cases, case led car, case led bike, they're pretty much doing the same comparison. They're extracting a manufacturer and ignoring the second value. Well, what if we could just remove this and remove this case and have a comma here instead? So we say in both cases, the case of car and bike, we're returning the manufacturer. And you can see that this is valid Swift code and it is doing the exact same thing, right? So if you have pattern matching in your enumerations like this, where two enum cases or more are having the same ma pattern matching by grabbing one value. And it doesn't necessarily have to be this, to be honest with you. It, it could, it could, for instance, be in the case of bike, um, sorry, in here model, and you can ignore this one and instead use the model in here. So actually you then have to call them the same thing. Let's say foo, foo, and then you return foo. Okay, so pattern matching works basically just by matching the value types. Since both of these are strings and the other stuff is being ignored, then you can use this foo. But we actually broke the code because instead of the car manufacturer, we're returning the car model in here. But I just wanted to demonstrate to you, it doesn't necessarily have to be at the same place. So it doesn't necessarily have to be like the same first value of both cases. Okay, so this is a computer property on an enumeration and it is returning uh, it's doing uh, pattern matching on the both cases and it doesn't have separate case statements in here okay really good that part's also done now apart from enumerations with associated values you can also have enumeration with raw values and here's an example of that so let's go ahead and say enum family uh, member and then in here you can actually say that uh, we have a case of father case mother, case brother, and we have a case sister. But what if you want these cases to for, for father, for instance, to be called dad, so to have the value of dad. So you want to, for instance, have mother be equal to mom, then you can say, okay, father is dad, mother is mom, brother is bro, and sister is sis. Okay, but we're gonna get an error now simply because it says that this enumeration can't have values like raw values like this. What you need to do is to tell Swift that this enumeration has raw values of a specific data type like this. So you could say it is a string basically. All right, and now Swift is very happy. So what you could do then is to say family member dot father 
and then you have a new property in here called raw value, then you can grab that dad value out of father case and it is a string. You could do the same thing with brother or mother and sister as well. Okay, so brother is going to say bro in here. Okay, um, now you can also have uh, enumerations in uh, Swift that have that, that you can extract all their cases because if you go into family member at the moment, you can see that you have brother blah blah in it raw value, but you don't have you you don't have the possibility of extracting all the cases inside this enumeration. But you can do that in Swift by conforming to a protocol called case iterable. We haven't talked about protocols yet. We're going to do that soon. But for now, just it's enough if you understand the syntax. So let's say enum favorite emoji. And we say it is a string. And also we're conforming to a protocol called case iterable. OK, just learn it for now that if you do this, Swift allows you to go through all the enum cases using a property, as you'll soon see. So let's say case blush is equal to blush in here. OK. And we say case rocket is rocket in here. We then say case fire is fire like this. All right. Then you can go ahead and say favorite emoji and like that. And we say we have a new property in here all of a sudden called all cases. All right. You can see it says blush, rocket and fire. So it gives you all those cases. OK. And also you can grab their values. You can say favorite emoji dot all cases. Now we're going to use a function called map and we're going to get their raw value. And please don't worry if this doesn't make sense. I'm just demonstrating what you can do. But we're going to talk about these things when we talk about collections later. All cases is now an array of your favorite emojis. OK, so if you make a, an enumeration conform to this case I trouble protocol, I think it is actually a protocol. Yes. Uh, then you can you can grab all the cases out of your uh, out of your enumeration using all cases property. OK. Now. Now you have enumerations, you can also, uh, I mean, you can create instances of them using like uh, favorite emoji dot blush, favorite emoji dot rocket. But if you have an, uh, if you have the value of an enumeration, how can you create an instance of it? So using, so right now we have been able to say favorite emoji dot blush dot raw value. So we get the value, but if you have the value, can you reverse it into blush? So if you have an emoji like this, can you actually grab an instance of favorite emoji using the emoji itself? And yes, of course you can do that. And the syntax for it is if let blush is favorite emoji. And you can say using a raw value of your emoji in here, then you say found the blush emoji, and then you can print it out to the console. Otherwise, this emoji doesn't exist like this else if I can spell it right now. You can see it says uh, found the blush emoji and then it actually prints it out, which is blush It's not the emoji itself. You see, it is actually the blush case of the emoji, uh, the favorite emojis enumeration favorite emoji you can see in here. OK, but don't worry too much about this uh, because we're going to talk more about these in later chapters when we talk about optionals. At the moment, we haven't talked about optionals, so this might look a little bit strange to be thinking, what is if let? Well, it is strange because we haven't talked about them yet, but uh, this is just an example. All right, let's copy this as well and do another example. Then we say, let's see, uh, create instead of blush in here, we're going to say snow and we say uh, snow exists. Really? So let's pass snow in here and see what happens because we haven't defined snow as one of the cases in here. You see, we don't have a snow emoji. So and then we say um, try to create an instance of favorite emoji with this snow. And if it is created, then type this snow exists. Really? OK. And then we can in here say as expected, snow doesn't exist in our enum. So we expect actually to get in here because snow doesn't exist as one of the cases of our enumeration. OK. Now we've looked at these and don't worry about these two particular examples because they're using optionals and we'll talk about optionals more in the future. OK. Now let's talk about mutating members of uh, enumerations. Now, uh, just like 
and structures, you can have mutating functions inside enumerations. And the way to do that is uh, by prefixing the function with uh, mutating as you did with structures. So let's say enum height. And then we say we have cases of short, medium, and long. And then we have a mutating func in here, tating func, make long. All right. And by mutating an enumeration, you're pretty much just assigning a new value to self because there's not much more you can mutate with an enumeration than actually mutating it itself. So in here, then you can say self is equal to height dot long. All right. So you can basically assign back to your own self and change uh, your self instance using a mutating func on an enumeration. Okay, so let's go ahead and say we have a variable my height is equal to height medium. And then we say my height make long. And then we say my height, let's see what it is. So once it is executed first is medium, and then we made the height equal to long in here, as you can see, okay. And if this was a let uh, constant, then you wouldn't be able to do this. You will see now that uh, make long can't be executed simply because it is trying to mutate self. All right. Good. Now we're done with that. Now, there is another concept in uh, Swift enumerations, which is a little bit more advanced, but I wanted to just name it and they're called uh, recursive enumerations or indirect enumerations. And in all my years of working in Swift, I think I've used them once once or twice. It is very uncommon that you see indirect enumerations. And that's why I've left them as the last concept to explain it here. But I think it's still a good idea uh, to explain them. So let me show you what indirect or recursive enumerations are. In short, a recursive enumeration, as its name indicates, is an enumeration that refers to itself. So in here, you can see we had enumerations that just have short, medium, long, and even have, we had enumerations in here with associated values that were not referring to themselves. You can see in here, they just had associated values of URL, but no associated values of type shortcut again, okay? But let's go ahead and create a new enumeration in here, which has ref reference to itself. We say enum int operation, and then we say we have a, an addition, let's say, so we're, ex we're basically defining an addition uh, between two integers. Okay, so it's just a case, it's not a function. We say case subtract, and then we subtract subtractions between two integers as well. And then we, we can have a freehand. This is a special uh, case that we're creating, which refers to int operation itself. All right, so what's happening in here now, you see we'll get an error saying that you cannot have a you cannot refer to yourself unless you mark this uh, enumeration as an indirect enum as you can see in here okay so you can now see that issue has disappeared but what does this actually really mean and what it means is that now you can have a freehand operation uh, on this int operation and I, I completely understand this is a little bit complicated and uh, we don't have to learn this but let's just let's just see how we can create a function now on this enumeration that calculates the results based on the cases. Let's say we have func calculate results. And we say that uh, the uh, parameter is off operation. And we say int operation in here, okay, as optional. And we say that's equal to nil. And again, I completely understand we haven't talked about these yet either. And in here, we could uh, then basically calculate the op operations uh, by doing a switch statement. I'm just, I'm just going to paste that in here so we don't have to type all of this, to be honest with you. Okay. So let's see what happened in here. We have the operation or self. Yeah, unexpected non-void return value. And in here, we should return an integer as well. Okay. So what's happening is that we're, we're basically switching on this operation. Since it's optional, we're saying either the operation or self itself. And we're saying if it's an addition, then do addition. If it's a subtraction, do subtraction. If it's freehand, let's actually change this to freehand with a capital H if I can spell. If it's freehand, then call this function recursively with that operation. And the result to this really is that you can go ahead now and say let freehand is uh, int operation dot freehand. Okay. And in here, then you can say do an addition of two and four. And then you can say freehand. Uh, and you can say freehand dot calculate result. 
and then you can see the result being printed in here of six again please don't worry this is very complicated this is almost going to like advanced swift and as i said in all my years of working with um swift i've had to use i think once or twice uh indirect enumerations and if you didn't learn this it's completely fine it was kind of expected to answer you and that's one of the reasons i'm kind of jumping over it and pasting code because i don't think there's so much value in spending time learning about indirect or recursive uh, enumerations so just know that they exist but you don't have to learn it okay so let's close off the enumerations chapter with this indirect enumeration and it's probably a better idea actually if you just remove this whole thing from here so you don't have to be taunted by the thought of having indirect enumerations in swift <laughs> so uh, at least for me it doesn't feel so good to end the chapter with something that we just jumped over but i just wanted to explain that this exists so you know about it okay good now we're done with enumerations in the next section of this video we're going to talk about classes now that we've talked enough about enumerations let's go ahead and talk about the next concept which we've actually named before and you probably know them from other programming languages that you're already familiar with and that concept is classes so let's create a separate uh, blank uh, playground for this so let's say playground in here and we say blank playground and let's call it classes and just again ensure that you're creating it inside your uh, main folder or workspace and then we say in here create and like we usually do we just say we need to import foundation in this uh, playground and again hold uh, the trackpad in here and say automatically run okay so we have structures in swift and we also have enumerations but there's a third category of uh, storage space you could say in memory and that is called a class and um, and classes are like structures but they're not value types they're reference types and also they allow for mutability without having to prefix things for instance with mutating a syntax or a keyword so let's have a look at a simple class in here so i'm just going to say class person and let's say var name string and then var age int okay and so this is a simple class now it has two variables and uh, let's see oh we're getting an error in here and simply because we have no initializers and this is actually really good we're getting this error um, because um, i actually didn't think of explaining this first but now that it has appeared let's talk about it uh, as you saw before if you have a structure like let's say in here we say class person uh, sorry struct person and let's actually put exactly the same code inside the structure and comment the class out and you can see everything will just go fine with the structure you don't need a, an initializer or a constructor for a structure by default a, an implicit one will be created for you with all the member variables added to the argument list of the uh, constructor so if you say person you can see name and age are already there however when it comes to classes you always have to create constructors yourself there is a refactoring feature in xcode where you can ask xcode to create the constructor for you i'm not sure if it is available inside um playgrounds and we can see that it isn't uh maybe there is a menu somewhere uh, let's let's say constructor or initializer generate member wise initializer and that's the one but it doesn't seem to really work in playgrounds so we need to just use this little hint in here and ask it to perhaps oops yes it is not really allowing us to actually add an initializer it's trying to add a default value to these properties and that's not what we want to do so a class's first difference to a structure is that it needs to have a constructor or an initializer and we already know the syntax for it and that is within it and then in in the parentheses you would add your arguments in here okay so let's say we have a name which is a string and then age which is an int and again the um not again actually we haven't talked about this before but the ordering of these uh, arguments it doesn't necessarily have to be the ordering of your properties so it can be anything in here and you can actually ask for more stuff let's just say height int I don't know what you want to do with that because you're we don't have a place at the moment to store it but you can ask for more things than your class actually has as properties 
because maybe uh, some of those values are going to be used in other ways inside the constructor of your class. Okay, so let's take this back to having name and age in here. All right. And then inside a constructor, your job is to first and foremost ensure that your class's uh, properties are all set before the constructor is finished. So you cannot return from a constructor or an initializer, as Swift calls it, uh, without having initialized all, all your stored properties. Okay. So it says name needs to be stored. Uh, need, name needs to basically have a value. And then we're going to go ahead and say self.name. Self.name is equal to name right and then we also have to say self age is equal to age all right so that's that's the simple initializer but we haven't really looked at mutability let's have a function in here and say increase age all right and then in here we say self age is uh, we're using this operator in here which basically takes the left hand side and adds the right hand side to it all right so uh, now we have a function in here. You can see it's increasing the age property by one, and it doesn't have to be prefixed with mutating. Actually, I think if you type mutating in here, it will give you a syntax error. It's not valid on instance methods and classes. So you shouldn't actually prefix anything in your, in your classes with mutating, all right? Then you can go ahead and create an instance of this class. Let's say let's foo is a person with the name of foo and the age of 20. All right, then I'm gonna break these into their own lines. Then we're gonna say foo age, have a look at the age, and then we say foo increase age, and then foo age, all right? So let's have a look at these values then. You can see first, the age of foo is 20, and then after, in, after incrementing it using the increase age, then we get the age equal to 20. So nowhere in here did you actually have to create anything mutating. And you can see that the variable itself is actually created with a let. So that's the second difference. When you create a let constant equal to an instance of a class, you cannot assign a new value to this let constants, constants because that is one of the natures of a let constant. After creation, it cannot be assigned a new value. So you cannot go ahead and say foo is equal to some other person in here. So that rule stays the same when it comes to uh, let constants and classes. However, since now you're working with a let constant equal to an instance of a class, this class internally can change. As you can see, the age has changed without you having to change this to a var. So that's the second difference between uh, classes and structures in that classes allow for internal mutability without you having to create a, an actual var out of them. All right. And also their reference types. And we'll talk about that soon, actually. OK. So let's and let's have a look at what reference types actually mean. So in here we say foo age. Let's bring this down. Foo age. Or maybe just type it again in here. And then we say bar is equal to foo. All right. And then we say bar increase age. Now you would probably expect bar to be copied and have actually a new copy of foo. However, since classes are reference types, the reference of this foo is placed inside this bar. So pretty much after line 30, bar and foo point to the same uh, in instance of person in memory. So bar gets a reference to this foo. And then by increasing the age of bar, then foo's age is also increased and bar's age is exactly the same. So they're basically pointing to the same memory and uh, memory space or memory at uh, the allocated memory for this person's person instance. OK, so keep that in mind. It's very, very important. Now, you can also compare instances of classes by using the equal, 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 so the triple equal syntax, which in all my years of working with Swift, I've never had to use. So it is very unlikely that you'll have to use it. Uh, however, if you want to see if two instances of a variable pointing to a class are pointed at the at the exact same memory space, then you would use this syntax. You would say if foo oops if i can spell is equal 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 bar okay and i think i've placed actually my fingers on the right on the wrong place on the keyboard so that's why i'm typing everything incorrectly so let's say foo and bar point to the same memory otherwise we say foo they don't point to the same memory 
And then you can expect that you get this printed to the console simply because yes, they are actually pointing to the same memory space. And if any, if for, for those of you who are curious, you'd be probably thinking, okay, what happens if I just change it to this? And we should ideally get an error, as you can see in here. And uh, that is simply because we haven't implemented equality on this class. So person doesn't conform to equality in here. And we'll talk more about equality perhaps a little bit later, but if you want to basically ensure your class instances are equitable, then you have to say equitable in here. And then you go ahead and define uh, a static func equal like this. But we will probably talk about this a little bit later. Just know that this uh, equal 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 is not the same as equal equal. This basically tests if two uh, variables hold values that internally are equal to each other based on some logic. However, this is some logic that Swift has implemented and you don't implement this, uh, this logic at all. What this one does is just make sure two variables are pointing to the same memory allocation. All right. And as I, as I mentioned before, you probably don't use this so often. Now, classes, unlike structures, can also have inheritance, meaning that you can create a super class with some logic, and then you can have some other subclasses that conform to that, actually not conform, but they subclass that super class. All right, let's have, an uh, have a look at an example in here. So we say class vehicle. All right, so we have a simple class and we say go vroom like this. And in here we say vroom vroom like this. All right, doesn't necessarily have to be anything scientific. Then we create a car class, which should subclass vehicle. Okay, so we say it subclasses that vehicle in here and car doesn't have any implementation of its own. Then you can create an instance of car like this. And then you can say car go vroom. So you can see car, though it doesn't have an internal implementation of go vroom, it, it has inherited that function from its superclass, namely vehicle in this case. So keep that in mind. You can have inheritance using classes, which is something that you cannot do in structures. Okay. Now, classes can also have private setters. So you can actually have a variable uh, that is marked as var but can only be set privately. So you can see in here, these variables are just simple vars, meaning that they can be both internally changed and also externally changed. You can see in here, let's say foo has the age of 20. I can go in here and say foo at age plus equal to 10. And with this syntax, I'm pretty much changing the age of foo. So if I then go to foo age, it should be 31 in here. So you can see it's a variable that can both be externally and internally changed. All right. So if you mark some a property as var inside a class, however, you can also mark a property as var. However, allow that to be only internally within the class changed. Okay. So let's say class person two. So then we say private set var age int. So by, by using private sets, we're saying that only can be set internally inside this class implementation and can be read from the outside. All right. And then we say uh, we initialize it with an age of int, then we say self age is age. All right. And then we have a function in here, we say increase, increase age, and we say self age is equal plus equal one. So we're basically saying pretty much the same logic as we have before, but you'll now see that you cannot change this age from outside this class implementation. So let's say Baz is equal to person two. And then we say 20 here, then we say Baz age, Baz dot age. If you then try to change this externally, you will get an error simply because this property is not setable from outside. You can see it can't be mutated. All right. Now, if you remove this private set from here, you can mutate that age from the outside as well. All right. You can see it's working as expected. But if you have this syntax private set, then it can't be modified from outside the class implementation itself. However, you can use still this function, which then modifies that variable internally. So you can say baz increase age and then baz age. You can see now age should have been changed to 21 at this point. All right, so that's the syntax for private sets in classes in Swift. Now, 
you can also, uh, I mean, now that we're talking about, about classes, very important that we talk about initializers as well, because initializers are very, very special, I would say, in Swift, in that you can have convenience initializers and you can also have designated initializers. Now, designated initializers, their goal really is to, uh, is to ensure that they construct an instance of the class by first of all ensuring that all property values are set and also that the internal structure or the internal validity of that class holds up however you can also have convenience initializers meaning that the only thing they do is that they probably add some logic to the constructor or the initializer of that class but they essentially at the end of the day delegate the initialization to a designated initializer so it's as if you have a, for instance a you have for instance your mother in the kitchen or your father in the kitchen there is a party and they're uh, making food and then you stand at the door of the kitchen as kind of like a delegate and people come and make their uh, make like they basically make their order they say could i please have this then you can talk to them you'd be like let's say someone comes to the door the kitchen says could i please get a cup of tea and then you can say oh do, does it have to be red tea or does it have to be a black tea then they say oh red tea then you go to your father and say could you please make a, a blah blah so i actually forgot whether it was black or red that that person decided <laughs> But whichever they say, then you go to your father and ask or, or your mother and ask them to make it. So you're kind of like a delegate. You're making the job of your father or mother a little bit easier. And that's exactly what a, a convenience initializer does. It gets rid of some hassle. And then at the end of the day, it delegates the work to a designated initializer. So just the designated initializer is the person in the kitchen and the convenience initializer is you at the door. Okay. But let's have a look at some examples of how this actually works in real life. So let's say class Tesla. All right. Then we say let manufacturer, uh, manufacturer is Tesla. Then we say let model is a string and let year is in. So the year production. All right. Then, um, we will initialize our test line here. We, we create a designated initializer. You can see in here is designated. It doesn't have convenience written before it. And we'll talk about convenience soon. But any initializer that doesn't have the word convenience before it is a designated initializer. And, and classes can have multiple designated and multiple um, convenience initializers. All right. So here is a designated initializer. And we say here model is x so let's say by default anyone initializing tesla without passing any values to us they get a model x tesla and then we say year is 2023 so that's one designated uh, designated initializer the next one we will say in it and in this designated initializer we actually take the model as a string and the year as an integer all right so we say self model is a model and self the year is a year all right like that. Now, another property of designated initializers is that they cannot uh, delegate their work to another designated initializer. So in here, you can say self init uh, model uh, x and year is 2023. So we should get an error in here saying that a designated initializer cannot uh, delegate its work to another one. Okay, you can see cannot delegate. So designated initializers should do all their work themselves. They cannot rely on another designated initializer. Okay. So that's for designated initializers. Now let's have a look at a convenience initializer. Now let's say that you want to create a convenience initializer that uh, by default assumes that the year is 2023. So the caller to that initializer doesn't have to pass the year. All right. So then you say convenience initializer or sorry in it and then the only property we want in here is the model all right and in here then you can say this function calls the self in it with the model that is given in here but the year is 2023 by default so you can see a convenience initializer is delegating its work to a designated initializer in here okay now you can go ahead then and create a subclass you can say class a tesla model y all right and it is subclassing tesla and in its in it then what you want to do you want to create an initializer for model y that by default calls the super initializer 
and sets the model to Y and sets the year to 2023. All right. Or perhaps it could just call this convenience init in here as well. Let's have a look. So you create an initializer and here you say, okay, I want an init. All right. However, you need to be careful because init is already implemented on the super class right here. So if you're also creating an init in your subclass, you have to pre prefix it with override. So you're saying I'm creating also another version of this. Okay. And you can see it, it says you need to at the end of this initializer somehow call super in it. So then we say, okay, then we call super in it. And for model, we say model Y and year is 2023. All right. Let's see what happens in here. Okay. So now this should actually work as expected. This shouldn't give you any errors. All right. Let's see what happens if we comment this out and just instead call one of our designated initializers. So sorry, our convenience initializer, which is this guy right here. We just pass the model. Since the year is already set to 2023 in this convenience initializer, we could just try to call it and see what happens. So I'm just going to say model is Y. All right. And right here, since this is a designated in, uh, initializer, inside a designated initializer, you cannot call a convenience initializer from your super, super class. So this is another rule that you have to uh, remember. So I think a good rule to remember is that designated initializers uh, in subclasses they can only call to designated initializers in their super class. Inside any class, a designated initializer cannot delegate to any other initializer. Okay. Convenience initializers can inside subclasses and inside their own classes call either and uh, no, basically not either, but they can call a designated initializer. Okay. It is a little bit special. I'm completely aware of that, but it's just some rules that Swift has set. And I think logically they make sense, but kind of they can make programming a little bit difficult sometimes when you're working with classes. So let's let's create an instance of this model Y. So we say Tesla model Y. And in here you can see we don't have to pass any values to the initializer simply because we already have an init uh, with no uh, input values, basically no arguments. OK, then we say model Y, uh, oops, model Y dot model and model Y dot year and then model Y dot manufacture, which comes from the super class, which is always set to Tesla. All right. Now. One thing that I mentioned at the beginning of the section was that classes are reference types. They're not value types, unlike structures. And that should really make you aware of passing instances of your classes to functions. So let's have a look in here. Let's create a foo bar and we say it's an instance of person two. All right. With the age of 20 in here. And then we say foo bar dot age. And then let's say that there is a function that uh, is looking harmless. It's called do something. All right. And with person, and uh, we just pass person to instance to it. What this guy does internally is that person dot increase age, it calls increase age function on that person. All right. Fubar is at the moment having the age of 20. And then if you say do something with Fubar, and then say Fubar that age, you can see the age will have been increased to 21. And simply is because uh, and the reason behind that behind this is that classes are reference types, meaning that by calling this function and passing an instance of your variable to this uh, function, you're not copying the values of foobar over as new instances, except you're actually passing your entire memory space, sorry, the memory uh, allocated for your person to instance into this function. So this function is completely free to do anything it wants with this uh, person instance. So just be a little bit careful with that. Just know that classes are a little bit more special than structures with structures, you get a little bit more safety, so to say. Now, another concept and that we're going to talk about before we close off this section of the video is deinitializers. They're quite useful in some special ca cases, but some other cases you probably don't need them. So I would say probably 90% of the times you're working with classes, you don't need deinitializers unless you're working with some sort of notifications or Rx, for instance, in, uh, yeah, if you're working with reactive programming. Uh, so let's have a look at the initializers as, as their name indicates, they're kind of similar to initializers, but they do the opposite. The initializers are invoked 
uh, automatically by Swift whenever your class instance is going out of memory. So it's kind of getting cleaned from the memory. So no one else is holding on to it and it has to be removed from memory. So let's create a my class in here. Okay. Then in the init, uh, we will just say initialized and then we'll have a funk in here called do something which which is empty at the moment all right then we create a new uh, function in here called d in it and you can see that it is purple in here but it doesn't matter i mean the color doesn't really matter it just matters that this is a reserved word it's a keyword in swift meaning that you can't really use it anywhere else except if you do something like funky like that but just know that this is a reserved word it's uh, it's similar to init but it's just uh, called when your class is going out of scope and in here we can say de initialized all right now to test this we should actually create a function in which we create an instance of this because if you create an instance of your class in here let's just say let my class is an instance of my class and then my class do something your de initializer won't probably be invoked you can see your initializer is invoked uh, do something i mean in here we could actually say do something just so that we see that that function is also invoked however the initializer isn't invoking and that's just the nature of uh, uh, of playgrounds so what you could do is to create a closure my closure and we say it is it is basically carrying out this uh, logic inside the closure and then we can call our closure so at the end of this closure, this variable should go out of scope meaning that it's the initializer should be called so let's say my closure in here all right and then you can see your de initializer oopsie daisy what happened my closure uh all right cannot find my did i spell it incorrectly like this and now you can see that the de initializer is in fact called uh, called and invoked simply because after my closure is called this scope completely finishes meaning that all variables inside this scope should also go out of scope so d in it will be called on all class instances all right really good we seem to now be done actually with classes so um let's just jump right ahead into the next concept and that is protocols so i'm going to go in here and actually not there we don't have to go there i'm just going to press command and in here create a new playground and we're going to say protocols again ensure that it is inside your workspace and in, not inside another playground create all right and we get rid of this explorer in here and we say foundation like this foundation all right now protocols for those of you who are rust developers you probably already know what protocols are and protocols are special kind of objects kind of like interfaces you could say in java for instance um, i'm not sure the term in kotlin what that is but you also have protocols as mixins in dart for instance so what protocols are is that you create an interface you create a set of rules that objects which conform to a protocol have to follow so it is not a class and because if you have a class for instance if you have a super class that has some functions all subclasses do not have to re-implement that function however if you have a protocol that only creates some functions with no body so the functions don't have logic in them any object that conforms to those protocols have to implement those functions by themselves all right so it is actually a little bit difficult to explain what protocols are without having a look at how they work so let's go in here and say that this is automatically running and create our first protocol so we create a protocol called can breathe okay and in here we say any object that can breathe should have a function called breathe so you can see this function is a special function it has no body you cannot create for instance a class person and just have this in it this just won't work you have to have a function body and you can't do that either in structures your function has to have a body so you can see that won't work in structures either that's why protocols are a little bit special in that they can have just function declarations without any implementation all right and that's what is called interface in so many in so many other languages all right so we have a protocol now can breathe let's go ahead and create a structure called animal and we saw when we were, when we were talking about structures that structures cannot have super classes so they cannot actually inherit from each other okay so if you create for instance a, a structure of animal and then you say struct uh, cat you cannot say that cat is an animal 
it just won't work. Structures don't allow inheritance. However, they do allow inheritance from protocols. So you can say a structure of animal that inherits from can breathe. And this is completely fine Swift syntax. However, we're going to get an error because now you can see it says the animal a type doesn't conform to protocol can breathe. And the reason behind that is that a protocol here called can breathe specifies that anyone conforming to this protocol has to implement this particular function. And we haven't done that. So as soon as we go and type breathing here, you can see then this error will go away because now animal uh, structure conforms to can breathe uh, protocol. Okay. And in here, we can just say animal breathing like this. Okay. And also then you can create another structure, struct person can breathe like this. And in here we say breathe as well. And then we say person breathing like that. All right. So then you can go ahead and create instances of these two structures. We say dog is an animal and we say dog breathe. And then we create a person called foo, an instance of person. We say foo breathe. All right. Now you can see both of these lines will then be invoked. Uh, simply because we call them from here. So that's basically the essence of how protocols work. I mean, protocols can be a lot more complicated than that, actually, uh, in that, I mean, we talked right now about having protocols that only have function declarations, but not implementations. But protocols in Swift are kind of like mixins in Dart in that they can actually have um, their own implementations. So they, they're not just like uh, objects that have dummy function headers, but they can indeed have function implementations. So let's have a look at that. Let's create a protocol called uh, protocol can jump. And then we say a jump function. All right. Then in order to create implementation for this function, I mean, you may be thinking, okay, maybe I should do this jumping. And this will just give you an error because you cannot create your function body inside the protocol itself. The trick to do that is to go ahead and create an extension on can jump. Okay. And we haven't talked about extensions yet, but it is necessary that we just name it in here simply because that's the way to actually add implementation to this function. All right. Then we go and say, okay, it's the same function. And then we just say jumping. So by this uh, trick, you, I mean, it's not really a trick. This is the way to do it. Uh, by using this uh, technique, <laughs> I'm trying to avoid saying trick. Uh, by using this technique, you're adding a default implementation to this otherwise very dumb function. So you may be asking, okay, but what happened here? Can I just call this function now? So can I just say can jump is an instance of can jump? Can I do that? Well, you can't because you cannot in instantiate a protocol. You need to instantiate an object that conforms to a protocol. Okay, such as a cat that can jump. So let's say struct cat can jump. And now since this jump function already has an implementation, you can see that we're not getting an error from Swift saying cats should implement this function. If you remove this implementation from here, all of a sudden, all objects that conform to can jump need to implement this jump function themselves. But if you bring it back into can jump, then all objects that conform to that protocol will get this implementation by default, but they can go ahead and change it if they want to like this. Okay. So that's also valid. However, if you leave it, it also works without problem. So let's create an instance of this cat. We say whiskers whiskers is an instance of cat and we can just say whiskers dot jump. All right. This is how we can invoke that function that is implemented on can jump. Right now protocols, apart from defining function headers that their uh, conforming objects have to implement, they can also define variables. Let's let's go ahead in here and say we have a protocol in here. We say protocol has name protocol has name. And then in here we say var name, a string, and then we have to say get in here or set or both like this. Now, what this really means is that this protocol is asking Swift saying any object that com conforms to me has to have a variable called name that has to at least have a getter. And what does this mean? Well, this is really just a dumb way of saying this. So it, it basically says a variable that at least I can read from, but this syntax isn't valid in protocols. I wish it was, but you have to implement them like this. So you're basically saying a, some sort of a variable that I can read from, which is called name. 
all right and then you can also have h all right and let's just say h should be getter and setter meaning that it should actually be a variable that can be set all right now we can go ahead in here and say we have a struct of dog and it has a name you can now see that we will get an error now from swift saying that this doesn't conform to has name and we can ask it to fix it for us and you can see by default it creates these variables for us however what i really don't like about this is that what it did is that it created a variable for a name though it could actually be a let since the protocol has name asks for this variable to be at least and at most actually read only so we can just uh, demote this to a let variable and you'll see that everything will work as expected okay so let's go ahead in here and then create an instance of this dog and we can call this instance woof let's say woof is an instance of dog and we say name is woof and age is a very graceful 10. Then we say woof that name, all right, and woof that age, woof dot age plus equal one. So we just increase the age, but we cannot change the name, all right? So let's just woof age in here as well. So let's see what happens. Okay, and this, I mean, we're getting these errors right here because we can't modify woof because it's an instance of a structure, which by default becomes a let constant that cannot even have a mutation internally. So we have to change this to a var. So remember, structures are different from classes, all right? So this is basically a uh, protocol that required all its uh, uh, classes or structures that conform to it to have a variable called name that can at least and at most be read from. So it can be a let and it can also be a var, but why does it have to be a var, a promotion of let if we don't have to have it as a var? Because the protocol says I should just be able to get from it. Now you may be thinking, okay, but why do we do these things? Well, the reason is if you want to go ahead and add functionality to this protocol, then this protocol internally has access to name and age. Let's say extension has name, and then we can then create a function that says describe me. Then we can see we can say you uh, your name is name and you are age years old okay so since this protocol expects a name variable and an age variable uh, it can then go ahead and uh, read them so it can access them and it should also be able to set them okay and then you can say func increase age and in here, then you can say self age plus equal one, and we can fix this actually now. So you can basically go ahead and add functionality to your um, protocols. Let's say fix it, and we add a mutating function in here. So you can see this protocol, since it knows what it requires, all its uh, classes and structures that conform to it have to have these values, then it can go ahead and take advantage of those variables or functions or whatever it has okay so now all of a sudden all objects that conform to have has name protocol will get a describe me function let's go ahead in here and say woof you can see it has a describe me function all of a sudden and it will say uh oops okay here your name is woof and you are 11 years old okay and maybe this should actually return a string and it could just return that string instead of printing it here and in here then we get the result you can see it says your name is woof and you're 11 years old and then since we have a var woof uh, pointing to a structure we can go ahead and say woof dot increase age and then we say woof age all right so the age by this point is 11 and then we in and we invoke this increase age function which is a mutating function and then we get the age of 12 all right so protocols can define kind of um constraints uh, or kind of like an interface on objects that conform to them and therefore can using extensions on those protocols can access those variables and functions which are place in here so it's kind of like giving a blueprint so it's kind of like any object that conforms to me have, has to have this blueprint and then I can internally use that blueprint to my advantage okay now just we've just like we've seen this in here protocols can have mutating functions something that I want to mention next but I think I just mentioned it a little bit too early perhaps but at least you get the point let's now focus on that mutating function so if you say protocol vehicle I just want to show you another example and uh, let's say we have a variable 
speed and we say it should be an integer which is getter and setter so we should be able to set it and read from it okay then we create a mutating funk in here increase speed and we say by which value like this okay so we define this mutating funk in here and then we go ahead and extend this vehicle like this and we implement this mutating funk all right so what we did here was a little bit um is not optimal because we implemented a mutating funk increase age inside the extension so whoever looks at our protocol won't immediately understand that there is a mutating funk available on it so if you wanted to make this code a little bit more readable we would place this function a declaration here as well okay so let's go in our code again and we say in the implementation of our protocol increase speed by value will actually have an implementation that says self that speed is plus equal to value like that and we can bring this value down here to make the code a little bit more readable as well and perhaps decrease the size of the preview as well so let's then go ahead and create for instance a, a concrete implementation of this vehicle protocol so we say struct bike and then bike will have a speed oh let's actually move this and say it is a vehicle all right then we get an error from uh swift saying that it doesn't conform to vehicle simply because it, it didn't have the speed variable then uh, inside this um, bike uh, we create an init and we say self dot speed is zero you could have also done it like this that also works it kind of depends on how you like to implement uh, do your implementations i've seen both and for me both are fine it's up to you and your team to actually make a decision on what uh what um, convention you want to use for initializing your variables and structures okay but this is completely valid syntax as well after doing that let's create an instance of this bike let's say bike is an instance of bike like this then we get the current speed it should be zero because that's what the initializer did then we say bike increase speed by 10 and then we say bike speed all right so because we are conforming to the vehicle protocol we can have uh, access to this increased speed uh, function in here now i can see we're getting an error simply because the bike cannot be mutated you can see we're actually invoking a mutating function on an immutable let constant and the solution to that is to change this to var all right now you can see our speed was zero and then it was increased to 10 simply because we increased it using this mutating function defined and implemented on the vehicle protocol all right so that's one thing i mean the, that's not one thing that's quite a lot of things about protocols but at least you get the idea of protocols now protocols can also be used as a conformance uh, how do you say it blueprints kind of so let me just explain how this would work you can at any point in swift use the is syntax or a keyword in order to check whether an object conforms to a protocol or not because any class or any structure can conform to at at least one and um, actually not at least at least zero and at most unlimited number of protocols so a structure or a class doesn't have to conform to any protocol or it can conform to one or more protocols that's what i'm trying to say and if you want to at any point check whether an object conforms to a protocol you can use the is syntax let's have a look at that let's say we create a function called describe and it takes an object of type any and we haven't talked about this before but any is pretty much as its name indicates any object okay then we say if object is a vehicle then we say uh, oh, object conforms to the vehicle protocol else object does not conform to the to the vehicle protocol all right then we can go ahead and call this describe function uh, and describe our object of bike and then you can see since bike conforms to the vehicle protocol then we get this printed to the screen however if we had a structure of warm or a work warm and it didn't conform to uh, the vehicle uh, um, the protocol and we set warm as an instance of warm and then we just say describe warm then you can see that we will get uh, this message printed to the screen object does not conform all right so now that we've done that let's just remove this warm i don't like to have warms in my uh, code 
<laughs> so at least you get the point now with with that as well. Now there's one more uh, one more thing that we have to talk about when it comes to protocols, uh, and that is, I mean, we've talked about is, but we haven't talked about as and as with a question mark, and it, they make more sense when we when we've already talked about optionals and we haven't talked about optionals yet. We'll talk about optionals in, in, in like the next three sections of this video, but I just want to name it as well so you know that it exists in Swift. So. Uh, using this as syntax, you can conditionally promote an object to a, a specific type. So in here, you can see object is vehicle. And if you say object dot, you don't have any uh, anything to do now with this. I mean, you cannot do anything with this object, even though you actually said if object is a vehicle, then I kind of would expect us to be able to invoke these functions on that vehicle because we actually asked Swift. Is it a vehicle? Then we come here. But Swift doesn't understand the syntax as good as it understands as like this. And the reason behind that is you're simply just doing an if statement in here saying, is it that? Then do something. But you didn't actually promote this object to that type. All right. So any is like a very low object type. However, this is sitting a lot higher in the hierarchy. And that's uh, the reason we say promote. So let, let me actually show you an example. Let's say that we have uh, that we have, let's say a bike in here and bike is a vehicle which has increased speed. All right. But we want to create a function that ex that uh, can allow any object to come in. And if that object is a vehicle kind of like this, then it will increase its speed by 20. All right. So let's say funk increase speed if vehicle and then the parameter to this is an object of type any. All right. Then in here, we say if, then we create a var and the vehicle is equal to this object. And then we say, is it a vehicle like this with an as syntax? If it is, then we say vehicle speed. You see, now we get access to all properties of that vehicle because we promoted this object to a vehicle. So it's not similar to is because this won't allow us to access the vehicle objects in here or properties or functions. Then we say get the current speed vehicle increase the speed by 10 and then get the speed again in here. OK, otherwise we say uh, this was not a vehicle. So uh, let's then go ahead in here and see what happens. So let's say increase speed if vehicle and then we pass our bike in here. All right, let's see what happens. Are we getting a lot of errors perhaps from Swift? It crashed? No. OK, so you can see we got the value of 10 in here. OK, and then uh, we get the value of 20 right here. OK, uh, now you may be thinking, okay, but what happened in here? Bike, let's have a look at bike. You can see its speed it was zero in here and then 10. And then we call this function, which should have increased the speed to 20. But if in here we say bike speed, what happens? Do you think it's 20? Well, no, it is 10 actually. And the reason behind that is that bike is an instance. If you go back to it, it's an instance of a structure called bike. So it's a structure. Structures are value types, meaning that when you call this function with an instance of your bike, you're not actually passing the memory consumed by this bike as a reference to this function. What you're, what you're in fact doing is that you're making a copy, actually not you directly, but Swift is doing it doing that. Swift is making an entire copy of this. Uh, it's making a copy of this entire object and passing it in here. So in here, this var actually is pointing to not the same memory address that bike is consuming, but it's pointing to a completely new variable in the memory and is allowing it to basically be increased by a certain speed, which is not affecting the spike. However, if this bike was an instance of a class, so if we went in here and said bike is actually a class, so let's say class. Now you can see ch calling this function, it will actually change the speed for you to 20. So calling this function, it affects the actual instance of bike itself. You see the speed is exactly the same. But if you go back to a struct, you can see the speed of your bike will be 10. All right. So keep that in mind when you're working with protocols, protocols and classes and structures together go really hand in hand to create 
amazing object-oriented uh, applications in Swift, but they can make things also a little bit complicated. So keep that in mind when you're working with these um, with these concepts. Good. That's quite enough about protocols. Now that we've talked enough about protocols, let's go ahead and talk about extensions. You've already seen examples of extensions and how they work in Swift, but we haven't really focused on them. So let's do that now. Let's go, oh, I don't have to do that. Let's create a new playground, playground. And in here we say a blank playground and we say extensions, all right, like that. And here as well, then we say create. And just like usual, we say we just need foundation for now. All right. So uh, extensions, as their name indicates, they can add functionality to existing types. They can extend existing types. So let's have a look at an example. Let's say that we have an extension on data type of integer. And then we say we have a function called plus two, which returns an integer. And since this function is an extension of int, self in here refers to the current integer instance. Okay, then we say we return self plus two. All right, then we can go ahead and say two is equal to value of two. And then we say two plus two. And then you can see then we get the value of four here in our playground. Okay, so self inside extensions refers to the current instance, meaning that this two in this case. All right, so self in here is actually two. So if you just print self and then you say return self, self plus two, you can see self is indeed the value of two in here, which is what you've specified in here. So if you change that, self will change to that as well. All right, so keep that in mind. That's one example of an extension. Now, using extensions, you can also add initializers to existing types, which is one of the most powerful features of extensions in Swift. Let's have a look at an example. Let's say that you create a structure called person in here, and you have a first name string, and then let's last name, last name as a string. Okay. Now, what you want to do is to create a, I mean, you want to behold, uh, sorry, you want to hold on to this person's uh, constructor or initializer that Swift already creates for you with a first name and last name. So you don't want to change that, but you also want a constructor that takes in a full name. However, if you go in here and say in it, full name, string, then you can see all of a sudden your person doesn't have any other constructor with a first name and last name anymore. Your only constructor inside the structure itself replace the existing constructor. Okay, and that's not good. So what you want, if you want to, for instance, have a constructor or initializer on this person that doesn't replace the existing in initializer that Swift creates for you, then you need to create an extension on person. And then you go ahead and add your initializer in here. Okay. Now you can see if you try to initialize an instance of person, you have both of these constructors, the default one that Swift created for you, and also your own constructor, which is inside the extension. All right. So let's inside this constructor, go ahead and grab the components out of this full name. So we say full name uh, components is a function and we separate the components by space. All right. And uh, so we say let components. And then we want to pass these values that we extract from components. So we say self in it into our constructor. Then we say the first name is actually components first, otherwise full name. And we say in here as last name is components last, otherwise full name, just like that. All right. So uh, this is very dumb implementation, to be honest with you. But I mean, it's not too dumb either. It is literally taking the first part of a name and the last part of a name, assuming that this is the first name and this is the last name. And anything that is between them separated by space is the middle name, which we don't care about in this instance. OK, then we can go and create an instance of person. So let person is a person. Then you can see we have both constructors uh, or initializers, and we're going to use full name in here. We say foo and bar. You can see they're separated by space, and the first component is foo and last name, and last component is bar. Then we say person, first name, and person dot last name. All right. So that's another powerful feature of uh, extensions in Swift, in that you can extend an existing structure, for instance, and add a new constructor or initializer to it. Okay. 
Now, apart from that, you can also extend existing types and add conformance to a protocol to an existing type. So that's also really cool. So let's create a protocol in here. We call it goes room. Okay, so that's our protocol name. And this protocol, what it does is that it has a var room value. And it's a string and it should we should be able to read from it. Okay. And then we create a function, we say go room. And then this function returns a string. Now we go ahead and extend our goes room. And then we add the default implementation for this go room function. And then we say self dot room value goes room. So remember, this is just a variable that we know any instance conforming to our protocol should have access to. And then here we're just adding the default implementation for this go room function and returning this string as its return value. All right. Then we go and create a car instance. We say struct car and this car conforms. Actually, we don't want to conform yet. Uh, and in here we say let manufacturer is a string and we say let uh, model is a string as well. I guess this is just a simple car structure. Then we can say um, let model X is an instance of car with the manufacturer of Tesla and its model is going to be X. And after creating this instance, we can go ahead and actually extend this model X. So we can say model X extension, sorry, extension of car. Then we say car now all of a sudden conforms to the goes vroom uh, protocol. You will get an error in here telling you that you're not actually conforming to go goes vroom. And the reason behind it is that if you go to goes vroom, you can see that we have two requirements. One is that we have any type conforming to goes vroom protocol has to uh, have a variable called vroom value that's at uh, at most and at least readable. Uh, however, car doesn't have that. And that's the error that we're getting in here. So let's just get Swift to fix it. And you can see it creates a computer property in here called vroom value, which should return a string. Okay. And for our vroom value, we're going to say it is self manufacturer model and self dot model. All right. And then all of a sudden, this car instance conforms to the goes vroom protocol, meaning that this model X all of a sudden gets a function called go room. And if you do that, you can see it says Tesla model X goes room. And that's because room value is a variable that is implemented on all types that conform to goes room. But goes room doesn't really know what this value actually is. It just extracts that value and adds it here and then says goes room. However, it is the conforming types responsibility to return this value. And in this case, the case of car structure, we're just saying manufacturer and then model X. So it says Tesla model X goes room. This part is provided by conforming types such as car. And this part is provided by the goes room protocol itself. Okay. So you can also have, uh, I mean, now, now that we've talked about that, let's go to the next concept. And that is having extensions on classes uh, with convenience initializers. So you can actually extend existing data types and add convenience initializers to classes. And not structures, because structures don't have convenience initializers, but classes can. So let's go ahead in here and create a class and we call it my double. So like a class that holds on to a double variable. And we say var value double. And then we can say an initializer that takes a value of double. And we say self value is value in here. Okay. Now you can go ahead then is actually this. I don't think this needs to be a var. It can just be a let perhaps. Okay. And in here, then we're going to go ahead and create a convenience initializer, uh, which always sets this value to zero if anyone initializes an instance of my double. Because at the moment, if we say let, uh, let's go ahead, foo is my double, you can see that you always have to have a value available and pass to my double uh, initializer. But if you don't want to have that, you can extend your my double class in here and say you have a convenience in it in here that takes no parameters and calls self in it with a value of zero. So this is literally delegating its task to a designated initializer in the my double class, but it is a convenience initializer that is created inside an extension. So you that's one of the powers of extensions. You can extend an existing class and add a new convenience initializer. Okay. So then you can go ahead and say my double create an instance of it. And then you can just say value. 
All right, you can see now the value is zero. This is another fancy way um, of basically accessing the value. You could have said, let my double is an instance of my double, and then you could have said my double dot value. So that th those two lines of code were pretty much, I mean, achieving the same thing. Okay. Now, apart from extending, I mean, uh, not apart from, but I mentioned that uh, extensions can extend structures and classes. But guess what? They can also extend existing protocols. So, uh, so you can see in here we have a protocol called goes vroom, and it has this go vroom function. You can go ahead and extend it. You can say extension goes vroom, and then in here you can add a new function, say go vroom vroom even more. Okay, so this is just a ridiculous name. I, I'm completely aware of it, but you can. Um, what I'm trying to say is that you can extend an existing protocol as well and add new functionality to it. And by doing this, every data type that conforms to that protocol will get your new function by default. So you don't have to do anything. Okay. Then in here, we just say self room value is rooming even more like that. Okay. Then all of a sudden model X that we created in here, which conforms to, uh, which is an instance of car, which conforms to goes room gets this new functionality by default. So then we can say model X go room room even more. And then you can see that value being printed to the screen as well is rooming even more. Okay. So extensions are, I would say one of the most fun aspects of any programming language. And in Dart, for instance, they're called mixins as well. And they're available in some other languages such as Rust as well. So they're really fun because they allow you to make existing things and types better. They can kind of get out of hand sometimes if you're like misusing them in that when you're extending generics types, for instance, you can just go crazy with generics. But as long as you're comfortable and you and your teammates are comfortable with those extensions, I would say go for it. Now, we've talked enough about extensions for now, at least. Let's go ahead and start talking about generics, which is a topic a lot of developers try to avoid, but I think you need to embrace it because if you look at most modern toolkits and frameworks such as Swift UI, they could have not been made possible without generics. Swift UI is pretty much based entirely on generic types. So I'd say one of the best practices of becoming a better developer is to embrace generics, learn how to use them, learn how not to use them, and truly don't be scared of them. So practice, practice, practice until you get the concepts and then use them wherever you think and your teammates think makes sense. So without further ado, let's start talking about generics. So I'm just going to press command in here and say a playground. And we say generics like this and ensure you're creating it inside your workspace. So Swift crash course, and we create this generics uh, playground import foundation, and we say automatically run this. All right, I'm going to get rid of the export to the left hand side. Now generics uh, is for me at least uh, is used to avoid uh, writing the same function multiple times or writing the same code multiple times. All right. Now, Generics, they kind of look a little bit strange, uh, but uh, they really, at the end of the day, once you've written the code for generics, you can use them in so many different ways and you will be amazed by how powerful they are. Okay. So what we're going to do as the first example of generics, I'm actually going to jump right in and write kind of like a scary looking function. All right. But what this function is trying to achieve is that I mean, its mission statement is kind of like this. It wants to expect any numer any numerical data, such as a floating value or a double value or an integer, two of those values. So it takes a left-hand side and a right-hand side, and it expects us to pass it a function that can perform an operation on those two values and return a new value in response, such as, let's say, x, uh, x is 10, and let y is 20. And then we say let's c is equal to x plus y. So this plus function takes a left hand side and a right hand side and returns a result, which is the equivalent of adding those two values, right? Now, you can have minus in here, you can have di division in here, you can have multiplication, in here. oops, if I can write it. So 
all these functions take a left hand side and a right hand side so they do some operations and they're actually operators we've talked about operators before okay so let's say then uh, we create a function we say a function that performs a task and we say uh, it's an operator that takes an integer and an integer and returns an integer kind of like this okay and then oops and then we say it performs this operation on a value on left hand side of type int and and right hand side of type int and then in itself returns int okay so you can see it's performing an operation that actually does the job i think we actually did something like this when we were talking about operators and we actually put this as a trailing closure i remember uh, but it's similar to that at least and internally what it does is calls that op function and passes the left hand side and right hand side to it and returns this value in return then you can go ahead and say perform plus on 10 and 20 and then you can see it will just say 30 as a result because this is actually a function all right and you can say plus and then you can say minus of course you can say multiplication in here and you could also say division in here okay so maybe we could say 20 and 10 in here for the division so that we get proper values printed to the console so this is an example of this function now your teammate comes to you and says could you make this function work with doubles as well then be like um okay then i'm gonna change this to double and this to double and then this to double <laughs> and then you have to go and change this to double and this to double and this to double then your code kind of works all right but the result of these is actually now a double so if you look at foo's data type is a double what happened to your integers well you changed the function signature from int to double and you lost the ability to work with integers then you'd be like okay then i need two functions one for integer and one for double then you call this perform int so we say uh, let's see if i can change this name perform int and then you say okay i'm smart enough i go ahead and create a perform double and i make sure that this double works with doubles okay so whoever wants to work with doubles calls perform double and whoever work, wants to work with integers works with uh, perform int then your third colleague comes and says okay but i want to work with cg float and which is another data type which is inside the core graphics framework which we haven't worked with right now but you can say core graphics and then you can say let x is cg uh, cg float is equal to one it's kind of like a double actually and then you say oh a cg float then i have to create another perform function which is called perform cg float however as you can see this is not a very maintainable way of working so this will just increase the size of your code base and you have to constantly go ahead and add new functions to your application wouldn't it be really good if we could create a function that works with any numerical type and if you look at integer let's go to int in here and then we see signed integer and then signed numeric you can see that this signed numeric protocol conforms to another protocol which is called numeric okay and if you have a double value let's say let's x is a double 1.1 if you go to double and and let's say numeric there should be an extension on double extension double which makes it conform to uh that's numerical type as well so let's see binary floating point i think and then expressible by flow oops not that one perhaps by integer literal hashable stridable it is one of these implementations um, which conforms double to uh, that numerical type that we were just talking about i'm not sure which one it is we have to dig deep inside swift source code basically but what i'm trying to say is that both double uh, and int conform to a protocol called uh, numeric numeric now if we could somehow in here say that this function works with any numerical data type that would be really good so let's change this to numeric and then we say numeric numeric and here here and here okay now you'll see what happens 
inside your Swift code. And Swift tells you, okay, I understand you, you want to work with numerics, but you can't just add them like that. You can't just say that this function expects numerics. Numeric is a protocol. And if you want to use it here, you have to use generics. So the way to use generics is that you go right after your function name and you just open these less than and equal signs kind of like in here. Then you designate a letter, usually a letter, but sometimes people use words as well, but it is very, very common to use a letter. So you say, okay, I want to represent numeric with a letter. Okay. I can't just say numeric in here because that is an existing data type. Let's just say N. Okay, as a numeric, then you say n should conform to numeric data type or protocol. Then anywhere inside your function signature where you're using numeric, just type n. Okay, so in here, in here, right there, there, and also here, and also for the return value of your function. All right, so now you see all of these errors are going to go away. So you can see all of them went away, and your function still works. And if I say let x and then i look at the data type for x you can see x is understood to be an integer but how you didn't say anywhere that you're working with integers and that's the power of generics the compiler is uh, is basically inferring the data type based on the values you pass here so if you say 10 and 20 then it knows that they both are integers and the result should be an integer and let's change this actually it's not perform int anymore it is perform okay now, if you go and do, uh, let's say, let x is perform on 10.1 and 20.2, all of a sudden, x is a double because compiler understood that, oh, these both values are actually double. They're not integers anymore. So it substitutes the return value, which is indicated by this n generic value, to the actual values you pass to this function in here. Okay. And you can also go ahead in here and say 10.1 and 20. What do you think x is going to be now? Well, the compiler is also intelligent enough to promote the value, the return value to the uh, more complex or more complete data type. The more complete and precise data type in this case is not integer, but it is actually double. So if you look at the data type for x is indeed double. All right. So that was the first example of using generics in um, Swift. And I know it could look a little bit complicated, but the more you work with generics, you, the more you will actually appreciate them. We've now seen this example, I would say actually a quite a simple example of generics in Swift. Now, when you have functions that have multiple generic parameters, in this case, we have just one generic par parameter that we've called N of type numeric. Uh, but in other functions, you might have generic parameters, maybe two, two or three of them, or even more. In that case, the function signature might be getting quite long. You would say R is something and D is something else. So looking at this function, you, you would probably just get a panic attack just looking at the function signature. And that is why Swift allows you to create function signatures for or generic function signatures where the generic parameters are stated at the end of the function declaration itself uh, and right after actually the return type. So to demonstrate how that works as well, let's just take this that we have in here, the code that we have in here, and let's go and paste it right there. Okay. And we will just name this function uh, perform two and change all these instances to perform two just to ensure that everything is working as expected. So in order to create a function or generic function where the generic parameters are defined at the end of the fu function signature, you have to remove this generic type right here or as many as generic types as you have. You remove them from the beginning or attached to the function name and you go right after the return value and then define them right there using a where clause. So in here, we then say where, for instance, n is numeric. So this is an alternative way of creating uh, generic signatures for your um, uh, or for your functions. And in here, you would, of course, uh, you would still have N in there, but you don't actually uh, tag N as being of type numeric. So this is just a an alternative way of doing it. And some developers prefer this way simply because in here you could just say A, B, C, D are your generic types. And at the end, you could actually say what those A, B, and C and D are 
uh, in fact of type of all right so just keep it in mind it's it's a, it's an alternative way of defining your generic functions and it will just perform exactly the same way it did in the previous example okay now any data types such as a class uh, actually i can't say any data type, but classes and structures in swift can conform to multiple protocols they don't necessarily have to conform only to one protocol okay and using this you can basically create generics that are um that are conformant to multiple multiple types so let's have a look at that right now and uh, let's create uh, let's create uh, let's say that we create two protocols in here we say protocol can jump okay and then in here we have a function that says jump so any type that conforms to can jump should have a jump function and then we create another another protocol in here that we say can run okay and can run has to have a run function then we go ahead and create a struct structure in here we call person and we say it can jump and it can run like that all right so this is conform uh, conforming a, a new structure to two different protocols we can get uh swift to fix these functions up for us in here you can see in run we say running and in jump we say jumping jumping okay i think the indentation was a little bit wrong all right now we have that now let's say that you want to create a function called jump and run okay so let's say flunk jump and run and you want to take in a value in here of some type you you want to say okay i want some value uh, to be of any type and in here i want to say value jump and value the run but since this value at the moment is of type any it cannot have the ability to invoke the function jump or the run function so you could say okay i want value to be of type can uh, jump if you do this then you can do the jump function but you can't do the run function all right so in here what you need to do is to go ahead and define a generic data type in here let's say t and we say this data type can run can jump and can run like this and then inside the function signature itself you say the value is of type t now you can see if, if you type value you have access to jump and run functions so this is a way of combining multiple protocols in order to create a generic function signature where you have access to not only one protocol data but also multiple as long as uh, basically you can make this as long as you want to all right so then we can go ahead in here and create an instance of person we say person is an instance of person and then we can say jump uh, and run with the value of person and we can actually change this values internal uh, sorry external parameter type to nothing so we can just say jump and run person in here okay now you can also have extensions on generic types and one generic type that is very useful is actually we haven't talked about them so much but they're arrays and arrays you define them like this you could say let names for instance is foo and bar now if you look at the data type for names you can see it is a, an array of string so it is denoted by these square brackets now you can actually look at if you just type um this is a string in here and uh, let's see if you can find the data type for array so if you say array of strings so this is this is a, an alternate way of writing the same syntax instead of this you can just do a syntactic sugar here and say array of string now if you go to array you can see it is a structure and it is a generic structure basically it's working with a gener generic argument called element now you can also create extensions on generic types so by simply saying extension of string you're basically extending an array of string and this is new format actually this is a new syntax in the latest swift versions previously you had to say extension array where element was equal to string so this is the old syntax but the new syntax you can just simply extend an array of string which is a lot more readable okay then what you can do in here since you already have you've told the swift compiler that you're extending an array of string if you create a function let's say we want to create a function on our on any array of string that finds the longest string okay so we say longest string and we return an optional string we haven't talked about optionals yet so just for now know that this means that we can either return actually have we talked about optionals 
uh, structures, enumerations, protocols, extensions, closures. No, we haven't yet. We will talk about optional soon, okay? But just know that this means it can either be a value or it, it can be the lack of a value equal to nil, all right? So, uh, and the reason behind it is that you can always have, and the reason, I mean, this is an optional string is that any array like uh, final names is an array of string in here. It can actually be empty. Okay, so if this array is empty, how can you find the late, the longest uh, string in this array? Well, you can't. There are no strings in here. Okay, finally, it should be a let, right? So the reason and this is optional is because of that. And then what you can do in here is to say let dot. Um, so you, sorry, you say self sorted. And this is, I mean, to be honest with you, you don't have to know exactly how this is working. And this is just an example. Okay, so we say sorted, and then we say left hand side string. And then we say right hand side string and we want to say left hand sides count the number of characters in the left hand side should be more than uh, the right hand side's characters and then we say take the first argument you can see the first argument is then deduced to be of type string uh, simply because we are extending a generic type whose elements are of type string and if you look at this property you can see it is using the same generic type called element all right, so that's also extending generic types. And then you can go ahead in here and say, let's say we create an array of strings. We say foo bar and baz in here has one string and then cox in here. Then we say longest string. All right, then we can get the value of bar and baz printed to the console or the playground console, whatever you want to call it, okay? Then we have another topic to actually discuss, and this is this goes to a little bit more, um, I would say, advanced. But I think generics are advanced topics to start with, so we shouldn't be scared of uh, having a look at some advanced topics in here. So let's go ahead and uh, talk a little bit about uh, associated types in protocols. Okay, so. Uh, and this is this makes generic protocols. We've already talked about protocols before, but we haven't talked about generic protocols. So let me just show you an example and demonstrate how generic protocols work. In the beginning, it might not make so, so much sense, but as we go on and complete this example, it will make hopefully more and more sense to you. Okay, let's create a protocol in here. We call it view. All right, so anything that can that can be displayed to the user and we call it just view. All right, we say any view should have a function on it that is called add sub view and it is basically using the same view so it says anything that's a view should be able to add another view to itself all right then we go ahead and extend this view we say it we had the add sub view as a default implementation in here and we say by default it is empty all right so the end the default implementation of add sub view doesn't do anything then we go ahead and create a structure in here we call it button and we say it conforms to the view protocol and at the at the moment we say it its implementation is currently empty. Okay. If we didn't have this default uh, implementation of the add sub view function, then button structure would have had to implement the um, add sub view function in here, as you can see, suggested by the playground. All right. So let's remove these comments from here. We go back to how we had it before. Then what we're going to do in here is to create a protocol and we say, and we want to basically represent every object in our system that can be turned into a view. Let's say you have a struct person, okay? And then you say it has a name. And then you want to say, I want to somehow present this person on my user interface. And then you say, okay, I want to make it presentable. All right. So you could define anything in your system that is presentable as a view using a protocol. Let's say pr protocol presentable as view. All right. And this is kind of like hypothetical at the moment. But later in this course, we will actually talk about MVVM in iOS and macOS and watch us using, for instance, combine and Swift UI plus Rx Swift and Rx Coco. But for now, just this is a hypothetical protocol, but it is very real. Actually, I use this in production today. So and I just wanted to give you an example of how this could look like. All right. Now, if you want to turn a protocol to a generic protocol, you'd use a syntax or a keyword called associated type. And using associated type is almost as if you say presentable as view has some sort of a generic parameter. But this syntax isn't accepted in Swift. You get an error. OK, now you can actually see it says an associated type name V must be declared. So let's go ahead and define this. We say associated type and we say view type 
should be any data type that conforms to the view protocol. You see what we did in here? We didn't just leave it empty. We said if something is presentable as view, its view should actually be up, be of type view. All right, so it can either be a button or it can perhaps be struct table is a view, all right? And maybe the struct person will conform to presentable as view and say that my view type is actually a table, all right? Again, this is hypothetical at the moment, at least. Then we say any object that is presentable as view should be able to produce a view for us to display to the user. So we say produce view is a function, okay? And this guy should actually produce a view of type, not view, but view type, all right? So if your view type is, for instance, button, then this function should produce a button. If your view type is table, then this function should produce a table. Then we can go ahead and create the next function in this protocol. Let's, let's just call it configure. So we say uh, anytime we want to present a, uh, an object as a view, we can allow it to configure itself using a super view as its reference, so super view. And we say this is a view as well. And uh, we say this view is view type. So we say the super view could be any view, but this view, oops, type, but this view should be is of type view type, which is a generic parameter to this protocol. Okay. And last but not least, then every object that is presentable as view should have a function on it that is called present. All right. And in here we say view is view type. And then we say on super view view. All right, so this view, we're already sure it is of type view type because this configure function, sorry, this produce view function actually produces a view type and that same view will be passed to this present function, okay? And a super view should be anything that is a view. Okay, so that was the, ex the protocol definition itself, all right? Let's go ahead and define, implement, uh, basically do some default implementation for some of these functions inside this protocol. So we say extension presentable as view and now this is a generic protocol simply because it has an associated type. All right. Then we go ahead and configure uh, our, uh, we write our configure function in here. So like that, let's just paste it in here. And we say its default implementation is empty by default. All right. Then we will have a, uh, we will implement the present function. All right, like this. And upon presenting a view on a super view, we just go to super view and we say add sub view view. All right, because we already know anything that is a view has this add sub view function on it. So we just call it. All right. Then what we can do to make this all very exciting, we say we create a button called my button, which is presentable as a view. All right, then we know that this function, uh, this button has to have two Im function implementations and they're the remaining two functions. Uh, actually, we don't wanna do that. So you can see presentable as view requires four, uh, actually three functions. It has a uh, produce view and it has a configure and present. And these two functions at the moment have default implementations right here, uh, but the produce view function doesn't have a default implementation. So you can go ahead in here and say that you want to define produce view, produce view. Okay. And then we change this and we say this actually returns a button as we've defined it in here. Button is a view. All right. And according to our protocol implementation, the produce view has to produce a view type that conforms to the view protocol and button does that. It conforms to the view protocol in here. Okay. So inside produce view, we just say we return an instance of button just like that. All right. Now what's going to happen is that you don't have to implement anything else except for this. But if you want to go ahead and for instance, do this configure function in here. So as soon as you start typing it, let's say configure, you can see then a Swift understood that super view is a view. However, this view is a button, but how did it understand that it's a button? The reason is that we changed the implementation of produce view so that it produces a button. Then Swift went to this protocol implementation in here and said, oh, produce view is producing a button. So everywhere in this uh, protocol where I see view type, I'm going to replace it by button. So it did this pretty much button, button and button. You can actually go ahead and test that by adding, for instance, also the present function in here. You can say present and you can see super view. Ooh, the view is a button. So that's how generics work basically in uh, in Swift protocols. Okay. So uh, 
it's very very simple when you look at the whole thing but if you go into details you can actually see there's lots of things to learn about how generics work with protocols especially and associated types so just know that for now that protocols can become generics using associated types and sometimes in swift you need to know about them and you need to use them but if you're not working so much with generics you probably don't have to bother so much with associated types but again if you feel intimidated by generics in swift i think you need to tackle that fear and go ahead and actually play with generics so much that you become so comfortable with them that it becomes a part of your day-to-day -day tool and day-to-day -day way of working with swift okay now if you want to extend generic protocols just like you have extension on for instance uh here and uh, you can see we have extension on this generic protocol you can go ahead and actually uh constrain your generic uh, extensions uh, to specific types so let's say that you say extension presentable as view and then you can say where view type view type is equal to a button all right this way you're creating an extension on any object that conforms to presentable as view as long as that object's view type is a button if you did this let's see what swift says actually so we're just creating a simple extension of presentable as view if you add a function to this any object that conforms to presentable as views protocol is going to get your extension values and or variables and functions however this way only presentable as view conforming objects that have a view type of button will get your extension all right so let's say func do something with button so we are adding a simple function in here and we say this is a button all right then let's go ahead and create a button we say button is an instance of my button and since my button conforms to the presentable as view uh, um, protocol we can say button do something with button right however if we went ahead in here and said structure table is also a, a view actually let's go to my button and we will just say my button is we copy that code and we go ahead in here and we say my table okay my table and in here where we have button we create another struct and we say table is a view and we say it's empty as well all right then we go back in here inside our my table we say that my my table produces a table and in here we just create an instance of table and we change this as well to table all right so and we can remove the configure function as well we don't have to have it in there now if we go ahead and say my table table is an instance of my table if you say my table dot you can see that you don't have access to the do something with button function if you want my table to have the same extension do something with button uh, first of all you'd have to change the name of this function so you say do something with view for instance uh, with view and then you also have to remove this generic uh, constraint from here because my table doesn't produce a button it actually produces a table then your table my table will have to do something with view function as well all right so i hope that this makes generics a little bit more clear to us at uh, at least by uh, by this point now apart from all of this you can also uh, as i mentioned like when we saw this extension on array of strings let's see where we did that the longest string okay you can also create other extensions on arrays even though they're generic types such as for instance calculating the average value of an array of integers so you can say extension uh, int so any array and uh, that contains integers and then you can say a function that calculates the average values and we say double and then we say self reduce this is a special generic function on any array and uh, you start with a seed value and in here you do your operation you basically what it does is that if you have values one two three four it says okay i start with the value of zero then i go to your first element then i say zero and one so then we say okay plus them together it says okay zero and one plus together will be one then I will take this one and I will go to the next element which is two and I will do this operation between these two one plus two is three it says okay then I have three then I go to the next element and say three plus three okay six six is here and this says I go to the next element six plus four it will be ten all right so this is how reduce actually works if you take the so basically this uh, if you say let xxx and then in here we say xxx you can see it's an integer but we want to 
grab the average, then we have to divide this with uh, the count of this array. So self.count. And we have to convert all of these to doubles so that they can actually produce a double value in here. Okay. You can see now it is quite uh, happy with the code that we've written. And then you can say one, two, three, and four, and you get its average. All right. And you can see then the value printed to the screen right here, 2.5. All right, so if you had an array that was just like two and two or four and four in here, then the average would actually be the same value as you've entered in here. Two and two will produce two and four and four will produce uh, four. Okay, so that's how you can extend existing data types that are generic such as arrays, okay? I really hope that all of these examples made generics make a little bit more sense to you. If they didn't, uh, I think it is important that you go back and practice generics yourself as well, because without practice, generics will probably never make sense. Good. We're done with generics. Let's go ahead to the next section, which is optionals. So I'm going to create a, a playground in here, playground, and we'll say blank and we'll say optionals which is also a very fun topic to talk about in Swift. So let's just do that. Good. And then in here we say import foundation and let's just do this so that it runs automatically as well. And let's get rid of our project uh, explorer to the left hand side. All right. So optionals indicate a value that might or not, might not be present. Okay. So let's say that you want to take a value and multiply it by two. Okay. So let's create a function that takes a value and multiplies it by two. So we say flunk multiply by two in here, and then we say value and you can see it's an integer and it returns an integer as well. All right. Then in here, you just say value multiplied by two in order to turn this data to actually, before I say in order to, let me just explain what optionals then would do for this function and how they would make this function perhaps a little bit more fun to work with. If you call this function multiply by two, you always have to produce a value in here. So you can't just call this function empty thinking that it will just produce zero if you don't pass anything to it. Okay. You can see that it says, okay, you have to pass a value to me in here. Then if you don't want to do that, if you just want to say, okay, if value isn't there, just assume it is zero. Okay, what you could do is to say, okay, value is uh, optional. So you say it shouldn't, it doesn't have to be passed in here. And furthermore, you can assign a default value to it. So you say value is an optional integer that by default is not present. Then what you can do in here, you say, if let value, so this is a syntax of unwrapping an optional. So you say, if the value is present, then return value multiplied by two, otherwise, return the value of zero like this. All right. And also there are other ways of actually doing this in Swift. So you can see now this function works fine because it's hitting this uh, point since if let value syntax indicated that value is indeed nil. There are other ways of doing this. You could actually change this code to this and do it like this. You could say it's an integer, which by default is zero, then it would work exactly as it did, but I'm just trying to demonstrate how optionals work and how if let works. It's a little bit difficult to find hypothetical examples for using optionals, which is a little bit uh, complicated topic to explain and even more complicated to find very trivial, trivial examples of how to use them. All right, but let's just leave this example as it is. So now you can see that you can call that function with uh, either no values, or you could say you pass a value of nil and it will produce also zero. Or you could say you pass a value of four or eight or whatever you want in here, and this function will still work. So even it works even with the value of nil. I don't know why our playground isn't really running yet. There we go. So we got our values. Okay. Now you can compare optionals with nil. Nil is a special value, meaning that the absence of a value basically. So you could say let age is an optional integer and it is equal to nil. All right, so it is not present basically. Then you could say if age is not nil, age is there. How odd, because we expected it to not be there. Else, age is nil, correct. Okay, so we kind of expect this branch to be to be executed right now. And you can see that it is. Okay, so that's how you can compare a value not being nil, for instance. Okay, now if you want to take an optional value and check whether it actually exists or not, you should use 
actually not you don't have to use but you can use the if let syntax so you say if let age if age is present then inside this block after if let age is not optional anymore so you can see it is right here okay so then you could say age is there uh, how odd its value its value is age all right otherwise no age is present as expected because we know that age is actually nil and we should get this uh, printed to the console all right now apart from if let way of unwrapping an optional you can also use another syntax which is called guard and guard does the negation of age basically so let's have a look at how guard works so let's say we create a function in here we say check age all right and in here we want to read age we say we want age to be there if it isn't then we're just gonna return from this function with a message but if it uh, if it isn't there we return with a message but if it is there then we print something to the console for instance so you could say if age is nil then you could say uh, age is nil as expected all right however there is another way of writing this function uh, and the way to do that is you say this let's say that this entire function depends on this age variable right uh, however if you um if you type a function if you type your code like this anyone reading this code might not fully understand that this age variable is very important to this function's uh, signature or this function's functionality and uh, that is why swift has an alternative way of doing this check so if your function depends on some optional values and it can't really continue without those optional values optional values actually be being present you need to perhaps use the guard mechanism so in here you say guard age shouldn't be nil else then you say age is nil as expected and then you return okay so you're basically saying make sure age isn't nil if it is so this else reads if it is then do this and inside guard you always have to return so if you don't return you actually get an error so guards have this property that they need to return uh, because that's the whole point okay and also using guard you can unwrap values as well as we'll soon see so let's put this guard in here and then we say uh, the rest is uh, age is not nil here strange because we don't expect that and then we call the check age function in here so we should now hit this branch because age is indeed nil so we can't just guard that it isn't nil because it is nil and it will end up being here okay now uh, using guard you can also unwrap uh, values because you can see in here if i said let xxx is age and in here i say xxx it is still an optional all right so um uh, even in here if i select xxx is age you can see xxx is indeed optional integer however in here we said make sure that it isn't uh, it isn't nil so it shouldn't be integer so i kind of expect xxx to be an integer all right but it isn't and the reason behind it is that we're not actually unwrapping this age we're just making sure that it isn't nil but the rest of the function doesn't understand that and the way to fix that is to actually use guard let so let's say let age 2 int optional and we actually set a value for it we set a value of zero okay then we create another function in here we say check age 2 and in here we say guard let age 2 otherwise so if we go in here and say let xxx in here let's do a return and we say xxx is equal to age 2 you can now see xxx is an unwrapped integer is not optional anymore and that is simply because we did a guard let all right and in here we say age is nil how strange and then we return and then in here we say age two is not nil as expected uh, value is equal to age two all right so this age two in here is not uh, this value anymore really it is unwrapped within this function all right then we can call this function as normal we say check h2 check h2 and we should then hit this line in here and you can see the value of age is indeed printed to the console value is zero you can change it to 10 if you want to and you can see that value being printed to the console as well all right so that's another syntax for guard using guard let for actually unwrapping an optional now optionals are actually an instance of an enumeration 
this integration is called optional <laughs> unsurprisingly so just like you can switch on option uh, on enumerations you can switch on optionals so you can in here go ahead and say switch age all right and you can get help from swift to complete these for you this switch statement you can go in here and say fix it for me you can see this optional uh, enumeration actually has two cases let's see if you can find it uh, enum optional there we go and it either is the value of none meaning that it is nil or it has some value inside it all right so in case of none let's just say age has no value as expected in case of some we can unwrap it and say let's say value and we say age has uh, the value of value like this and we can break in here as well break okay so age was nil if you remember so we kind of expect to hit this case in here which is none and it says age has no value as expected all right so that's how you would switch basically on an optional value you can also go ahead and do simple comparisons so if you could say if age 2 for instance is equal 0 so you could do that then you say age 2 is 0 as expected and is not nil and let's go to h2 and actually make sure that it is zero so let's change it to zero and in here we say else age two is not zero how strange all right and as you can see the comparison is working so you don't uh, so what i'm trying to say in here you can actually compare an optional value with a, another value like this without having to say if case let or is it let case or case let? I, I always forget that. So you don't have to unwrap it using a case let or uh, using a switch. You can just compare it with an unwrap value like this as well. Okay. Now you can also, just like we did this comparison, you can also compare with the none or some uh, cases. So let's just copy and paste that code in here. Then we say if h2 is equal to some zero then you say the same code in here so this these two are equal to each other i mean they're not equal but they're identical to each other so it is completely up to you how you want to do this code uh, for me if i see this code i don't assume that age 2 is optional but is indeed optional uh, but if you write your code for me i completely understand that oh h2 is optional so this is a little bit more descriptive of the problem in hand so uh, i actually would probably prefer this but it is up to you and your team to decide on a convention on which one makes more sense to you okay now you can also do optional something called optional chaining and and that means you optionally access optional properties or methods of some uh, classes or structures so let's create an example for it we say struct person and we say let name is a string and we say let address is uh, let's actually not do that at the moment let's inside this structure create another structure called address okay and in here we say let first line is a string and it's optional all right so we if we have it at an address then its first line might not be present and also uh, additionally we go into person in here we say addresses itself is optional so even if it is present uh, it doesn't have to have a first line but if it's not present it will be nil all right so it's like optional within optional so this is optional within this optional actually the other way around uh, address is optional and within it there is another optional property okay let's create a, a person in here we say foo is a person and we say it is equal to an instance of person with the name of foo and its address is nil we just say we don't have an address okay then if we say we want to get this uh, person's first uh, line of address then we say if let foo first address line line is equal to foo then dot address and optional optionally grab the first line all right so it means address is optional we know about that but go and grab its first line if it is present then we say um if let okay is equal to that then we print it out foo first line otherwise we say foo doesn't have an address with first line uh, as expected so since we didn't have an address for foo at, at all then it shouldn't even have a first line 
okay so this address basically swift stops right here it says i can't go any further after address because address is itself nil so i can't grab the first line of it even if first line did exist the address itself doesn't exist okay so then we get this message printed to the con console now we can go ahead and uh, do uh, another like an alternative way of grabbing this value is by first grabbing the address and then out of the address grabbing the first line it is a little bit more code and I don't actually think you win so much on it so I just wanted to show you how you can do that as well let's say if let foo address is foo dot address so you first unwrap the address okay and then you say okay after that get the first line as first line like this is equal to foo address dot first line then you can say foo address and then you say first line all right but we know that we don't get in here uh, because foo's address is in fact uh, nil so we don't even go inside this code in here and not in here either okay now you can compare optionals using chaining as well so let's go ahead in here and define a bar person we say bar is an optional person actually and it is equal to person whose name is bar and whose address is in fact a, an address instance with the first line equal to nil all right so it has an address but its first line is nil then we say if bars um and you see we're accessing bar using an optional like a question mark simply bar simply because bar in itself is an optional value if bars name is equal to bar and bars address first line is equal to nil then we say bars name is bar and has no first line of address okay otherwise then we can say um seems like something isn't working right because we know that bar's name is indeed bar and it has an address what its first line is actually nil okay but do you know this line uh, of code actually isn't saying that it has to have an address but its first line should be nil it could actually work as well it will work as well if the entire address is nil so let's just change it to nil and you can see still the same code will be executed all right so that's how optionality works it just continues until it can't continue any further okay now you can also switch on optionals with where clauses all right using uh, optional chain so let's create a bass person in here i'm just going to copy paste that code so we don't have to create many persons in this time it's an optional person with an address that is present and it has a first line as well all right then we can go ahead and say switch on the per on bass uh, address first line all right and in case uh, we say in case of uh, sum we say let a uh, first line and we just break in here and we say case and uh, none actually let's not do that let's just say uh, case first line and then we can go ahead in here and add a where clause so this is pattern matching and so we're saying okay if the first line is ab available and using this word clause is pretty much just saying and and the first line starts with uh the string uh, baz okay then we say baz first address line is equal to first line like that then we say case let sum and then we say first line and we don't have a word clause anymore in this one catches all then we say baz first address line uh, that didn't match the previous case and then we print the first line all right and then last but not least we also have to cover the none case where the value the optional value is indeed nil we say bas first address line is nil and uh, weird okay because we already know that bas's first address line is in fact bas first line and you can see this being printed to the console it says bas first address line is bas first line as it was in here so you can have where clauses in your case statements for switching on optional um, enumeration uh, or enum values okay now you also can choose to um uh, if you're using if let or guard let and you should do that uh, as long as it makes sense to you all right so let's create a function in here let's say we say func get full name 
and then we say we have first name as a string and then we have a last name as an optional string and we produce an optional string as well all right then we say uh, we say that you have to have a last name all right even though the function signature says optional we say that okay you should have one we said if let last name if we can unwrap it then we return first name and name and space then we say uh, last name all right otherwise uh, otherwise we return nil all right now that's one way of doing it so you can just in here say get full name and for first name we say foo and for last name we say nil then we call the same function with uh, foo and bar as names like this so this one has a last name of nil so it should end up being here and you can see it's actually producing the value of nil and this one has both first name and last name therefore it is returning foo bar as its result so that's one way of doing it but you can also go ahead and use guardlet so if you copy this code from here and then we go and paste it right here and we say get full name two and in here you could say guardlet last name otherwise return nil and then you switch these statements basically all right so you basically the way i usually read this is like this make sure last name is present otherwise return and then do this otherwise basically saying if last name is present okay so after doing a guard let all statements after that guard let if we hit them in that in those statements the value that you unwrapped in here will be present as a non-optional all right so that was also short and sweet about optionals and there's lots more to actually explain about optionals and they pop up pretty much everywhere in swift and especially swift ui as you're as you as actually we'll talk about swift ui later in this course as well but just know that they're there you need to learn them if you're working with swift and it is very advantageous if you can really master optionals in swift because they're pretty much everywhere I hope you enjoyed this uh, section of the uh, course as well. And in the next core, in the next section, we're going to talk about error handling in Swift. Now that we've talked enough about optionals, let's first do some cleanup here in our workspace. So I'm just going to press command command W and close all these tabs that we have opening here. There are quite a many and they're not really contributing to so much right now. Rather, they're just like uh, making our workspace look a little bit dirty so i'm just gonna do command w in here and if you're in visual studio code for instance on linux and or even uh, actually replace build a build oh okay i don't know what happened really and even if you're on linux and you're for instance having visual studio code open with your uh, swift files you can also close them if, if you're not really interested in having them all open at the same time so as mentioned, we're going to go and talk about error handling right now. So I'm just going to press command N and say blank in here at playground. And let's say error dash handling. And I'm going to create it in the um, main workspace in here, as you can see. OK, let's press create in here and say import foundation. And like usual, we're going to go in here and say that it should automatically run all our code. OK, so Error handling is one of the most important concepts in any programming language that supports errors and exceptions. And really the point of errors and exceptions are to tell the, uh, the caller to our code or whoever's using our code that something has gone wrong. It's either the, the failure of the code that we've written such as an error or it's the failure uh, of the person calling this function or code uh, such as an exception so there is a little bit of a difference between actually errors and exceptions in different programming languages but in swift usually we only talk about errors so meaning that the code found out that something hasn't gone according to the plans and then it throws an error and actually the word for it is actually throw in swift indeed so they, there's a keyword for it called throw okay and it is the same thing in many other programming languages actually it is called throw in dart for instance as well so let's have a look at an example of throwing an error in swift and catching it so we're, we're going to create a person in here let's see if i can spell struct person and let's say we have a first name uh, it's an optional and we say last name optional string as well okay then we want to create a function in here called get full name and this function should ideally return a string okay so we're going to say func get full name 
and we say it returns a string, right? However, how can it return a string if first name and last name are both optional, meaning that they could at any point both be nil or one of them could be nil. And in those cases, we cannot produce a full name. So the goal of this function is to return a string. It shouldn't really return an optional string because a full full name shouldn't be optional. Then what we're going to do in here, we're, we're going to say, OK, it is going to try to produce a string, but it may actually throw. So we say throws. OK, so the function throws, but inside it, it will throw. All right. So that's how the um, how the verb and the noun basically work. Uh, actually, I think it is a noun. Yeah. Uh, so the function is marked as throws, meaning that internally it can throw an error. Now, we're going to go ahead and define our errors inside the structure. Then you don't have to define them inside the structure or the class that throws them, but it is usually good practice to define them within their enclosing structure or class. So, so to associate the error objects with that structure or class. Okay. So we're going to go and say enum errors, for instance, it doesn't have to be called errors. You could call it my errors or person errors, whatever. Okay. Person errors also works. But in here, we're just going to call it errors. And we need to ensure that this enum conforms to this error protocol. Okay, you can see it is a public protocol. Okay, so you cannot throw errors that are not um, actually your enum. If you're actually going to throw its cases, the, the entire enum needs to conform to the error protocol. So that's the rule, basically. Now we're going to say the first case of the error is, for instance, first name is nil. We're going to say then last name is nil. And we're going to say case both names are nil. So these are the available errors that this function can throw. So these are the three things that can go wrong. Either the first name is nil or the last name or both. In any other case means that name and last, the first name and last name are not nil. And we can calculate the full name successfully. All right. So as uh, option, as we've actually learned in the optionals uh, section of this video, Optional data type is a um, it is an enumeration, meaning that we can do switch on them. So if you want to basically learn whether these two are both not nil, you could either do it like this: if let first name and let last name, then you can produce the first name uh, like this: first name and then last name, last name like this. Then you should say else if first name is nil and last name is not nil. Then you should say throw and you say errors. First name is nil. Then you have to do a lot of else statements in here to understand. OK, first name wasn't nil. Last name was nil. And then throw uh, last name is nil. And if both of them are nil, then do this. So it's a lot of if and else statements. Instead of all of that, we can just do a simple switch statement in here. OK, so let's just say we switch. And we say we switch on the first name and the last name. All right. So this is the first time we're doing a switch on two uh, enums at the same time. All right. So the first case, uh, we want to handle one. They're both nil. So we say case. The first one is none. And the second one is none. OK. In this case, both names are nil. So we say throw errors. Both names are nil. The next case, we want to make sure that um, we want to basically see if the first name is nil, but the last name is not nil. So we say first name is nil and the last name is not nil. Remember some and none, they're the cases of optional. So if you go in here, do you remember these none and some? Some meaning that there is a value. So we're saying that there is no value for first name, but there is some value for last name. In the case of not having a first name, then we throw an error and we say first name is nil. Then we reverse these. So we say in here, we take this none. We say the first name is some value, but the last name is no values. And then we say last name is nil. And in the other case, then we say in the case of actually having a first name and last name. So we say case let some first name and some last name in here. Then we can calculate. We say return. And we return a string with the first name and last name in here, just like that. OK, so this is this is like some sort of uh, pattern matching, you could say, in Swift. And pattern matching in Swift is very powerful. I mean, I would say it's even more powerful than pattern matching, for instance, in Rust, uh, which is also in its in its own very powerful. But Swift has some really neat features when it comes to pattern matching with switch statements, for instance. OK.
Okay, so let's go ahead now and create an instance of this person's structure. We say let's, oops, can I spell? Let's foo, and we say person. And for the first name, we're gonna say foo, and for the last name, we're gonna say nil, all right? So now we wanna go ahead and uh, grab the la uh, the full name of this person, and knowing full well that the last name is nil, meaning that we're gonna get into this case. Uh, actually, no, sorry, this case, last name is nil, all right? So how do we do that? Because if you go ahead and say let full name is uh, foo, get full name, get full name, you can see that we're going to get an error from Swift saying that actually it is very important that we see this error. It says call can throw, but is not marked with try. It says, well, it can throw basically, it can throw an error, but you're not trying to resolve that error. So the keyword for trying to resolve an error or trying to actually call a function, for instance, that can throw, the keyword for it is try. Okay, so you say try. However, we're going to probably get another error now. And it says, well, it crashed. So you, the entire playground pretty much crashed. And the reason is that this function threw, but we tried this inside a inside a context that doesn't have error handling. So if you're using try, then you need to be inside a context in where in which you're handling your errors. And that type of context is created with the do keyword. So you say do, and then you place this code in here. Okay. And in here, then you can go ahead and say catch. And then you say got an error. And there is an internal error object in here, which is just called error. Okay. And you can see now we are getting this in here and it says got error. And it says last name is no. So this is according to what we basically expected. Okay. So just remember do and catch and inside the catch block, if you don't specify anything in here, uh, like let's E or something, because then we're going to get E in here. If you don't specify how you want to catch in into which variable, there is an internal hidden variable called error inside every catch statement. Okay, good. Now, if you also want to, I mean, this, this just catches every error, any error, pretty much. Okay. So if you go in here and say, uh, foo, uh, the first name and last name for it is nil. Now you see you catch another error that's called both names are nil. Okay. But what if you want to catch specific errors? You don't want to catch every error. You want to catch, for instance, specific errors. You can, you can say, I just want to catch person errors. Okay. And any other error that happens in here, I don't want to catch it because remember inside the do statement, you can ha actually have a lot of code. You can have a lot of code in here and you can say, let blah is try something else. Okay. And any of these statements that have tried before them, they can throw and they, and then those errors that are thrown could be of different types. So within the do statement, you can have multiple, uh, lines of code, uh, each of which can also throw different types of errors. If that is the case, how can you catch? specific errors. And the way to do that is using the is uh, keyword after catch, I'll show you. So let's copy this in here that we have and paste it. And then we put the full name in here just so that we get the full name printed to the screen, if if any, but we already know that there, there will be no full name. And in here, we're going to say catch is person dot errors like this. Okay. And you can see in here, this statement still, I mean, let's see error. Okay. We're going to get rid of this one because we already know that is a person error. Okay. So we have pattern matching basically on our catch and we can't actually grab the variable out of it anymore. So we, we detected that is a person error and then the error variable isn't available to us anymore after doing this pattern matching. Okay. So this is how you would look for specific types of errors in your catch statements. All right. Now you can also catch specific errors. I mean, here you're basically matching the error against a type, but then you would be asking yourself, well, but how do I know which one of these errors it is? Okay. And you can actually catch specific errors just by typing catch which error. Okay. So let's copy this code. Actually, maybe let's create an, another variable in here. We say let bar equal to person. And in this case, we say both first name and last name are nil. All right, like this, then we're going to copy this code that we have in here. And right after bar, we're going to paste that and we say full name is bar get full name. All right. And then in here inside catch, we're going to change this code that we have. And instead, we say catch person errors, and first name is nil, then we say first name is nil like that. 
And then I copy, I'll copy this and I say, we also want to catch last name is nil. And we say last name is nil. Then we say, uh, okay, we also want to catch person dot uh, errors. Both names are nil. And we say both names are nil. And otherwise, at the end, we have a catch all block in here. And we say some other error was thrown. Okay. So now, this, now you see, uh, you can, we're basically getting this error in here. Both names are nil as expected. First name and last name are, not, uh, are basically nil. Okay. So this is how you can catch specific errors as well. This is how you can catch error types like uh, errors of this type. But inside this, we, we already know that we have three specific errors. And if you want to catch any of those specific errors, you can do do just catch and that that specific error. Okay, so that's another way of handling uh, errors. Now, uh, we've had a look just at one function at the moment that can throw. But uh, you can also do, uh, you can basically throw errors inside constructors as well of structures or classes, meaning that you try to construct an object, uh, but the parameters that you're passing to that object are somehow not valid. Uh, so as you know, the constructor or initializer of classes and structures have complete right to do some validation on the data that you're passing to them. If those data for some reason are not correct, according to the validation of that structure or class, then the class or structure should be able to throw. Okay, and I'll show you now how you can define throwing uh, initializers or constructors for structures and classes. So let's create a struct car in here. Okay, and then we say let manufacturer and this manufacturer is a string. Then what we want to do is to create um, a, a constructor or initializer for this car that looks at the manufacturer that you pass to us. And if it is empty, then it's going to throw an error because at the moment you can say my car is a car with a manufacturer of empty string. And this is not valid according, I mean, to our rules, you shouldn't have a car that doesn't have a manufacturer. Okay. So we want to basically catch this case. We want to see, okay, when you pass the manufacturer to the structure, is it empty? If it is, then we want to throw an error. So let's go ahead and define that error first. So we say enum errors. And of course, we have to conform to the error protocol. And we say case invalid manufacturer. It is a very complicated word to type, in my opinion. Then we go ahead and we say, okay, we have an initializer in here, which takes in the manufacturer. Okay, so I'm just going to copy this so I don't have to type it anymore. And then in here, we say this init function, uh, it or initializer actually throws. And then we say if the manufacturer is empty, then throw errors dot invalid manufacturer. Otherwise, self manufacturer is equal to that manufacturer. Okay, so you can see then we don't have a problem in here. The only problem actually we have is that we're now calling this now Swift understands that this call to the initializer of car is throwing but we're not trying it. Okay. So let's go ahead and do a try on this. So we say do, and then we say we catch uh, car errors, invalid manufacturer, and we just have a catch all case in here as well. So we go into the do and we say try this code. And in here, then we say invalid manufacturer, and we say some other error, just like this. Okay. Now you should be able to see that we get this invalid manufacturer uh, pass in here. So now the important thing is also that if you're inside this do clause and after this try statement, you can definitely use my car. So you can say my car that manufacturer do whatever you want with it. But you already know that none of this code is going to be executed because the way we're calling this car or the initializer of the car structure is that it's going to throw. So it's never going to reach this code in here. So Swift reads this code goes and calls the constructor and it gets to this throw and just immediately jumps out of this into its catch statements and says, okay, do I have any catch that matches the error that was just thrown? Yes. And it then comes here and it doesn't even go here. Okay. So you need to kind of follow the path of uh, the program to understand what is happening really. Now, you sometimes may not really care about the errors that are being thrown from functions or initializers, for instance. And the way to do that is that you want to grab the value of a function optionally. So you say, if this function is successful, get me the value for it. So you don't actually care about the errors. Okay. So let's go ahead and have a look at the syntax word and syntax word is using if let. 
Okay, so you said if let your car is equal to try with a question mark. So this is simply try with a question mark simply means that you don't have to have a do and catch statement. It says optionally try to call this function. And if it is successful, then give me the value back. Okay, so we say Tesla. And then we have access to we say success, your car is a your car like this. Otherwise, we say failed to construct and error is not accessible now. So if you do this statement in here, so you can see we're passing Tesla actually to the constructor for or initializer for car. Therefore, this logic is not going to be called and a, a proper instance of car will indeed be created, uh, meaning that we will indeed come in here uh, inside the success block. All right. So we optionally try to call this function. If it was successful, if it didn't throw, then we come here and then we have full access to this variable. All right. Otherwise, we get to this clause. And as you can see, I've typed in here. In here, we lose access to the error that was actually thrown. So we, we don't have access to the error object really in here. Okay. So that's how you can optionally try to call a function that throws and grab its value. Now, you can also, in some very rare cases, very angrily try to unwrap a, the value of a function that can throw. But please know that in, in all my years of working with Swift, I haven't done this. I know that it is available, but you, you and you should, as a Swift programmer, know that it exists, but you should almost never, ever use it. But and the reason behind it is that this code, as I said, angrily unwraps a function get, that can throw, meaning that your program or your application or your iOS app or watchOS app or macOS app will indeed crash completely and completely close should the function that you're invoking actually throw an error. And the syntax for it is not with an optional try. It is indeed with a, 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 a how do you call this actually exclamation mark. Okay, so let's go ahead and have a look at this. We say let their car is equal to try and we say car with a manufacturer of Ford. And you can see now this will indeed be a valid car instance. And I can say their car dot manufacturer. So nothing really happened. And you think, okay, but why did he say that you should never use this syntax? And the reason is that should this manufacturer be empty, this whole playground will crash. And it will just, you can see in here, uh, and encountered a crash and could not finish executing. And this same thing will happen to your app, uh, whether it's a Mac OS or iOS or uh, um, watch OS app, your app will completely crash. It won't look as pretty as it did in the playground because the playground, it still was open, but it just told you that it crashed. If it is in a real application, the application will just completely close and the user will be baffled by what just happened. So please don't use this syntax. Try to always do, I mean, ideally you should do do and catch. If you can't do that, please do try. And please never try this. <laughs> never try this way of unwrapping values, unless there is a very compelling reason for it that you and your teammates, for instance, are completely comfortable with. Okay. Now, we've already looked at throwing errors from uh, functions. But just know that you, you don't necessarily have to throw a specific type of error. In here, we have just one enum. And in here, we also had just one enum. Uh, that define our errors. But a, any function that is marked as throws can throw any error. It doesn't necessarily have to throw a, uh, errors from just one enumeration. So let me just show you how that will look like. Let's create a struct in here and we, we call it dog, all right, like this. And inside this, let me actually create some empty spaces so we can do this. So Inside the dog structure, we're going to uh, create two variables. One is called is injured and is sleeping. Okay, so is injured, injured, bull, and uh, let is sleeping in here, boolean. All right. And then we go ahead and we want to create two functions, a bark function and a run function. So let's say func, func bark, and func, uh, and we say run. Now, inside the logic of this dog structure, we're going to say, okay, we're going to bark like this, but we're only going to bark if we're not sleeping. All right. So we're saying if is sleeping like this, then we want to throw an error. So let's go ahead and define the error for that. So we say enum barking errors and we say error 
and in here we say cannot bark is sleeping all right then we say if you're if if you're asked to bark and you're sleeping then we say throw barking errors uh, cannot bark is sleeping all right otherwise we bark and then we do something similar for this actually let's see what error we're getting in here throw okay because this function is not marked with throws so let's just change that to throws and we're also going to change this function to throws okay now we're going to go ahead and create another enumeration in here and we're going to call it uh running errors i think let's just say enum uh running errors errors error and then we say case cannot run is injured and we do the same thing in here so let me just copy this code and put it inside run and we say if is injured okay so we cannot run if we're injured then we say uh, running errors cannot run is injured otherwise we say running or run something like that okay so i think you get the point so you cannot bark if you're sleeping or actually not you and not me either it's the dog so the dog cannot bark if it is sleeping and it cannot run if it is injured unfortunately okay so now that we have those we will also go ahead and create another function and we say func bark and run which combines those two functions then we say try bark and try run now what happened in here we just said try without having to do and catch what happened is that we're inside a function that can throw and if you mark your function as throws, you can simply just try things. You don't have to wrap them inside do and catch. What happens is that if any of these functions uh, that we have inside bark and run throws, then this function itself will throw. So if you call this function and you call bark, then Swift goes in here and it says, oh, is it sleeping? Yes. Then it throws this error from this function and since that fun that function was uh, invoked from this function then it will throw the error idea uh, essentially from uh, this function out to the caller okay so if you have a function marked as throws inside it you can try statements without having to wrap them inside do and catch in some rare cases you actually want to wrap them inside do and catch because perhaps let's say that your um, back-end developers tell you that hey if someone calls this function and this particular function throws an error, then I want you to actually send an API request to the backend to log that error because that should never happen, for instance. OK, so then you can say do OK, try and then you say catch. And in here you will do your API. OK, you do your API call. All right. And then you can actually re throw this error as well. So uh, and we probably will talk about that soon as well. But just know that inside a throwing function, you can try your statements without having to wrap them with that within do and catch. OK, so let's go ahead and create a little dog in here that unfortunately is both sleeping and injured. So we say dog is an instance of dog, which is injured and is also sleeping. All right. Then we go ahead and we create a do and catch block in here. We say do and we say catch dog barking errors cannot bark. And also, we want to catch dog uh, sleeping errors. Uh, actually, what did we have? Running errors, sorry, running errors. And cannot run is injured. Okay, so you can see how we're catching both of these errors at the same time, just using a comma. And we'll also have a catch all in here. So we say cannot uh, bark is sleeping or cannot run is injured. All right. And in catch, we say some other error. And inside do, we're going to say try dog dot bark and run. All right. So you can see now when we do that, we say we get this catch statement in here that says cannot bark is sleeping or cannot run is injured because we've basically caught both of these errors in the same clause. All right. You can separate them if you want to just using separate try statements. Now, if you go and change these to false, you will see that none of those errors will be thrown, meaning that we will just not see anything in here, basically. So we can say dog just to confirm that this try statement actually ran its course and went to the next line, line 115 here. OK, let's refer them back in here. So we have this example as well. Now, uh, now in case you're catching errors uh, in separate catch statements, just know that only the first thrown error will be caught. All right. So in here, we caught both of them. 
Uh, but again, Swift called this block not because both these errors happened, but it called this block because one, at least one of these happened. Because remember, when a function throws, the execution of that function completely stops. So barking throws an error. Swift doesn't even go to running, meaning that this, uh, this error will never be thrown. Therefore, only the bark function will throw its error, which is right here. Swift just completely stops the execution of this function and will run, I will basically run its course out of it, a step out of that function, this error will be thrown, and then we will come in here, okay? And we can actually test that. Let's copy this code and paste it in here. And then we're going to go ahead and uh, separate these catch statements. And we go in here and we say catch first, cannot bark is sleeping. And when you say cannot bark is sleeping, then we will say catch dog dot uh, running errors cannot run is injured. And we say uh, can, cannot run is injured like this. And you'll see now only uh, the first error that was thrown will be caught, which is cannot bark is sleeping, even though and this uh, dog is both injured and is sleeping. But the run function will never be called inside the bark and run uh, function simply because bark threw an error, uh, breaking the entire uh, function call basically in here. Okay, so that's how you can actually uh, understand how uh, you can catch various errors. And I hope now you know basically the flow of when errors are caught and that you shouldn't really expect to be able to catch multiple errors at the uh, in the same do statement, basically. All right. Now let's talk about rethrows. I said that we we're probably going to talk about rethrows, but I think it is time uh, now to talk about it. So when we talk about rethrows, we're talking about a function that internally calls another function, which can also throw. So let me just show you an example. Let's create a function here called full name. Okay. And we take in a first name which is an optional string. And then we say a last name, which is also an optional string. And we say, okay, we ourselves cannot calculate the, uh, the full name. We actually need a function that can do that for us inside this function. So this poor little function can't really do anything. It just takes the first name and last name and calculates the full name. Now, this error is really stupid. And uh, I mean, it is really not how you probably want to do your uh, write your Swift code, but it is just here for the purpose of demonstration. Because if we didn't do a simple function like this, uh, which looks dumb, you would have to go ahead and create a very complicated function, which indeed is production ready, and you would probably use it in production code. But this is a little bit easier, at least to get into what rethrows uh, keyword means in Swift. So please just bear bear with me. So we say we have a function that actually does the calculation, we call it calculator, it takes in a string, uh, it takes two string optional uh, parameters, and it is a throwing function. So we say it actually throws and it returns a string in return. Okay. And then we just do this, then we create our own function body in here. So all these errors are going to go away. Now, since this function is going to call this function, it has to do a try right? Because this function throws, therefore, this function should also throw. So then we say it throws. All right. And also produces an optional string, then okay, we say try calculator. And in here, we have to pass the first name and last name. So we say first name and last name. All right. So uh, if you look at this code, you will now see, okay, we're trying something in here. Okay. And our function is called uh, is marked as throws. Anyone looking at this function will think that somewhere inside this function, we're probably throwing a specific error. Uh, like we're actually um, have some errors that we know what they are, and we're throwing them perhaps, okay. However, there's another syntax for this, and it is called rethrows. And how this really works is that uh, it this tells Swift that this function in itself doesn't throw anything. It is gonna basically invoke some other functions that throw. All right. So we could have gone in here inside the bark and run function and say this rethrows. Okay. And you can see that our code will let, let's actually see what happened. Must take a throwing function argument. And this is, this is really good. We're seeing this. I mean, this is an example uh, why we actually didn't mark this as rethrows. Uh, so in order, I mean, the error is a little bit cryptic, but what it is 
telling us really is that if for a function to be able to be marked as a rethrows, it has to it has to have a, an argument that is a closure which throws and it should call that argument. And since this bark and run function it doesn't have any argument that is a closure, it doesn't even have any arguments that it cannot be marked as rethrows. Okay, and that's what that error was telling us. However, this new function that we have in here has an argument that throws and we're actually calling it using try. And therefore we can mark our function as rethrows. And this tells Swift that this function in itself is just calling an argument, which is a closure, which in, in itself throws an error. Okay, so it's just a way of telling Swift that, hey, we have a throwing function in here and we're just calling it and just we rethrow the errors that this function might eventually produce. Okay, so let's then go ahead and create an enum in here. And then we say enum, uh, oops, enum and uh, name errors. And it's a, uh, it conforms to the error protocol in here. And we say case first name uh, is invalid and case last name uh, is invalid. All right, then we create a function that can produce a, a full name based on a first name and last name. So we say func plus, so it's an operator. Then we say first name uh, is optional string in here. Then we say last name as well as an optional string. And we produce a, a, an optional string in return. Okay, like this. And we also can throw. All right. Good. And you can see we created this function with first name, optional, last name, optional, and result optional as well and throws. And this function signature matches this. You see optional string, optional string throws and returns an optional string. And the reason we created this function is simply because we want to call this function. And instead of the calculator, we're going to pass a reference to this plus operator in here. Okay. So let's say we want to ensure that both, um, both the first name and last name uh, are presented. So we say guard let first name. So we ensure the first name is uh, available. And we say in case the um, first name is empty. Okay. So the way you should read the statement is that we say, make sure first name is available and make sure first name is not empty. Otherwise, this is how I usually read my guard statements. Okay, make sure something and something otherwise, which is this else, do this, throw name errors, first name is invalid. All right, so if first name is nil, or that it is empty, then we throw this error. Then we're going to do something similar like this. Then we say guard let last name, ensure last name is present and that it is not empty. Otherwise, say last name is invalid. So you throw that error. And if everything then goes fine, then we say return uh, the first name and last name. And you see these uh, variables in here are not optional anymore. And that is simply because we're doing a guardlet. Okay. After guardlet is executed, uh, I mean, if last name is nil, then you never get here. And that's why Swift knows that if you did get here, um, it means that you've already checked that last name was not nil. Therefore, the data type for last name is not an optional string anymore. It is actually a string. Same thing with first name. It is string and not an optional string. Okay. Now that we have those, we can go ahead and try to invoke this function right here, which is full name. So we go ahead and say we create a do uh, block in here and we say let foobar is try get the full name. And we say first name, let's say first name, we say nil, last name is nil. And for the calculator, we pass a reference to our plus operator in here. Okay. And then we say we have to catch some errors in here. So let's say catch. And we say name errors, first name is invalid, then we say first name is invalid. Then we say catch also name errors, last name is invalid, last name is invalid like that. And then uh, we'll also have a catch all block in here. We say catch let uh, ERR, for instance, and we say some other error, and that is equal to ERR. Okay. And you can also put parentheses around this as well, but this, this is completely optional. I think actually this is a little bit cleaner to read. So now you can see that we're getting first name is invalid thrown in here. Okay. And that is simply because our code just came in here and was like, can I unwrap first name? Is there a value in it? Nope. 
then it throws this error. So it doesn't even go here and it doesn't, it definitely doesn't go in these cases either. Okay. So let's change this. Let's change the first name to foo and you will see that your error will be the other one, which is last name is invalid. And then you say last name is bar. Then all of a sudden your function is going to produce foo bar for you. Okay. So let's, let's go ahead and do one more test. And uh, in here, you can see that our function, which is this operator, is marked as throws, but it is still returning an optional string. Uh, however, internally, it never returns nil. It either throws, which is caught by this guy, or not caught by, it is covered by this guy, uh, or it actually returns a valid string. So why is it marked with returning an optional string? And this is actually a really good question. It doesn't necessarily have to be an optional string. It is better that it is not. And it still matches inside this function signature. So because this is a promotion, the, a string that is not optional is a promotion of an optional string. So it can always match it, but a demotion will never match inside a function signature. Okay. So you can, if, if this requires a string, you can never use a, a function that returns an optional string. It, you will actually get an error now, or we should get an error. There we go. Okay. So just remember a promotion will work, but a demotion won't. And this is a promotion. We're saying that although you need an optional string, which is at a lower level, meaning that it can be nil, but we will always produce a string, which is at a higher level, meaning that it's never optional. So it is a promotion. A promotion and fun function signatures in Swift always works. Okay. Good. We've now talked about that. Now let's also talk about results and results are also very important to understand. They're kind of related to uh, error handling. So that's why I wanted to name them. And they're usually useful when you're writing API calls. Okay. So what we want to achieve in here is to create a function that is called get previous positive integer, and you will pass an integer to this function and the, res and the responsibility of this function we're going to develop is to find the positive integer right before the integer that you pass to it as an argument. So if you pass two, this function is going to have to return the value of one. If you pass one, this function has to return zero. But what happens if you pass zero? There is no more positive integer before zero because the next number, if you do a minus one to z uh, basically say zero minus one, you are going to end up with minus one. And that's not a positive integer. So you could say, well, let's just throw an error. And you'd be right. You could just mark your function as throws. But there is another way of doing that. There is another way of saying that a function fails, but it fails perhaps a little bit more gracefully. It doesn't actually throw an error, but it carries an error with it. Okay. And this concept is also available in many other programming languages. You have it in Dart, you have it in Python, you have it in Rust. So many other programming languages have this concept. And in some languages, it is called either, but in Rust, uh, sorry, in Swift, it is called result. So let's first go ahead and define our error. So we say enum integer, integer errors. It is an error. And then we say case, no positive integer before this value. Okay. Enum error case. Did I do something incorrectly in here? It doesn't look like it formatted it right, but this is fine. Okay. Then we create our function. We say func and we say get previous v as positive integer. And we say from int. All right. And in here, what we need to do, we are not going to say that this function throws, but instead we're going to say that this returns a result that is either an integer or an integer error, like in here. Okay. So now all of a sudden, instead of this function, just saying, oh, I throw anything, you're saying it either gives you the result or it gives you a, an error of this specific type, which is a little bit cleaner, to be honest with you, because a throwing function doesn't necessarily specify, or it can't really specify the type of errors that it throws. So the caller, the call site to that function always has to have a catch all block in order to understand, okay, what error is actually being thrown by this function. But by using a result, you specifically say which errors you're gonna throw, not really throw, but which errors you're gonna carry with you, if any, all right? So let's guard that this integer is more than zero. Otherwise, we say return a result that is a failure, and its failure is indeed an integer error 
you can see in here that is no positive integer before this value and the value is this integer right here okay so we're regarding that the int is more than uh, zero basically because otherwise we can't minus one it all right then after this we say okay in that case we want to in any other case where the integer is more than zero then we have to return a successful result then we say return a result with success and the value is integer minus one all right so you see how this function is structured at the moment okay then we go ahead and create um, create another function which internally calls this function so we call it func perform get and this is just to add another la layer of complexity really to our code so that we don't go ahead and directly call this function i just want to show you how you can call this function within another function okay so we say perform a get for a value and we say value is an int and inside this function we're going to call the other one get previous value sorry get previous positive integer from value and then since this guy returns a result and if you look at result you can see just like optional result is an enumeration meaning that you can switch on it so let's switch on this guy and we say uh, in case if we get a success uh, and we say previous value all right uh, actually success previous value maybe not previous value I, previous positive yeah previous value then we say previous value is previous value but in case we get an error we say case failure and we say error then you can say okay but this error it is in itself an enum it is an integer errors enum we already know that so since it's an enum you can have another switch within your switch the first switch is switching on this result and since it gets the error which is of type integer errors with it itself is an enum then you can have another switch in here then you say switch error in the case of no positive integer you put a let in here and you say this value then you say no positive integer uh, before this value all right so now that we have this extra logic in here we can go ahead and call our perform get function so i'm just going to copy paste some code in here you can see first we pass zero to this function and let me comment this line out we first we pass zero and zero then come so that zero comes in here uh, it's then passed into this function then it comes in here and says make sure int is more than zero oops it's not return the failure and then it comes in here into failure gets the error we switch the error is it no positive integer before yes it is indeed and then you get this line printed to the console no positive integer before zero and that's correct okay then we bring this go code back you can see now it will hit this block and it says previous value is one all right because the previous value before two is indeed one so that's short and sweet about error handling in uh, swift you can either use throwing functions and throwing constructors for instance uh, and then do and catch and you also looked at try with a question mark which optionally tries a function or try with an exclamation mark which you tr try to always avoid actually because it can crash your application and then at the end we looked at how result also works in swift and how it, it goes hand in hand with error handling in swift as well okay now that we're done with error handling in Swift, let's talk about collections. And collections is something we've talked about up to this point a good maybe five or ten times, um, five to ten times, I would say, but we haven't really gone into details about them. So I'm going to close this playground in here. I'm going to press Command N and say blank in here. And let's create a um, new playground and we're going to call it collections. All right, and ensure that it's created in your main uh, workspace. And then we say create. And just like normal, we say import foundation and run this playground also automatically. We get rid of our explorer here, and then we can start talking about collections. So collections, as their name indicates, there are a collection of stuff. All right, so for instance, let numbers. And if you're, um, I mean, not if, but since you're already familiar with other programming languages, collections are also called arrays or dictionaries uh, or even JSON objects. For instance, if you're working with simple JavaScript, you can just say um, const something is equal to, and then you add your values in here, value 
blah. Okay, so this is a simple JSON JavaScript and is uh, some sort of a collection. And in Swift, you also have different types of collections. One of them is an array. So you say let's numbers is one, two, three, four, for instance. And then you can do different things with this collection. You can say, give me the first value, give me the last value, give me the count of objects in here. Or you can say uh, numbers map every element to its minus counterpart. So you can see in here, then let me just bring this over. So you can see we have one, one, two, three, four. Then the first element is one, last element is four. There are four elements total. And in here we mapped every element inside this numbers uh, array to its minus counterpart. Okay, so this is an operator in here. Now, if you have an array in Swift, you can also mutate it as long as it is a variable. So let's say var mutating numbers, and we say zero, one, and two. And then you can see mutating numbers append the value of three and then mutating numbers insert the value of minus one at the index of zero okay so index of zero is right here not that the zero is actually let's just say four five and six instead okay and then we append the value of seven and we then insert the value of three at the index of zero meaning that the array was four five six but at the end it will be three four five six seven you see what happened in here the index of zero is right here and an index of one is right here index of two is right here because in indexes in arrays uh, and any collection in pretty much every programming language that i know about they start at the index of zero they're called zero based indexes okay so uh, apart from doing appends and inserts you can also insert a whole array inside an array so you can say mutating numbers insert and then you can say insert the contents of for instance one and two at the index of zero so let's see what happens in here and then right it's not insert it is actually insert contents of so this api call is called insert contents of and you can see the resulting array will be one two three four five six and seven in here okay you can enumerate over the elements inside an array by just using a for statement for value in numbers so then you can say a value and print it to the console and now um Playgrounds have a, an interesting way of showing values over time. Since we're uh, enumerating over these values and there are four of them, it can't print them all in the same line. So you have to click here, uh, I believe, and it gives you like a little graph and then you have to right click on it and you say uh, value history. Then you get the values one, two, three, four. Otherwise it shows you a graph for some reason. Okay. <laughs> and, and let's somehow remove this. Okay. There we go. So that's how you would go through values inside an array, okay? You can also enumerate through uh, items inside an array with pattern matching using the WHERE clause. So if you want to, for instance, grab all the, uh, all the even numbers inside this array, so because you saw this printed one, two, three, and four, and one and three are not even numbers. But if you want to grab only the even numbers, you could say for value in numbers, WHERE uh, value, and very basically the, the result of dividing the value by two should be equal to zero. Okay, so this is how you would do your pattern matching. If you say value in here, we can do the same thing that we did earlier and say value history and the, you only get the values of two and four in here. Okay, so that's how you can have a word clause right after uh, your four statements. Now you can also map objects inside an array and mapping is also very important because it's one of the most useful functionalities of collections. Mapping means that you take the values inside that collection and you turn them into something completely different if you want to. Okay, so let's say numbers, you map them, you see, and it says, okay, I give you the number. So let's say value. And in here you can say, I return anything. In this case, we've decided to return an integer and we say value multiplied by two. Now you can all of a sudden see that numbers are two, four, six, and eight, whereas they were originally one, two, three, and four. So here you multiply them by, uh, by two. However, inside map, you can return anything. You can say, I actually return a string. Okay. And then you turn these, uh, into a string. You can string first multiply them by two, but then turn them into a string. Now you can see there are strings. So map allows you to map it to anything. All right. And now that we're talking about mapping it to anything, you can, you can guess that this map is indeed a generic function because it allows you to change the result value. And if you look at its signature, you can see it in, is it indeed giving you the elements inside the array, but it allows you to throw, to return anything 
and the result would be the array of that anything. Okay, so if I go and say let and values, you can see values is an array of, um, not in this case, but in this case, values will be an array of string. Okay, like this. So values is an array of string right now. And just a note about this, uh, maps don't necessarily have to be this complicated. I mean, um, to me, this, uh, and I actually can recommend this syntax more than I can recommend the next syn syntax I'm going to show you. And simply because the more information you give to the Swift compiler, the faster your code compiles in larger applications. But if you have very simple applications, you don't have to do uh, this much syntax uh, work in Swift. You could literally just uh, say, okay, first of all, I don't want to give you, I don't want to tell you what return value I have. And Swift still is happy with that. You can also remove this in here because Swift already knows the value is an integer. Okay. And this works as well. And you can completely remove that. And instead of value, use dollar zero. And that works as well. Uh, so your code could pretty much just look like this. But again, I mean, this does work, but it is it has very little information about what that code is actually doing internally. So a new newbie software developer may be quite confused by it. And also, as I said, this is more information to the compiler, which allows it to compile your uh, complicated codes in the future a little bit faster as well. Okay. Apart from mapping arrays, you can also filter them, meaning that you want to grab specific values out of this array. You could say numbers, then you filter and you say you get the value and you turn a return a boolean for all the objects that have to be included in the result of this filter function so you say if the value is greater than or equal to three then it should be returned from the result and you can see the result is three and four okay so that's how filter works you can also do compact mapping and compact mapping mapping is similar to map but it returns an optional and the values that are returned from this compact map, which are nil, will not be included in the result. So it's a compact map is a combination of map and filter. OK, so let's have a look at that. We say numbers compact map and we say we get the value as an integer and we return a string. OK, an optional string. Remember, it should be optional. Optionality indicates uh, filtering. So if it is nil, it won't be included in the resulting uh, array. Then we say if a value is divisible by two, then return the string of that value. Otherwise, return nil. So let's break it down into separate lines. So it's a little bit more readable. OK, so you can now see the result is an array of strings that only includes two and four, but it doesn't include three and one or one and three, basically. OK, so compact map, when you see it, just know that is a, is a combination of map and filter at the same times. Now, arrays in Swift can also contain the value of nil. So let's say numbers, uh, numbers two, and it is an array of optional integers. So meaning that it can contain not just integers, but also nil. Then you can say one, two, and then nil, four and five. So this is completely fine. All right. And then if you say numbers two dot count, you will actually see it is five because nil is one of the elements, one of the valid elements inside this array. And if you want to grab all the values inside this numbers array and that are not nil, then you would say let's not nils is equal to numbers two filter. So you basically say, here's my integer and I return a Boolean for all the values that are not nil. Then you could say, um, let's say it's value its name is value then we say value shouldn't be nil like this all right and you can see the result of this is just one two four and five all right however however uh, this you will be like okay we've checked that the values are not nil and we've placed them inside this uh, array so this array should now be an array of integers but that's not correct because if you look at this, is is still an array of optional integers. So what happened in here is that though we checked for nil values, but we didn't tell uh, this. Um, so basically, filter doesn't allow you to change the data type. All right, you can see it always returns the same array of of the same element type. So if our elements is optional integer, the result of this function will in, indeed be optional integers as well. In order to grab the non null uh, or not nil values out of this array and also change the data type, you have to use compact map. 
all right so um so you could say in here not nils is numbers two and we say compact map and we say we take the integer uh, which is value and we actually return an optional integer as well and just return the same value all right if this value is nil it won't be included uh, in the result and also it won't uh, basically uh, change the data type so not nils is now not an array of optional integers okay i know it's complicated and it's uh, a lot of generic code but it really requires that you work with these uh, functions yourself to for it to basically click now arrays can also include uh, instances of the same object multiple times so if you say numbers uh, three and we say one two one two you can see that numbers three that count is indeed four so it contains four objects it doesn't check whether they are unique or not okay arrays can also they don't necessarily have to include home homogeneous uh, objects so they can be heterogeneous meaning that you can have integers and strings uh, mixed up and blended up in the same array so let's say let's stuff one and we say it is an array of it has an integer of one then it has hello then it has an integer of two and has a string of world but this will give us an error or it should because it says uh, it is not a homogeneous array all right and it says it's heterogeneous so in order to fix this you can see swift is telling you to actually add as any to the end of this array and a uh, collection literal could only be what is it saying uh, as an array of any and i mean this to me looks fine uh, but I'm, sh I'm not sure really what is the same collation literal could only be inferred to any add explicit type annotation. Um, I believe we've already done that. So I'm not really sure what it is complaining about. Let's just say stuff one and see if Swift has understood what this code is actually doing. Uh, expected separator. Did I miss a separator somewhere? Let's stuff one. To me, this looks fine, but not sure really what it is complaining about. Let me just bring it in here and then we say, hello, let's put all of these in. Oh, because I've missed a comma in here, I can see. Okay, sorry about that. So I, I missed a comma in there. So now you can see our array looks fine. And if I say stuff one count, it should include the count of four in here. Okay, there are four objects. So this is a trick to get your array to include heterogeneous objects as well. All right, so, um, we can also go ahead and uh, change the syntax for this. So if I copy this and paste it in here and change this to stuff two, and then stuff two count. If you don't want to have this as in here, you can also tell Swift that this is in fact an array of any by doing this column in here, just specifying the data type right there. Okay, so that's another way of achieving achieving the same result. Now that we've talked enough about arrays let's talk about uh, sets a set is a special object it's a special collection that only contains unique values all right and the way it calculates uh, uniqueness is based on uh, hash values and equality all right and this is a little bit complicated a lot of people think it's just hash value but it is not it's also equality which is very important to understand what sets so let's create a set we say unique numbers and then we say it is a set of the values one, two, one, two, and three. All right. And then we say unique numbers uh, count, and then unique numbers map them to their minus values. Let's just see what values we get in here. You see, after the creation of this set, the set only includes the values of three, one, and two. So two things are quite interesting about this is that uh, it removed the duplicates. So both twos were not included only one instance was included and the same thing with the value of one only one instance was included so that's one thing that is interesting about creation of this set or and one of the properties that's important about sets it only includes unique numbers and the other one is that this array that we just passed to it its ordering was completely changed within the set so sets in swift cannot guarantee uh, ordering as you pass the ordering to it so the ordering could just be mishmashed and the set will order the items as it pleases all right so uh sets uh can also contain nils so we can go ahead in here just like arrays so let's say my numbers is a set of one two three and nil and five and then we say uh, let's not nil numbers if we want to get the not nil numbers then we say it is a set of my numbers 
and then we compact map this guy, a compact map, and we grab only the current value you can see in here, compact mapping. Let's actually break it down into separate lines. So it is more readable like this and like this. All right. So we're just taking the same values which are inside my numbers, returning the, returning them from compact map. Compact map, what it does is if the values are nil, it removes them from their result. And you can see the result of compact map inside a set. It is an array of the values. And that is the reason we're putting it inside another set because we want the re return value to be a set as well. All right. And then we say not nil numbers in here. You can see in here we have five where is it? Uh, two, three, nil, one, five. But in, in there, we have only three, two, one, and five. So nil was removed essentially by calling compact map on that set. Okay. Now you can also create heterogeneous sets, just like you can create heterogeneous uh, arrays. So a set doesn't necessarily have to only have integers, for instance. So the, the trick to do that is to create a set of a, a protocol called any hashable. All right, so you say stuff three, for instance, and we say this is a set of any hashable, and you can look at the code for any hashable. Sorry, it's not a protocol, it's a structure. And we say um, it is equal to uh, one, two, three, and then bounded. All right, then we can say stuff three count. You will see that includes four values. All right, so this is the trick to create a heterogeneous sets as well. Now, uh, if you want to extract specific items, uh, like of specific types out of uh, any of these sets or arrays, uh, let's just focus on the sets right now. Actually, let's have a look at our stuff one. You can see our stuff one is an array at the moment. And uh, that is an array of any. But if you want to grab specific objects out of this array, which are of specific types, for instance, only the strings or only the integers, you can use a, a keyword which is called as. So let's say let ints in stuff one. And again, remember stuff one is this array. It has integers and strings and you only want to grab the integers out of them. So then you could say ints in stuff one is stuff one and then you compact map. All right, remember, compact map does map and filter at the same time. Then you get your value, which is any, and you want to optionally return an integer. Then you say value as int. So you compare the values type to an integer and optionally return it if it is integer. Okay. And then you can see in here that the result of this is only your integers. And you can do the same thing with strings. So you can say, okay, let's copy this. And then we say strings in stuff one, and then you get the value and you optionally return a string. And then you say, as long as the data type is a string, I return it. Okay. Then you get the hello world printed in here. Okay. So if you, if you are uh, comfortable doing this with arrays, then you're probably also comfortable doing that with sets. And uh, it is very similar. It's actually compact map on sets as well. So let's copy this code ints in stuff one. And then we say ints in stuff three. And remember stuff three is a set. Then we go in here and we say stuff three and we compact map and the value is any hashable hashable and then we optionally return an int and then we get their result printed to the screen which is two three one uh, you can see one two three van dot so van dot was essentially removed from this set but one thing to note about this is that as i mentioned before compact mapping on a set doesn't return a set it actually returns a, an array so uh, if you go in here and call type of which is an internal function in Swift and say, give me the type of ints in stuff three. It will tell you that this hopefully is, did it crash? It will tell you it's an array. It's not a set anymore. Though stuff three was a set, uh, you can see in here is a set, but the result of compact mapping a set is an array. Okay. So just keep that in mind. Now, now that we talked about sets a little bit and we talked about that they can contain that only that they only contain a unique objects, then the question is, how does it calculate uniqueness? And and the way it does it is using a protocol called Hashable. Now, Hashable, a lot of people think that only thing it does is it contains a some sort of a hash value, is some sort of an in integer value that uniquely identifies every object. But it but Hashable protocol 
in itself also includes equality. All right. So uh, without without actually me talking too much about that, let's have a look at an example. So let's just say we create a person struct in here, struct person. And then we say we have an ID. So every person has an identifier. We have a name of string and then we have an age of integer as well. OK, and then we want this person to be able to instances of this person to be able to be included inside sets. OK, so uh, without making um, without making this person hashable, let me show you what will happen if it is not hashable and you try to create a set out of it. So let's say that we have a foo ID in here and we say it is a UUID. Then we say let foo is a person with the ID of foo ID. Its name is foo and its age is 20. All right. Then we create a bar person in here and we say bar is pretty much similar to foo and we say bar, but we forget to change the ID and bar is also using the foo ID. Its name is bar and its age is 30. All right. Now we want to go ahead and create uh, a set of foo and bar. So let's say we have people and we say it is a set of person and is equal to foo and bar. Now we should get an error ideally from Swift telling us that these objects are not hashable. You can see it says does not conform to protocol hashable. All right. So how do we do that? How do we ensure that they conform to hashable? So let's go ahead and say that they conform to hashable and everything will just go fine. Nothing will happen in here. You won't get any errors. OK. And if you go in here and say people that count, Let's go in here. OK, you will see, unfortunately, it is still two. So what happened in here? We said that, well, we uh, are making this person hashable and it should ideally not be placed twice in this set because uh, it is pretty much the same. But if you look, I mean, same data. But what happens in here is two things. When you when you create a structure and you just say it is hashable without having any custom logic in it, meaning that you didn't actually tell Swift how to calculate the uniqueness of this object. What Swift does is that it looks at all the properties of that object and says, OK, are all these properties uh, unique themselves? Like, are they hashable? And if you look at UUID is indeed hashable. If you look at string, uh, it is hashable. Uh, let's see, uh, extension uh, string hashable. Somewhere it should have been made hashable. I'm not sure if it is exactly. There we go, extension string hashable. And also if you look at the code for int, it should also be extension int hashable. There we go. So since all these three are hashable, then Swift says, OK, I'm going to calculate the hash value myself. Then it says, OK, you created a person. It has the ID. Let's just say its hash value uh, is one, let's say. Then it says, oh, the name is foo. The hash value is, for instance, 10. I'm just making this up, OK? And the hash value for this guy, let's say, is 20. All right. Then it comes to bar and says, oh, it has the same ID as the other ones which is, has a hash value of one, but its, it's uh, name is bar. So its hash value is, let's just say 30. And the age is also 30 with a hash value of 40, for instance, okay? So it says, okay, then you put both of these inside a, a set and I'm gonna calculate these hashes 20 plus 10 plus one, for instance, okay? This is not how hashes are actually calculated, but we're just gonna plus them together. So 20, 10, and one are gonna be 31. And then we have 40, 30, and one, which is gonna be 71. So uh, 31 and 71 are not the same, meaning that they're basically not the same object and should both be placed inside this set, okay? So that's how hashing basically works within Swift, okay? But what we may want to do is to tell Swift that, hey, we actually don't want uh, people with the same ID to uh, be recognized as different people. So what we want to tell Swift is that if two people have the same ID, then they're essentially the same person. OK. And in order to give Swift more information about how it should do our hashing, we should go ahead and basically implement the hash functionality somehow ourselves, or at least inject our own logic within it. So let's create a person to object in here. So a, a person to structure. So now that we've seen that example, let's say a struct person to, okay. And we're going to grab, let's actually grab this struct from here, but instead we're just going to call it person to. 
So person two in here, we said that it is hashable. Now, if you make an object hashable, you also have the ability to override a function in here and not really override, but also implement actually a function called hash into. All right. And this function comes in here because we have, we've uh, conformed to the hashable protocol. All right. Then in here, what you can do is to say hasher and then you combine, you call the combine function on it, and then you basically hash the fields that you want to be taken into account while Swift does its hashing. So what this really did in here is that it jumped over hashing name and age and instead only hashed ID within the hashing mechanism of Swift, all right? So now that you've done that, you also need to tell Swift whether two objects are equitable because you've just implemented your own hashing functionality and when you say something is hashable, by default, it's also equitable. And what happens in here is that right now you set that take ID only into hashing mechanism. But in terms of equation, because hashing is also doing equality, Swift, uh, if you don't intervene, Swift goes and it says, okay, the hash values are the same, but these two objects are not really equal because by default, Swift is gonna also equate all three properties. So in here, what we're gonna do is to say static func equality. So we're gonna override equality as well. On the left-hand side, we say self, and the right-hand side is self. Then we say Boolean, and we say as long as the left-hand side's ID is equal to the right hand size ID, then these two objects are equal. So not only have we changed the way uh, hashing works, but we also need to change the way equality works. Otherwise they won't really uh, um, come to an agreement with each other, okay? Now that we have that, let's go ahead and create a, a Baz ID in here and we say it's a UUID, all right? And then we say we create a Baz person in here, which is person two. Remember, create an object of type person two, not person. Then we say Baz ID. Its name is Baz. And then we say it has, uh, or he has the age of 20, or she has the age of 20. Then we create a Cox uh, value in here and we say QUX. And we say person two. And then we say uh, Baz ID. And the name is Cox and the age is 30. All right, so you can see now the ID is the same, but all the other values are different. However, the way we've done our hashing and equality is that we only take into account the ID. So even if their names are different, but they're using the same ID, then we consider them to be the same person. And that's why you can go in here, if say if Baz equal to Cox, they are equal. So this basically is invoking our equality and you can see it comes in here, okay? But that's not the point. That's not what we're trying to do in here. We actually want to add them to a set. So let's say let people people two, and we create a set of Baz and Cox in here. And if you look at the values inside people two, it should just be one value, people two that count. All right. Simply because our hashing intervene in here, and the, both these objects were considered to be the same object. All right, and if you take the first item out of this, you can get a person, person two, and then you can say the first object's uh, name, give us the name, all right? And you can see it is Baz, all right? So uh, Cox was not inserted into our set simply because Baz was already there and Cox was considered to be the same object, therefore it was not inserted into the set, all right? So that's how you can go ahead and implement your own um, hashing, uh, value or hash value and equality all right that's enough about sets let's talk now about dictionaries now dictionaries they're also called json objects in many other programming languages like like as such as um not really json objects yeah well kind of json objects yeah they're they're keys and values basically okay and you define them using a square bracket in um in swift so you say user info and you can create your dictionary and then you say keys are in this case string for instance with a column and you separate the keys from the values using a column and you can say the key is name the value is foo this key is age and oops if i can spell age and its value is 20. then you can say i have an address field in here whose value is indeed another dictionary and you can say the address has a line one and is address line one then we have a postcode, for instance, its key is postcode and its value is one, two, three, four, five, let's say, all right. And this is completely valid uh, Swift object. If I haven't messed anything up, let's see foo 
age address. All right. And we also have to tell Swift that uh, you can see it is uh, heterogeneous uh, values because some values are strings and some values are integers. Then we have to tell Swift that it's a dictionary with keys equal to string and values of any type. All right. Without that, it won't work. However, if we didn't have this age in here and we didn't have this address in here, we could have just gone away by defining our dictionary like this and Swift would have understood the data type to be of keys, strings and values of strings as well. But since we have keys of string and value of integer and a key of string and a value of a dictionary, then we have to tell Swift that the keys are string and values could be anything basically. Now you can grab values out of your dictionaries using type uh, using subscripting. So you say user info, grab the name, and you can see it will give you the value of foo in here. You can say, give me the age, user info, give me the age. So you're basically giving it the keys and you're extracting the values for those keys. Now you can say user info and then give me the address. Let's go in here, address, address. All right. And since this is an address dictionary coming back from here, you may be hoping that, okay, since this is an entire dictionary, maybe I can type a key in here as well and get the postcode. All right. And if you do this, then you get an error because you've told Swift that the values that come out of this uh, dictionary are of type any, meaning that Swift just believes that this is any. And now you're trying to tell Swift that this is not any and is in fact a dictionary and it should go into that dictionary and, ex and extract a value with a specific key and Swift just rejects that, okay? There's a dangerous way of doing that, forcing Swift to believe that this in itself is a dictionary and that is using the as syntax. Uh, but please don't ever do this in production applications. Uh, there, there are better ways of doing this. So I just want to show you how it works. You can say, get the address and force cast it to a dictionary of type string and string. You can see it because this has keys of string and, uh, and uh, values of type string as well. Okay. So after doing that, uh, then you can go ahead and say, give me the postcode on it. All right. And this should, this should work, but in production applications really is not a good idea uh, to do this. So let's see what happened. I accidentally found nil one on unwrapping optional value. And I think it's because I, I misspelled address basically. So it works, but you should never do this because this will crash your application should this key either not exist or that its value shouldn't be of type string or string, your application will crash. So please uh, don't do this. I'm just showing you so that you know this syntax also exists, okay? If you want to extract the keys and values out of a dictionary, you can say user info dot keys. And also you can say user info dot values. And this will give these, this will give you the keys only. You can see in here, Let's go in here. The keys are age, address, and name, and the values are 20. Let's go here, 20, foo, uh, which is, let's see where it is. It is 20, foo, and then this dictionary. So you grab basically only the keys or only the values out of your dictionary using that uh, syntax. However, it is more common that instead of just saying keys and values, you want to enumerate over the keys and values and their associated values. You can because you can see in here, we're only saying keys and only values. But what if you want to grab every key and its associated value? The syntax for it is for key and value in user info. Then you can print them out key and value like this. OK, let's see if the playground can help us extract these values. So. And the key it says name, value, history. You can see age, address, and name are the keys. And the values, we can also perhaps get their history. Let's see, value. Uh, ooh, it's, oh, the playground isn't so smart in being able to print the values. So let's instead print the values and see if we can get them in the console. Uh, like this. So here are the values basically. Okay. And you can also print the keys as well. So let's say we print the keys and we print the value. So uh, the key of address has this value. The key of name has this uh, foo value and the key of age has the value of 20. All right. So we can do that as well. Let's just revert them back to how they were. Okay. Now you can also have a where clause in your enumeration over keys and values. So let's say for key and value in user info where the value is an integer. Okay. And then you can say key and value. So you see the only uh, 
value that was an integer had the key of h and it, the value was of course the value of 20 all right now you can also have uh, multiple word clauses so you're not limited to only one word clause so you can say for key and value in user info where uh, the value is an int and a uh, key that count so the key is a string and we're saying it should contain only two uh, more than two uh, characters then we say give us the key and the value all right so the count is pretty much the length of the of the key and then you can see that we got uh, the same result because age uh, is three uh, letters long and our condition said it should be more than two. But if in here we said more than three, then this will never be called. So we won't get any results in here. OK, so I think that's actually quite enough right now about collections. We talked about arrays. We talked about sets and we talked about also dictionaries and some new formats and pattern matchings that you can do with these collections. They're very, very useful. And I think you need to really get uh, get quite handy with these objects yourselves uh, in order to get a good grasp of how they work. I can just sit here and explain these for ages but without practice uh, probably it will never really click so my advice is to go ahead and create some sets arrays and dictionaries yourselves to get a good grasp of how they work now that we talked about collections it is good time that we start talking about equality and hashing as well i mean we did touch upon this topic a little bit right now but we haven't fully covered them equality and hashing they're like their own whole world of understanding how they truly work and basically understanding them is the key to understanding how sets for instance work and how equation generally in swift works and uh, so i think it's very important that we dedicate it's um, a, a whole section just to equality and hashing so um, that's what we're going to do right now so i'll see you there let's then go ahead and create a separate playground for this so we say um blank and foreground uh, sorry playground and we say um, equality and hashing like this and ensure that you're creating it in the root folder like this and then we just say create and we import foundation and we can get rid of the explorer to the left hand side now equality in swift is provided using a protocol called equitable any object that conforms to the equitable pro uh, protocol has to have a function a static function uh, which is an e equality function like this which is pretty much an operator and this function has to have two arguments one a left hand side and right hand side both of the same exact type as the current structure or class implementing it now, if you go ahead and create a person uh, structure in here and say that this person is conforming to the equitable <clears throat> protocol and you say let ID is a string and then you say let name is a string, then we create two instances of this. We say let foo one is a person with the ID of one. All right. And then we say the name, name here is foo. Then we create foo two. Uh, right here and we say the name is actually bar then if you say if foo1 foo1 is equal to foo2 then we say they are equal with an exclamation mark in here because they shouldn't be they are not equal otherwise okay so what happens in here is that by ensuring that this person is uh, equitable right let's also make sure that this is running automatically by conforming the struct uh, person to equitable as Swift goes in through all the properties of the structure and ensures that they are indeed themselves equitable. String by default conforms to the equitable protocol and so does this one. So then Swift says, okay, then I understand that it should be equitable. However, if you go in here and say a struct dog and don't make it equitable, and in here you say this person should also have a dog, all of a sudden Swift will throw an error in here saying that, oh, I can't give you equal equitable by default because dog, which is one of the properties of this person structure does not conform to equitable if you want to get rid of this just ensure that this dog is also equitable which then gets rid of the problem in here but the only problem we have in here that is that we need to pass a dog instance in here but we're going to remove all this dog reference in here just wanted to show you how e default implementation of equitable basically works it looks at all the properties and then make sure that they're equitable and then goes through all of them one by one compares the properties between these two objects that we're comparing okay
Now, you can also override equality and uh, you can basically say, let's say that you, in your person uh, structure, you want to say any two persons that have the same identifier should be considered equal. So then you can say extension person and you can see at the moment these two objects right now before our extension they're marked as not equal all right simply because their names are not equal but if you go to extension person and then define this static fun equal equal like this and you say left hand side is self like this and right hand side is self as well and this function should return a boolean indicating whether the two objects are equal or not then we say if the left hand side's id is equal to right hand side's id then these two should be considered equal now all of a sudden you see that this will be flipped to they are equal previously before this extension this uh, branch of code was being executed because by default they were not equal since they had different names however with our extension in place since we're only comparing the ids then they're marked as equal so if you comment your code out you can see all of a sudden that this branch will stop being executed and instead this branch will get executed all right so that's how you can create your own equality on custom objects so we can comment this guy out Apart from structures, you can also implement custom equality on enumerations. Let's say that we have an enum in here we call animal type, and we have a case for a dog, and we ask for the breed, and also we have a cat, and we ask for the breed, okay? Now, let's say that you want to compare these um, to with each other. If you go ahead and say let dog, and say is an animal with a type of dog, with its breed is a labradoodle. And then you say let uh, whiskers is an animal type, another dog basically exactly of the same type. Then if you go ahead and say if dog equal to whiskers, let's just change this to maybe dog two, dog one and dog two. And then we say if dog one equal to dog two like this you can see then you get an error from swift because by default the animal type is not equitable you can go ahead in here and say okay well i'll make it equitable does this work you'll be surprised to see that actually by default what swift does is it looks at these values and says let me let's put some values in here and say they are equal like this otherwise we say else they are not equal all right so since dog one and dog two we actually are giving them the same values in here then swift by default says oh they're equal but if you change the value inside this breed for instance then swift says they're not equal so swift does the same thing that it does with structures as it does with enums it goes through all the properties of those enum cases and then make sure that they're equitable if they are, it will just call the equation function on those parameters as well and compares them with each other. If all those are equal to each other and the case is equal to the other case as well, then the enum cases are marked as equal. However, you can go ahead and change this uh, implementation. So you can say extension, uh, extension animal type, and let's just remove the equitable from here. And we say animal type becomes equitable in this extension. All right. And then we go ahead and implement a, an extension, uh, sorry, the static func, left hand side itself and right hand side itself as well. And then in here we say bool. All right. So now what we want to do in here is to compare the breeds with each other. So we say we switch the left hand side and the right hand side. Then we say in case we have a dog with the left, left hand side breed and another dog with the right hand side breed then they're considered equal as long as the left-hand side breed is equal to right-hand side breed. We do the same thing for a cat. So we say if we get a cat in here and a cat in here, then they're equal to each other as long as their breeds are equal. And since this pattern matching is the exact same thing between dog and cat, you can see they're getting left-hand side breed, right-hand side breed, and the same thing in here. You can remove this code in here and just put a comma and remove this case as well. All right, so they're basically doing the same thing. And then you can go ahead and say anything else, they're considered not equal to each other, okay? So as long as it's a dog and a dog and their breeds are the same, then it's considered to be the same. And if it's a cat and a cat, then they're considered to be the same as well. So let's see what we got. Uh, we got this. Oh, we have to return this, of course. We, we can't just write that statement in the playground. Good, then we can go ahead and um, Basically, we, we've now created an animal type. Let's go ahead and create an animal now. So we say struct and we say animal, animal in here, animal. 
and we said let's name is a string and then we say let's type is an animal type okay and since both string and animal type by this point are equitable you can make this animal also uh, conform to equitable all right however what we want to do is to say okay the animal equality has to only look at the animal type we don't want it to look at the animal name that is the default behavior that Swift looks at all the properties. But in this case, we just want to look at the animal type. All right. So let's say that then we override the static, oops, static func equal equal. And we say left hand side is self and right hand side is self as well. And we return a Boolean. Okay. And we only look at the types. So we say left hand side type should be equal to right hand side type. Otherwise, they're not equal. Okay. Then we can go ahead and say let cat one is an animal and its name is whiskers like this. All right. And its animal type is actually a cat. Then we say it is a cat of type street cat of the breed street cat. OK, let's put that in here. And this is also a shorthand of writing um, the animal type. So instead of saying animal type in here, you can just say dot cat. So instead of doing this, you can just do the shorthand and Swift will understand the code anyways. Let's copy this code and then we say cat number two and its name is whoosh, okay, just like that. And it's also a street cat. So looking at our equality functionality in here, we only look at types on animal in order to, de to determine if they're equal to each other or not. So then we should be able to go and say if cat one is equal to cat two, they are equal because of their breed actually type because of their type else and uh, they are not equal all right and you can see that this branch of the code is being executed simply because our equality custom equality on animal only compares the animal types and since they have the exact same type of cat and street cat then our code works and you you can actually go and remove this implementation on animal type because this pretty much is the same thing that Swift provides, equitable, and you can see the code will be executed just like before. So no difference really. So it's up to you if you want to do custom implementation of equitable or you want to let Swift uh, deduce this on its own. If Swift can already deduce this on its own, which it can, you shouldn't really go and write an exact same implementation. So this, this is pretty much just redundant. But if your custom implementation of equitable adds some functionality to how Swift does it by default, then please go ahead and add your own equitable to your custom types. Okay. so. Uh, we can now, uh, we've had a look at equitable. Let's look at hashable. Uh, we've already talked about this a little bit before, but let's just talk a little bit more in details about it. Just like equitable, hashable also looks at all properties of a struct or class to make that struct or class hashable. So if you say struct house and we make it hashable, then we say let number is int and we say let number of bedrooms is an int. Then we say let house one is house with the number of one, two, three, and number of bedrooms is, let's say two, all right? And then we say house one, and you can see now you have a property in here called hash value, and that is coming from the hashable protocol in here. Then we go ahead and create another house. We call it house number two in here, okay, house two. And its number is one, two, three, but its number of bedrooms is three. And then we print out its hash value in here as well. Now you can see these hash values are different. Simply means that they basically, if you create a set with house one and house two, they can occupy their own space and not overwrite each other. However, if you go in here and say number of bedroom, it, bedrooms is two, then you should ideally in here see the exact same hash value, meaning that you cannot put both houses inside the same set and expect them both to basically appear in the set. One is going to overwrite the other one. Okay. So if we go ahead and create a set in here, we say let houses is a set of house one and house two. And please note that I changed this back. So it's now number of bedrooms two and this one is three. Then if we say houses dot count, then you can see we get two in here because none is overwriting the other one. Let's see if the playground is going to be able to update soon. Hopefully, even if it doesn't show the count, we can still see in here that we have one house in here and another one here. And now the count is also being displayed right there. OK, really good. You can overwrite the uh, how hashing, of course, works. We've already had a look at this and when we talk about collections, but let's have a look at another example. So we say a struct numbered house. OK, and we say it is hashable like this and we say let's number is int 
and then we say let's number of uh, bedrooms is an int and this is pretty much the copy of the house structure but we have to give it another name and uh, because you can't have two structures with the same name in the same code scope in swift okay then in here we're going to go and overwrite this uh, hashing mechanism so we say hash into and we say we only want to combine the number into the hasher so we say combine the number and this simply means that as long as two houses have the same number then they're the same house pretty much uh, when it comes to their hash values okay however this doesn't mean that they're equal you have to overwrite equality as well so say static funk equal and we say on the left hand side we get self and the right hand side we get self, self as well then we say this returns a boolean and then we say as long as the numbers so we say left hand side number is should be equal to right hand side number and then both houses are considered to be equal to each other in that case okay so let's create let house three and please make sure you create a numbered house in here not a house it's house number we say one two three and number of bedrooms is two okay so as a house number one two three then we create another house we call it house four in here okay like that and then we say it is a numbered house at the exact same number as this house however it has three bedrooms okay then we create a set of these we say houses at three and four it is a set of house three and house four and then if you look at houses three and four count you can see there's only one object inside this set simply because house three and four they can only consume the same space in our sets and simply because their hash value is the same you can see in here uh, let's see if playground is going to be able to update our codes hopefully soon if i close this one maybe it's just gone crazy a little bit uh, let's see automatically run hopefully it can run the code so you can see there's only one value in here and if you say houses three and four get the first item then it gives us a numbered house and then we can say get its house uh, number of bedrooms uh, and it says the number of bedrooms is two and the reason behind this is that house four could not be placed in the set simply because there was a house already in the set with the same hash value and you can also look at the house uh, three hash value and house four hash values and they should pretty much be the same simply because the hashing algorithm is only taking the house number into account so you can say house three uh, house three number dot hash value and it should pretty much be unique as well and you can see they're exactly the same thing okay and house four dot number hash value they're the same as the entire hash value of the house okay so that was another example now enums are by default hashable even without raw values so i'll show you in here we say enum car part car part like this and we say case the roof uh case tire and case trunk then in here we say let unique parts is a set of car parts okay and it's equal to a, a set that contains a roof uh, it contains tire it contains another roof and then a, a trunk so since this is a set of car parts and it doesn't have any raw values like we're not doing like this so they don't have raw values if you in here say unique part oh actually we can see the value already here you can see it only contains trunk roof and tire so it doesn't contain two roofs that's what I'm trying to get to. So if you create a simple enum in Swift without any raw values or any associated values, it's by default hashable and equitable. All right, that is the whole point. Now, uh, if you have an enum with, um, with associated values, then you can basically go ahead and change the hashing mechanism yourself. So let's say that we have an enum in here. We call it house type and uh, it has a big house and we say its associated value is a numbered house and we say case small house it is a numbered house like this and then you can go ahead in here and say this is hashable all right so as you do that swift looks at the properties that are inside this enum and it understands that oh this uh, big house is of course hashable because it's the enum case however it has an associated value then it looks at the associated value and says is this value hashable then it goes to numbered house and it says yep it is hashable then it implements hashable by default for you on this house type okay so then you can go ahead and um basically 
add these into um, some sort of a set. So let's go ahead and we say we create two big houses. We say big house number one is a house type, big house like this, and it has a numbered house inside it like this. All right. And this numbered house has a few properties. It has a number and we say number one and it is number of bedrooms is one as well. So we have a big house uh, at number one in that street, for instance, and it has one bedroom for some reason, a big house with one bedroom only. Then we say a big house number two in here. OK, let's get rid of this bottom bar. And then we say it is also a big house at number one and total number of bedrooms is one on that one as well. Then we create a small house. So we say small house one uh, like this small house one. It is a small house house and we say it is at number one as well. And its number of bedrooms is one. All right. So now we have three houses with the same number and Two of them are actually the same house type as well. So what's going to happen if we go and put these inside a set? So we say all houses is a set of house type and is equal to a set with a big house, uh, big house one, big house two and small house one. All right. So if you say all houses that count in here, then let's see if the playground can resolve this. You can see there's only two objects in here. The reason is that big house one and big house two are considered to have the same hash value simply because that their numbered houses have the same hash value and their cases have the same hash value. However, small house one is of type small house, not big house, though its numbered house has the same hash value as the other numbered houses. However, the enum case itself also has a hash hash value. Therefore, in here, you can see if I say all houses first and all houses Actually, let's see if we can get the values inside the sets like this. You can see we have a, uh, let's see. Oh, you can see the first one is a big house at number one. And if we say all houses last, uh, let's see if you can get the first. Does it have a last item? No, it doesn't. Uh, we can get the first, unfortunately. And let's just say for value in all houses. And then we type the value out in here. Let's maybe even print the value like this. So you will see then the first element inside all houses uh, is a numbered house, uh, is a small house with that numbered house. And the second one is a big house, meaning that the two big houses couldn't actually occupy two separate spaces in the set simply because their hash values are the same. OK, so I think that's actually enough right now about equality and hashing. We've talked quite a lot about them right now, and I think you get basically the idea. So there's two different things you have to implement when it or think about when it comes to equality hashing. One is the hash value, which determines whether two objects should consume the same space inside a set. But also you have to implement equality, which determines whether two objects are actually equal to each other. OK, and also you may sometimes just need objects to be equitable, not hashable, in, in which case you can just implement the equ equitable protocol or conform to the equitable protocol. As long as all the properties inside your structure or class are equitable, then you don't have to implement a custom equality static function. However, you can always go ahead and change the default implementation of both hashable and equitable as well. All right. Now we're done with equality and hashing. So let's start talking about custom operators. I'm going to close this playground in here. So let's create a new one, a blank playground Oops, like this. And then we call this one custom operators. All right. And we create the playground. And then we say import foundation like that. And then we can get rid of the Explorer to the left hand side like this. And we can run our playground automatically. Now we've talked about operators to this point uh, quite a bit, actually, but we haven't talked about creating so many custom operators. And that's what we're going to do in this section of the code. So let's say that you have a first name, uh, which is a string, uh, optional string. And you say it is actually equal to foo, though it is uh, set as being an optional string. And then you create a last name in here. Uh, and then you say bar. Now, if you want to get the full name uh, and you say, it should be equal to first name plus last name. You'll see that you get an error from Swift saying that this operator, it is not defined 
between, you can see there is no operator that exists that matches this particular signature, left-hand side optional string and right-hand side optional string. If these were not optional strings, then you would have this operator. You can see then the error goes away. Let's see if we can get the definition of, actually for this one, uh, plus operator. I don't think we can, unfortunately. Let's see, uh, static func plus. Here we go, there is that function signature. All right. However, uh, the Swift uh, Foundation framework hasn't defined uh, the same operator for optional strings. So we can actually go ahead and do that ourselves. So let's say we have a func plus and its left-hand side is an optional string and its right-hand side is an optional string as well. And it returns an optional string. Okay, then we go inside the function implementation and we switch the left hand side and the right hand side. If they are both none, meaning that they're both null, then we return nil, or actually not null, but nil. Uh, Swift is one language that has chosen to use nil instead of null. Then we say, okay, if then we get uh, the left hand side, so if we say case let, we have some value on the left hand side but no values to the right hand side, then we return the value to the left hand side. So if you only have the first name, but not the last name, then we return the first name as the full name. We do the opposite of this for last name as well. So if the first name is is nil, but the right hand side has the value, meaning that there is a, is a family name, then we say return that value. All right. And we can join these two, two together like this because they have the same pattern. Okay, and then we say um, if both of them have a value, so we say some left hand side and some, if I can spell, some right hand side, then we say return the left hand side plus the right hand side. Okay, as soon as you're done writing this function, you can see all of a sudden the errors go away and all of a sudden full name is indeed equal to foo bar. All right, so um, we can also add a space in here, perhaps, or add a space before bar, so it becomes foo plus bar right here. Okay, so that's how you can create a simple custom operator in Swift. Okay, and I think we've actually looked at something similar to this before, maybe even something more complicated. All right, now we haven't yet created our own unary prefix operator. This one was a binary infix operator because it works with two or binary things, two things, therefore binary. So this is a binary infix. It is binary because it works with two operators, uh, sorry, with, with two parameters, and is an infix operator because it sits in between two values, okay? However, we haven't looked at unary prefix operators. So let's create a unary prefix operator. Let's have a look at an example. Let's say that we have a lowercase name in here, which is equal to foo bar, and we wanna turn it into uppercase name by saying lowercase name, uppercase like this. And this operator doesn't exist at the moment. So you can see it is, we want to say unary, unary prefix. It is unary because it only works with one argument to its left left hand side. And that's why it is called prefix because it is, it basically works with some, actually, no, that is a, that is a suffix. I would say that we need to move this here. Okay, so this is a unary prefix because it uppercases whatever it comes to its right hand side. So prefix because it is previous to the argument to its right hand side. Okay, so what we can do then is to go ahead and implement this operator. But before doing that, uh, since it is not an infix operator, you actually have to Swift. You have to tell Swift that it is a prefix operator. So you do that by saying prefix operator. It, like this. So you first tell Swift that this is a prefix operator. Then you go ahead and define a function for it. So you say prefix func like this. Oopsie daisy. All right. And then we work with a value of type string and we return a value of type string. Then we take the value and we say uppercased. Oopsie daisy. Uppercased like that. Now all of a sudden you can see that this error will go away and our foobar value will turn into foobar as uppercase. Okay, so that, that is how you do a prefix operator um, in Swift. You have to first define it as a prefix operator, then you create the function for it. Similar to this, we can also create a unary postfix operators. So let's say that we have, for instance, um, uh, a name here, which is foobar, and we want to turn it into uh, star, 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 foobar, star, 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 like that. Okay, so whatever string we give our operator, we wanted to prefix it with three stars and a space and then a space and three stars after it. 
okay so we say let with stars is equal to lowercase name and then make sure you star it out so we want a unary postfix operator it is unary because it works only with one object to so its left hand side and therefore it's called postfix because it comes after the element that it works with so let's define it we say postfix operator uh, star and then we say postfix func star it takes a value of type string and it returns a string as well and what it does is that it just says star 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 space value star 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 okay and then you can see the value printed here will then be star 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 foobar space star 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 okay so you can also define your own custom binary infix operators on completely unrelated types so it uh, what we've looked at so far is that every time you work with a binary infix operators, both left hand side and right hand side were of the same type. However, what happens if you have, for instance, a struct in here? Let's say we have a struct of person and we say let name is a string. And then you have a struct family and then you say let members is an array of persons. Okay. Then you go ahead and you say uh, that you, for instance, have a mom. Let mom is person with the name of mom. Then we create a dad in here, dad. We say dad. And then we say son. Son is son, like that. Then we create daughters. So we say daughter one, and it is daughter one and daughter two all right now what we want to do in here is to say um, we want to create a family we say family uh, like this is mom plus dad so mom and dad create a family together however this operator at the moment is not defined swift doesn't understand what plus between two persons means so we can go ahead and actually define that so we say we have a function in here we say func plus on the left hand side we take a person you see person and right hand side another person so we say a left hand side person and we say right hand side person and i completely understand that we said left hand side and right hand side are probably going to be different types and we've so far created binary infix operators with the same types for both parameters and we're going to do something different now so you're probably asking yourself so why aren't we doing something different but before we do that different thing that we're going to do we have to first implement this function you'll see soon okay so we first say if you create if you add two persons together we create a family all right then in here we say we create a family with members equal to uh, this let's create these in separate lines like that the members are at the left hand side and the right hand side okay now all of a sudden you can see this error will go away and then you get a family in here okay so that's one thing now what happens if you then go ahead and say uh, for instance family family with son is equal to family plus son hmm does this work no it won't because the left hand side of this operator is a family and the right hand side is a person and what we've defined is plus between two persons, not a family and a person. So what we're gonna do is to go ahead and say func plus, on the, on the left hand side, we're gonna take in, uh, we're gonna take in a family, all right? So we're gonna say on the left hand side, we have family, and the right hand side, we have a person. And this returns also a new family. Then we go ahead and we say, we take uh, the current family's members, family members, then we append to it the current uh, person to the right hand side then we create a new family and return it with the given members like this all right and then you can then see that this error will also go away so you can say family dot members dot count and then in here you say family with son members dot count which should be one more than this family you can see it's three okay now, what if you want to say family with daughters? So let's say family with daughters. And then you say, okay, take the family with the son and then add a whole array of daughters to this. So you say daughter one and daughter two, or uh, sorry, not an array of daughters, but an array of person. You'll get an error now because we still don't have an operator that can work on a, an object on the left-hand side of type family and an object on the right-hand side of type an array of person but we can go ahead and define that okay so we can say func plus on the left hand side we take a family and the right hand side we take an array of persons and this guy returns a family 
All right. So the way to do it is to say var members again, members equal to left hand side members. Then we say members, burrs, burrs, append contents of the right hand side. Okay. And then we return a family, a new family with the new members like this. All right. So now you can see this error will also go away. And if you say family with daughters dot members dot count, then you should get the value of five printed to the console in here. Okay. So you can see how easy it is to rationalize about how operators should work in Swift. They're just simple functions, except for uh, unary infix and unary postfix, which you have to also create uh, these operator um, tags kind of, uh, or declarations. Uh, so this is the implementation of the operator and this is the declaration of the operator. Okay. So I think that is actually quite enough right now about uh, custom operators. In the next section, we're going to talk about some of the new features uh, inside Swift uh, for uh, basically concurrency and asynchronous Swift. And that is going to be the last section for this course. Uh, so uh, without further ado, let's just get started with it. I'm going to close this tab in here and then I'm going to create a new playground. And then let's say playground and we call it async Swift. All right. And we just say we want to import foundation. And here is one of the exceptions where we have to import three things. We say import also playground support and then we import uh, import concurrency concurrency like this and we're doing this playground support here simply because asynchronous code requires that our playground is active all the time and it doesn't just start from the beginning and ends uh, when the when it encounters the end of the file we just need the playground to stay alive simply because concurrent code and uh, and asynchronous code requires that kind of behavior because if you make an api call that takes three seconds to finish maybe before that api call is done your playground has already reached its end and it just terminates and you don't want that so let's go and say playground uh, support sorry, sorry playground page uh, dot current page and then we say uh, needs indefinite execution equal to true so if you're running your code on a macintosh and xcode then you have to do this but if you're on windows or linux and you're in visual studio code and just running your code using simple swift then you shouldn't really do this you should perhaps just create a simple uh, project that can have a main loop and then you can then execute your code inside that main loop that never ends okay uh, however if you're in a playground then you will need to do this on mac os all right now let's say that we want to create a simple asynchronous function in swift if you're already familiar with a dart for instance for flutter or python or rust you probably have already used tokyo perhaps in rust or uh, in dart you also have futures and um stream stream controllers you're probably already familiar with asynchronous code but if you're not i'll just quickly brief you on what it means it means if you have an asynchronous function it will not immediately return its result it can take any number of seconds or milliseconds to complete its work and return some value and perhaps it won't even return a value some asynchronous functions don't return a value okay so let's go ahead and create a simple dummy function in here which we call calculate full name so we say func calculate full name all right, then we say we have a first name, first name is string, and then we have a last name, which is a string. Then we say it is an async function, which returns a string, okay? So by creating this asynchronous function in here, you'll have the ability to basically delay the return of your result. So you can in here just say return hello, you could definitely do that, but that's not the point of async functions. This is a synchronous function not an asynchronous function a synchronous function returns its value immediately an asynchronous function might take some time before it returns its value so let's go ahead and say we try to await on a task uh, by sleeping for the duration of one second so this is how you would create a delay a fake delay in your function all right and we're using the try with question mark syntax in here because we're not throwing okay if this function throws then we didn't have to do that however we're saying that our function is an async function that doesn't throw let's also mark our uh, playground as automatically running so we say try and we say await 
and let's say cannot convert return expression okay and here then we can say return after waiting one second return the first name with a space and the last name as the result of this function all right that error is now going to go away now inside your playground if you want to call this asynchronous asynchronous function you have to create a task and then you can say let result one is equal to await on the result of calculating the full name the full name comes from the uh, values of foo and bar in here okay and you can see the result is actually foo bar all right it waited before it calculated the value for us then we can also go ahead i mean you can see in here we have let result equal to await but there is another syntax word in swift which is called async let uh, and you can say async let result two is calculate uh, so you can see how async is before the let and then we say take foo bar again as the values and in here if you want to if you want to wait for the result of this you have to await on it so, so you say await result too now async let is a little bit more special because it creates a child task as part of this task you can read about it in swift evolution on github and so i won't go too much into it but it is kind of similar to this guy uh, but it has a little bit difference in like how you await on it because some developers think maybe that oh this by default awaits on this but it doesn't okay you have to await on the result yourself manually okay so that's how you can create a simple task an asynchronous task and then do some async and await code inside it in swift now we can go ahead and put together maybe an example that talks about async and async let and task all together just to uh, make it stick a little bit more okay so let's say we create a cloth enum in here and we say we have case socks we have shirt and trousers all right then let's create some asynchronous functions in here so we say the first function that we have is called buy socks all right and it is an async function that throws and we say it returns a cloth and what it does is it says try await on a task by sleeping for a duration of one second and the reason this function throws is that we're not doing try like this if we did try with a question mark we didn't have to throw okay but we're doing just normal try therefore the function has to throw or it has to be inside a do but what we're indicating to the outside world by writing this function is saying that this function is an asynchronous function that can internally actually throw an error so be careful while consuming its value all right then we return a cloth of type socks so after one second we produce an item of clothing after doing this one we can go ahead and create another function which is called by shirt like this and it produces an item of clothing and in in here we just say shirt all right and we can create another one that produces an item of trousers so we say trousers and it says dot trousers all right so they're very similar to each other they just return a different result of them. now you want to create a structure in here that uh, is an ensemble an ensemble is a um, you can say it is a collection of clothing clothes items uh, and you can say a struct ensemble all right and then we say this guy has clothes in it and we say it is an array of clothes and it has a total price price of type double all right doesn't really matter what the currency for the price is we also want this ensemble to be printable to the console in a very nice format so we conform it to custom debug string convertible protocol and therefore we have to implement a new variable here called debug description like this we make it a computed property and then we say clothes equal to clothes and we say price is equal to total price so the value that you produce in here will then be printed to the debug console whenever you try to debug a, an instance of this ensemble structure okay now we create a function in here called by whole ensemble like this and we say it it's an async function that throws and it produces an ensemble in here okay then we should go ahead and buy all our uh, parts so we say async let socks is buy socks async let uh, shirt is buy shirt and async let trousers is buy trousers all right so since all of these are async lets then we need to await on them and also we should also uh, sorry not also also twice now we came four times <laughs> uh, so what we want to do is to go and create an ensemble so we say let ensemble 
ensemble is an instance of ensemble and it says okay give me the clothes and you probably think okay i'm just going to give it socks shirt and trousers but you can't do that because these are async let items you have to await on them so just type await and then we go ahead in here we say socks uh, shirt trousers but since these guys are also throwing functions you have to try them okay so you say try 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 and then for the total price we're going to say the total price is 200 okay there we go and then we can return the ensemble like this now all these errors are hopefully gonna go away soon there we go now you can uh, to test this you create a task in your playground and then you can say if let uh, ensemble is equal to try uh, await on buy whole ensemble then you can say ensemble is this otherwise something went wrong like that all right and then you can see our ensemble uh, debug description will be printed to the screen it says clothes are this let's see if you can get the entire clothes maybe we could print it even so print it's a little bit easier perhaps to read it here uh, there we go so it says is a shirt is a socks trousers and also the price is 200 dollars let's say okay now async let can only be used within asynchronous closures and asynchronous functions or wherever there is a task being run so you cannot use asynchronous uh, async let within uh, anything that is not one of the ones that i just described so it should be an asynchronous closure an asynchronous function or wherever there is a task that you have such as in here okay so let's let's have a look at a few examples we go in here and we just say func get full name and we ask for a delay a fake delay and we say it's of type duration and we say we have a calculator for what we calculate like how we calculate the full name and it is an async function that returns a string in here and then we say it is async function and it in itself returns a string so our job is just to uh, try to await on this uh, task sleep for this delay and then we return and uh, we want to return the result of this function but it is a, an async function so we have to await on it so we say await on the calculator like this all right and then you can see all these errors are then going to go away and then we have our print statement in here let's just remove it so that we don't get this print in the console all right now that we have that we can go ahead and actually say we have a func and uh, we call it full name and we say it's an async function which is an error function uh, we just for now just we say foobar all right so it is an async function but right now it just returns a synchronous uh, result back to us full name like this then we can create a task and we can say await on get full name and we say uh, let's break these down and then we say the delay is in delay in seconds one and its calculator is indeed uh, let's actually see for the calculator let's create a, a, a trailing closure in here then we say async let name is full name and then we can say return await name all right so let's see if we get the results printed to the screen now you can see foobar then being printed to the screen so we could use async let simply because we're in a, an async uh, trailing closure okay and also we've been able to use async let in other contexts such as uh, here which we're in an async function all right so i mean there's a lot more actually to talk about when it comes to asynchronous programming with uh, swift but this just gives you an idea of uh, the basics of asynchronous programming it's very similar to javascript and typescript and you could also say it's very similar to actually dart for instance for those of you who, are, who do flutter development it's a little bit more complicated because well it is swift it has a long history of uh, its own code base and there are a lot of people uh, contributing to swift as a programming language not even just people just inside apple so it is somehow a mishmash of everything the community thought was a good idea to add to swift i personally don't like for instance async let i think it makes things more complicated almost every other programming language that has asynchronous programming such as javascript typescript and dart don't need async let they just do async and await and everything works as expected i think async let adds a new layer of complexity to your code which is unnecessary 
And some people may argue that it is actually nice, but I personally don't like it so much. Uh, but that's just my opinion. And I think it, it although I don't like it so much, uh, I learn it and I think it is important that we all learn how to use these syntaxes that are available in modern Swift. So with that said, I think we can then conclude this particular video of the full stack with Swift course. And uh, we've talked a lot about, you can see we, we have so many playgrounds in here, I can't even count them. We talk about variables, operators, classes, extensions, generics, pretty much everything that you can think of in Swift. So now what we're gonna do in the course is to go ahead and start talking about client development and also backend development with Swift. I really hope that you enjoyed this video. If you found it helpful, please press the thanks button at the bottom of the screen, or you can just alternatively join my YouTube channel. So see you in the next video.